Good, good morning, uh, everyone, uh, dear professors, dear teachers, dear guests. Uh, uh, I would like to welcome you to our Meet DSVS event and uh, start with the opening ceremony. So I'm inviting Professor Nena Dilievsky to address us. Good morning, Your Excellencies, Professor Davidovich, Professor Cole, President of the ECVS, distinguished members of the European Society of Vascular Surgery, dear vascular surgeons, dear colleagues and friends, I would particularly, I would like particularly to welcome our friends from neighboring countries. It is a great pleasure and a privilege to welcome you at this joint session of the Serbian Society for Cardiovascular Surgery with the European Society of Vascular Surgery as a member of the editorial board of the uh, Serbian Society. First, I would like to let you know that according to the latest release by the Serbian Health Institute in the previous year, 40% of people in this country died out of cardiovascular diseases and 20 more percent died after COVID-19 infection. If we consider COVID-19 infection as a kind of a vascular disease, it's easy to conclude that over 50% of people are dying annually out of cardiovascular diseases. Therefore, the place of vascular surgery and cardiovascular medicine is even much more emphasized. I want you all to feel pleasant in Belgrade, and I would like to emphasize as well that the importance of sharing our experiences and doing whatever we can to make it good for our patients. Enjoy Belgrade, enjoy in Belgrade, and I want you a fruitful and successful meeting. Thank you so much. We are very happy that a uh, member of Serbian uh, vascular community is a Dean of Medical Faculty, Professor Davidovic, and I would like to invite him to address you. Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, dear colleagues, distinguished international guests, uh, welcome to Serbia, welcome to Belgrade. Thank you so much for your coming. You honored us greatly. First of all, I would like to thank Associate Professor Concher for including me in this opening ceremony. It is a really great honor and privilege. The COVID-19 pandemic changed completely the functioning of the entire planet for almost three years. During this pandemic, many things have been put to the test, but above all, uh, the humanity and solidarity, which are probably the greatest achievements of human civilization. A few decades ago, famous anthropologist Margaret Mead said that the first sign of human civilization was a tie bone, namely femur, that has been broken and then healed. According to her explanation, it was evidence that someone uh, helped and cared about injured person until complete recovery. Helping someone else through difficulty is where civilization starts. We are at our best when we serve others, has concluded Margaret Mead. Excellent, sorry, you should agree. And know, and, uh, and uh, those who have worked and who are still working and who do not know how more they will have to work in COVID hospitals, have done and are doing much more than Margaret Mead said, namely by uh, treating COVID patients, they take risks, they are on health and life. Uh, this pandemic shows that modern man has become very arrogant and irresponsible to the entire planet, to other people, the natural environment, and even himself. I hope that after this pandemic we will become better and will start to value life and health more than we used to. Uh, besides already mentioned the consequences of COVID pandemic, my friend Professor Rielsi just uh, spoke about that. Uh, this pandemic has uh, delayed and prolonged also the treatment of many 
chronic patients, uh, including vascular, as well. We had already some of the consequences, but I believe, fortunately, that these consequences will be even more. Namely, nowadays, vas vascular patients come to hospital in more difficult and more complex situation than usually. We met and we meet patients with really huge, giant aortic aneurysms, patients with severe keratin stenosis, patients with advanced peripheral occlusive vascular disease when the only amputation is the option, and so on. The treatment of these patients is a longer, more demanding, with more asset and outcome, and more expensive. Uh, as I already said 15 minutes ago, this meeting could be one of evidences that we are slowly coming back to normal life, I hope, I believe. Thanks to this excellent meeting, many leading uh, vascular experts from Europe as well as from Balkan came to Serbia and Belgrade. Once again, all of you are more than welcome, but our special guests among them are Professor uh, Philip Cole, the current president, then Professor Marit Venermo, Secretary General of the European Society for Vascular Surgery, as well as uh, Professor Mauro Grajulo, previous president of the same society. At the moment, the European Society for Vascular Surgery is the world's leading organization that gathers vascular surgeons. For instance, an official journal of that society is the most prestigious among vascular surgery. Uh, the European Society for Vascular Surgery is also well known for many other activities, including uh, educational as well. Scientific program of this meeting is more than interesting, and I'm sure that the experience from this meeting will be very useful for all participants, and especially for young colleagues, uh, particularly regarding their everyday practice. Therefore, once again, I would like to congratulate Associate Professor Conchar and Serbian Society for Cardiovascular Surgery for organizing this event. I'm sure that organization was a great challenge in these very difficult, uh, complex circumstances that are completely new for all of us. Each uh, Orthodox Christian family in Serbia has its own day. Today is St. Luke's Day, the Day of May family. Due to this, I should be at my home. And because of that, I will not be able to join you during afternoon sessions and evening uh, social activities. Forgive me. Thanks so much for your attention and stay healthy. Thank you, Professor, Thank you, Professor Davidovic, for kind words and wish you a happy family day. So I would like to invite the uh, president of the ESVS, Philip Kohl, to address you. Thank you, very, <coughs> thank you very much. I'm happy to have been promoted president of the Serbian Society for Vascular Surgery. Thanks for the election. I just need to learn Serbian now. Um, Prof <laughs> Professor Davidovic, Professor Ilijevsky, Associate Professor Konka, their Igor, their colleagues, their friends, uh, I think it's, it's a great honor for me to be here and um, to be part of this initiative uh, where the ESVS uh, can co-organize with the Serbian Society for Cardiovascular Surgery, such a great meeting here in the beautiful city of Belgrade, Serbia. Uh, as Professor Davidovic says, uh, the ESVS uh, organizes a lot of uh, activities, a lot of events. We published a journal, as you know, which is the leading uh, journal is vascular in vascular science or vascular surgery worldwide with a high impact factor. It's sometimes difficult to get a paper published in this journal. We'll discuss that later in one of the sessions. We are very proud of the development of numerous guidelines in all uh, the fields of uh, vascular surgery. We published about 15 guidelines all together, which are renewed every four to five years. And the impact practice, the should impact practice, we uh, organized the masterclass. 
We organized webinars. We obviously have the annual meeting and also the transnational meeting where we try to bring young scientists doing basic and transnational research. If you put everything together, I think we can say uh, safely that ESVS promotes education. And that's really uh, what it is about. It's about education. It's about educating uh, permanently uh, on a day-to-day -day basis uh, all our colleagues who work in vascular surgery, obviously also vascular trainees, medical students that we wish uh, for the best of them would embrace our specialty, and finally, uh, also, uh, down the road, the patients, the patients who suffer from vascular disease, how can we improve their health? That's probably the main asset uh, of the ESVS, using all uh, what we have, guidelines, journal, registries, VascuNet, annual meeting, is education, and that's what makes us very different from just uh, a big meeting like Charing Cross or Ling, which are great, obviously, there's no question about that, but I want really to focus on education, and that's what I want to promote during my presidential year. Once again, uh, thank you very much, uh, Igor, and all your colleagues for organizing such an event. I hope it will be uh, the first one of a long series uh, either in the Nordic countries, the southern countries, the Balkan, the western, because I think that's really uh, something additional to our annual meeting is for the ESVS to go uh, to their colleagues, to their friends, to their members. I wish you a wonderful Congress. Thank you very much. Thank you, President. You know, the first president, actually, last week, I addressed Croatian uh, president as the president of the Serbian society. So. <laughs> okay, thank you for this is the final uh, finish of the opening ceremony. So I'm inviting uh, chairmen of the first session, Professor Kol, Ilic, and Mulakakis to join us here. So today we have a program of three expert uh, invited talk sessions, aortic, carotid, and peripheral, and we have four round tables. So stay with us today. So, good morning to everybody. I'm happy that we are here together, all together. And uh, we start our first session, uh, which is regarding the aortic pathology. And I would like to call uh, Professor Mauro Gargiulo to give us a talk about the predictors of early and follow-up EVAR failure with currently available enographs. Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, First of all, thank uh, Professor Konkar to give me the privilege to be here, and uh, Professor Davidovic uh, for the privilege uh, to host my residents uh, here uh, in Belgrade, and uh, they were very happy to stay with your team, and thank you very much for your hospitality. My, uh, my presentation uh, is... Uh, sorry, could you go back? Okay, I have to speak about the predictors of early and follow-up uh, ever failure with currently available endograft. These are my disclosure regarding this topic. If you look to the literature, you can see that uh, if you compare EVAR with open repair, you have a very good result in favor of the EVAR when you evaluate the annual related mortality in the perioperative period and even after three years. But if you look to the long term, you can see that the abdominal aortic annual related mortality and reintervention are absolutely in favor of the open repair. But if you look to the, to the trials, you can see that the collection of patients were between 1996 and 2008, and inside of this trial, we have old generation device then uh, we need to have uh, new results regarding uh, the use of current uh, available endograft uh, in the treatment of aortic uh, uh, aneurysm with EVAR. 
Then we collected uh, our experience uh, in uh, one center in uh, Italy, in Bologna, between 2012 to 2020. And we um, review retrospectively this prospective collection of these patients. In, the, in this uh, patient, we treated all patients uh, with this uh, protocol to decrease iliac limb occlusion. And uh, we uh, treated this patient even with the protocol to decrease the percentage of persistent type 2 endoleak. The end point on this study was to evaluate the early and follow-up results, technical success, proximal neck-related technical success, mort perioperative mortality, and the follow-up proximal type 1 endoleak freedom for intervention and survival. We collected 710 patients with a mean diameter of the aneurysm is 58. You can see as a 3 or 4 in 96% of patients. You can see here the quality of the neck. In different patients, we had the hostile neck according with the classification of Tchaikov. The mean length was 24 and the mean diameter 23. We used the half suprarenal fixation and half infrarenal fixation, the majority Cook and Gore endograft. And regarding technical success, we had 98% of technical success. And if, if you look to the factor related to technical failure, we defined that the, the hostility of the neck is, what is the main factor. If you look at the neck-related technical success, 99% in our experience. And then again, um, the neck-related technical failure with angle more than 90 degree, barrel shape, and again, hostility of the neck. We look at the, to the perioperative mortality. It was 0.8% in our experience. And the, the mortality was related to the chronic obstructive pulmonary disease and the symptoms of the abdominal aortic aneurysm. If you look to follow-up, we had a mean follow-up of 53 months. We had the endolic type 1A in 1.7% with reintervention 7.5 and neck-related reintervention 1.9%. If you look to the risk factor for endolic type 1A, we had again the neck length less than 50 millimeter, diameter more than 28 millimeter, and angle neck more than 19. But it was very important to underline that we had that persistent type 2 endoleak was one of the main factors related to endoleak type 1A. Freedom for intervention 91% after five years of follow up. And the risk factor for intervention was the endoleak type 1A. Regarding survival, 74%, and if you look to the risk factor for survival, three main factors, peripheral arterial occlusive disease, diameter of the aneurysm more than 65, and neck length less than 50 millimeter. Then, ladies and gentlemen, in conclusion, ever with currently available endograft, uh, presented with high technical success, low 30-day mortality, less than 1%, with satisfactory mid-term outcome if you look to the follow-up of five years regarding freedom for intervention and survival. And if you look to the factor predictors to early and late failure, failure we have a different factor related to early and the late outcome. In early outcome, the majority of factors were related to the neck and the mortality was related to um, pulmonary disease, uh, urgent repair, elegant in late outcome. Endolic type 1A was related to the persistent endolic type 2 and the quality of the neck, reintervention related to endolic type 1A and survival related to the diameter of the aneurysm, neck, neck, neck length less than 50 millimeters and peripheral arterial occlusive disease. Thank you very much for your very kind attention. Okay, thanks, Professor Regulio. Uh, we're going to discuss after the next presentation. Thank you, Thank you very much. So <clears throat> I will call right now for Professor Dean, uh, Professor Lazar Davidovic, to give us next speak. Thanks so much, Nicola. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, the friends, the colleagues, Mr. Chairman, I will try to explain to you that open repair of AAA is still very important in the endovascular 
Ira. My recommendation will be based on literature analysis, but also on my clinic significant experience. Uh, first of all, I disagree that patient motivation and surgeon's experience should be the main reasons for EVAR in younger good risk patients, especially having in mind the long-term results. Namely, according to EVAR trial 1, endovascular aortic aneurysm repair had significantly higher total as well as aneurysm-related mortality and life-threatening reintervention rates after uh, eight years of follow-up in comparison to open surgery. Due to this, open surgery should be considered as a first treatment option for degenerative abdominal aortic aneurysms with favorable anatomy in good risk patients with the long life expectancy. But the significant number of patients with triple A's is not suitable for standard EVAR because of unfavorable uh, aneurysm neck anatomy. Uh, what is the best option for these patients? Complex open or complex endovascular surgery? According to some studies, there is no significant difference regarding 30-day mortality between open and endovascular repair of juxtarenal aneurysms. But some new studies show better the early outcome after EVAR. Uh, this meta-analysis didn't find significant difference regarding mid term aortic related mortality between endovascular and open repair of juxtarenal aneurysms. At the same time, endovascular repair was associated with higher rate of required long-term reinterventions. According to this our uh, retrospective cohort multi-center yet unpublished study with more than 800 juxta and pararenal aneurysms, no differences regarding in-hospital mortality, 30-day mortality, as well as overall survival after 87 months of follow-up were found. Patients underwent EVAR required more often long-term reinterventions, aortic-related long-term reinterventions and mid-term, while patients uh, uh, underwent open surgery have developed more often the acute renal failure, but most of these patients recovered completely without additional renal problems. According to European guidelines, the treatment option of juxta renal aneurysms depends on patient status, aneurysm anatomy, surgeon's experience, as well as patient preference. I disagree with patient preference. In my opinion, only surgeons should discuss about treatment option. And I recommend open surgery for good risk patients uh, of juxta renal aneurysms for good risk patients with long life expectancy. EVAR is not recommended in patients with connective tissue disorders because of very high risk of endolic type 1 and stem graft migration. Uh, recommendation regarding mycotic AAAs in the current TSCVS guidelines is not clearly defined. According to Swedish registry, there are not significant differences regarding long-term survival and infection-related death outcome between the inside to open and endovascular repair of these aneurysms. But something was missed, namely, complete surgical excision of mycotic AAA followed with extra-anatomic axial bifemoral bypass provides better early and long-term results in comparison to all other treatment options. Because of higher risk of iatrogenic injuries and higher perioperative mortality, open repair of inflammatory aneurysms should be considered only for low-risk patients with significant hydronephrosis. Unlike peripheral aneurysms, complete acute or chronic AAA thrombosis is a rare condition. However, if it occurs, EVAR is not visible. EVAR requires very often the covering of significant accessory renal arteries to achieve adequate proximal landing zone, but it is followed always with partial renal infarction, which is not recommended in patients with pre-existing renal failure, namely uh, significant accessory renal arteries with diameters larger than 3 millimeters should be preserved during AAA repair. And due to this, open surgery should be first treatment option, in my opinion, for abdominal aortic aneurysms in the presence of significant accessory renal arteries. Uh, stand graft collapse, migration, complete thrombosis, infection require 
mostly late open surgical conversion after EVAR. These well-known uh, multi-center randomized control trials didn't find significant difference regarding perioperative mortality between open and endovascular repair of triple A rupture. That is confirmed also with this uh, Japanese national study. But vast majority of surgeons besides that recommend uh, EVAR as a first uh, treatment option for patients with triple A rupture. However, ladies and gentlemen, all patients with triple A rupture are not suitable for the standard EVAR. First of all, those are patients with hemodynamic unstable condition uh, in whom there is not enough time for multi-detector CT and geography, and yet without it, EVAR is not visible. Then, those are patients with unfavorable anatomy as well as those with huge retroperitoneal hematoma. All being said that open surgery of AAA should not be forgotten in endovascular era. Open surgery of AAA should be performed, in my opinion, only in high volume centers, while younger generation of vascular surgeons should be educated in both endovascular and open aortic surgery. Thank you so much for attention. So uh, maybe I can welcome both uh, speakers to the to the podium, and so we can have a, a discussion. Maybe I can uh, start with uh, my friend Professor Gargulio, the former ESVS president. Um, wh what is uh, considering your excellent results? Is, is any impact on your practice? I mean, have you changed things uh, having analyzed all your data? Yeah, thank you, uh, Philip. Uh, I think that one of the major uh, uh, reports that we had from this analysis was the relationship between endolytic type 2, persistent endolytic type 2, and the risk of uh, endolytic type 1A in the follow-up of our patients. According with this uh, uh, result, uh, we will continue with our proposal that uh, is uh, the prevention of persistent type 2 endolytic in our daily practice. Uh, we use generally this approach with the embolization of the sac only when we have a, a um, ratio between volume of the sac and the thrombus less than 40%, and if we have more than six collators from the sac that can increase the risk of persistent type 2 endolytic. Then uh, these uh, data support our, uh, our approach to the risk of persistent type 2 endolytic. Yeah. Thank you. Professor Davidovich, why don't you think that the patient should be involved in the discussion? Because it can be a big discussion. Open as a higher uh, immediate mortality and, and, and EVAR, uh, you, it means you, you go for a lot of uh, CT follow-up and so forth. Could you comment a little bit on that? Well, thank you so much, Professor Call. Very important question as well. First of all, I think that uh, uh, the decision-making process is very complex and uh, only very educated person experts should be included in them. But we uh, surgeons should inform with precisely patients about both treatment options, or namely all treatment options, about all potential complications of uh, early and long term. Uh, and after that, the final decision should be, uh, on, the, on the other hand, made by, by surgeons. That, that, is, uh, that is my opinion. Namely, I, uh, I stopped my discussions with patients that come to my hospital say, by saying, please do me this kind of the procedure. I think that, in a, that there is not room for this kind of this decision. Many patients are very educated thank, thanks to internet now, but that is not good. That is just information. That is not education. Due to this, I think that experts, cardiologists, vascular surgeons, anesthesiologists should discuss about treatment option for each individual patient using, of course, uh, current guidelines. Thank you. Moro, how you approach this, this question in your center in, in Italy? 
For us, it's a little bit different. Uh, we reported in the European Journal of Vascular Surgery a study that we defined the preference uh, uh, some years ago, and we evaluated the relationship between uh, the patients and the choice of treatment. Generally, there is a, um, uh, an evaluation uh, not only for the, uh, generally we speak with patients uh, about uh, this uh, uh, approach and uh, the choice uh, according with the guidelines. Uh, and uh, we, we try to share with the patients in our center the, uh, the final decision. Then it's a little bit different uh, than Lazard. Um, there is a discussion with the patients and sometimes with the family of the patients uh, to define uh, the correct approach according with the guidelines, according with our result, because I think that uh, the paper that we uh, I presented, uh, that we presented this year in the SVS uh, annual meeting in Boston, uh, was um, uh, important to, to define uh, our uh, future, our indication. And uh, you told me about, uh, you asked me about uh, the indication and the um, correlation between results uh, and our daily practice. Uh, one was uh, the uh, relationship between endolic, endolic type 2 and uh, the risk of endolic type 1A in the follow-up. But the other point is, uh, in the early result, uh, we defined some quality of the neck related to the um, technical failure. And then uh, today we evaluate very carefully the quality of the neck according with the neck length, neck diameter, neck angle, to define uh, if it's correct to go in uh, end or open. And then we discuss with patients and family about this. Thank you very much. Is there any question from the, from the audience? May I have only one short, short Please, short, short please. Comment? Thank you so much, Professor Cole. It is normal that each patient requires less invasive procedure regarding the treatment of all kinds of diseases, including aortic as well. But each surgeon should correct, explain to him uh, what is expected after five years, six years, seven years, and, and, and so, so on. Uh, now, many of complications after endovascular surgery can be treated also endovascularly. That is completely different in comparison to five years ago when in our study that has been performed together with Professor Domenico Palombo team, as well as Professor Tresca, uh, regarding the late open surgical conversion after IVAR. One of the main indications for that was endolic. But in the meantime, thanks to new graft, the vast majority of endolics are treated also endovascularly. So situation in the past few years changed. And we, sh we should follow that. And finally, we should correct, explain to our patients what is the best option for him, not for them, not regarding only guidelines, but also personal experience. Uh, guidelines are extremely very important, but from the time to the time, some patients require individual approach. Thank Sorry. you very much. Thank very thoughtful discussion. Thank you for sharing your thoughts with us. Thank you. I think we can move on. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. I call on our next presenter, Professor Mulakis, to give us a next presentation. So, dear president of the SVS, dear extinguished members of the Serbian Society of Cardiovascular Surgery, I would like to thank you very much for the invitation. It's an honor for me to be here. And uh, uh, the topic of my speech is RAP to RAP River Incidents, Outcome, and Treatment. I will proceed with a brief introduction regarding the incidence of rapture. It seems, according to recent literature data, that the incidence is approximately 1.5%. And the rupture of the river is associated with a mortality with ranges from 30 to 52 percent. I'm going to present you now the results of our registry in Greece. This is the Hellenic Vascular Registry. As you can see, it has been constructed and founded in 2019, so it's the third year of this registry. Overall, 2,300 cases of aneurysm has been registered. You can see with the red color the treatment uh, was uh, uh, with endovascular uh, open repair, with the blue color, the endovascular techniques, and also with the white, the gray color, the complex aortic cases. 
Now, regarding the aortic ruptures, you can see here that uh, approximately 172 ruptures were identified. The rupture after river were 32, so the incidence in our registry data was approximately 19%. We also collected some retrospectively data from some centers, about 29 cases, and overall about 62 cases were analyzed. Now, the cause of rupture was the expansion of the sac and the endolic. You can see here that predominantly the type 1 endolic was the cause of rupture. Combined 1 and 2 endolic was 5.2%, while the type 2 ruptures were a minor approximately 5.2%. Uh, you can see here that the mean age of the patients was 77%, were predominantly males, and approximately 35% had cardiac artery disease and 23% chronic renal failure. Now, uh, this is a time trend analysis of the rupture from the years. You can see that the majority of cases, the rupture after river, uh, were during the time from 2015 to 2021, so during the last six years and the mean diameter of rupture was 93 centimeters. Now we look forward to the variables like the type of hemodynamic instability, the hemorrhagic shock, the hemorrhagic status at presentation, the type of repair, the type of anesthesia, and you can see that the type of fever device was predominantly the endurant, the talent from a drone company, the Cook Zenith, and also minority of AFX, Anaconda, Endofit, and other endografts. These are the results of our registry data. The intraoperative death rate was approximately 16%. The overall 30-day mortality was 37.7%. The endovascular mortality was 25%. And the open repair mortality was 40%. So you can see that even, there was a even if there was a trend for an increased mortality in the open repair group, however, this difference was not statistically significant. Now, regarding the intraoperative death analysis, we found out that the type of repair wasn't a significant factor, but the hemorrhagic shock 3 and 4 and the modernic instability of the patient was the most determinant factor of death. The same finding was found also for the 30-day mortality. You can see here that the intraoperative type of shock 3 and 4 was a determinant of death. Now, an, inter an interesting point in our analysis was the time to rupture since the initial liver. So we searched and we tried to find out whether there is, a, there is an association between the year of rupture and the period since the initial labor. We found out that there is an association and that in the more recent rupture evers tended to have a longer period between the initial implantation of the endograft after rupture. This is the last comparison of rupture after river with de novo rupture, so with all the other ruptures. We found out that the 30-day mortality of rupture after river was 37% and was the same uh, grosso modo with the 30-day mortality of after rupture after not ever. So these are our conclusions from our data. The type 1 endolic was the predominant cause of rupture, approximately 80%. The type 2 uh, rupture the rupture due to type 2 endolic uh, was only 5%. This is a very interesting point. The type of hemodynamic uh, instability and hemorrhagic shock at presentations were the only predictor factors of intraoperative death and in hospital mortality. The outcome in hemodynamically stable or unstable patients seems to be the same between EVA and open repair, so there's no uh, difference between cases which were treated with EVA and open surgical repair. Hemodynamically unstable patients for rupture after river have similar dismal outcome as the rupture for the novel AAAs. And finally, the rupture after river has a 30-day mortality, 37%, and is not innocent as, as it was considered and thought in the past. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, thank you, Professor Molakakis. So uh, we can proceed with uh, another lecture, and afterwards we're going to start with a discussion. So our next presenter is Professor Christos Karkos, and I call him for the next presentation. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Hello from Greece. Greetings from Thessaloniki. I would like to thank the Serbian Society for Cardiovascular Surgery for the kind invitation, I'm afraid, due to unforeseen circumstances, I wasn't able to come in person, 
but we have uh, the greetings from uh, uh, all my Greek vascular colleagues to the Serbian colleagues. Uh, can you see my slides? Yes. Okay. The presentation is about hospital logistics and organization in establishing an endovascular service for rupture abdominal aortic aneurysms. Obviously, a successful and well-established endovascular program for elective AAAs should be in place before thinking in embarking on endovascular service for ruptures. You should start with easy emergency cases, and for that reason, symptomatic non-rupture cases are an excellent opportunity for personal, a team rehearsal for a rupture case scenario, for the real thing. Starting an endovascular service for rupture uh, depends on the agreement and the smooth operation between several specialties and departments within the hospital. So you should cooperate well with the radiology colleagues, with the interventional radiology, perhaps do the cases together, depending on the place. The anesthesiology is very important part of this chain. The ICU staff, and obviously you have to decide where you want to do these cases, whether this is the operating room or the angio suite. A close cooperation with the anesthetist already exists in open repair since vasodilatation and induction will often lead to sudden hypotension. So the surgical team should be scrubbed up and gowned, the surgical field should be prepared and draped, and all should be ready to start the operation prior to the induction of anesthesia. And all this is to minimize delays and control breathing rapidly. In EVA for rupture, there are two novelties in the cooperation with the anesthetist. One is to perform the procedure and the period before the procedure with hypotensive resuscitation, or otherwise called permissive hypotension or hypotensive hemostasis. And also you can do the case with local anesthesia. If you remember our old days from medical schools, traditional teaching in medical schools, uh, you say that if you have a low blood pressure, give fluids. However, rapid infusion of intravenous fluids, what we call normal tensive resuscitation, can deteriorate bleeding. So hypotensive resuscitation is a basic concept in modern management of rupture AAA, whether you go open or endovascular. You should allow the systolic blood pressure to drop between 70 and 90 in the cashless patients, either passively by not giving any fluids or actively by nitrates. And this policy begins with the diagnosis of the rupture AAA in the peripheral hospital, continues during the transfer and inside the hospital until the patient reaches the operating room and the animal is excluded. Local anesthesia is well known from this seminal paper from Lassa and his colleagues in Zurich that can be done entirely under local anesthesia, supplemented if needed by IV sedation. And this has the advantage that prevents circulatory collapse caused by the induction of general anesthesia and promotes peritoneal bleeding. Tabonates, I'm sorry, tamponate. One other important issue when you thinking on embarking on rupture cases is to have an easy, easy access to a CT scanner room. This confirms the diagnosis of rupture, allows planning of the procedure and measurements. It doesn't take more than 10 to 20 minutes. And the key point is to image the entire thoracoabdominal aorta. While the patient is transferred to the operating room, you should sit down in the corner and measure, measure carefully the patient the aneurysm, so you can select your graft. And you can select your graft depending on the proximal aortic neck, the axis, the iliac, and take into account the hemodynamics. If the patient is very hypotensive when the imaging is done, you should generous oversize the proximal neck at 30% and not the usual 20%. Otherwise, you may be faced with a type 1A endolic. You should choose whether you go bifurcated or arteriony iliac. It depends on your experience and your preference, on endograft availability, on the anatomy and instability. And uh, most will go for a bifurcate as a first choice because these are the devices that we use in daily practice. And the team has significant experience. Supranal fixation or not, 
we know that proximal neck usually is more hostile in ruptures when compared to elective cases. And then that makes you a point that uh, you may use a supranal fixation for more difficult anatomies and short necks. And you can decide whether you deploy straight limbs or ballerina, depending on the anatomy, how quickly you, you want to catheterize the, the contralateral gates. And uh, the question is whether you want to embark on hemodynamic and stable patients or not. There's no uniform definition of what's uh, hemodynamic and stable. Most will use low blood pressure lower than 80 with decreased or loss of consciousness. And whatever the definition is, a third of your patients will be unstable. So you should start with stable cases if you want to, uh, to build up a morale. Start with contained ruptures and then go with free ruptures. And if you have a, a stable patient, you want to go EVA, you can go with an aortic occlusion balloon. It's a significant process. It makes the procedure more complex, but may save lives. And uh, after you finish the operation, remember abdominal compartment syndrome, the silent killer, because you remember that you don't open the abdomen when you do EVA, and this may pre 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 precipitate a, a increased likelihood of uh, ACS. So keep an eye and monitor intensively postoperatively. It depends whether how experienced you are, and uh, there is a learning curve. And if we do more than 30 cases, the, the, you will believe this meta-analysis after 30 cases with the ruptures, the results get better. And uh, in conclusion, if you want to organize uh, our hospital for a uh, EVAR for ruptures, you should have a 24-hour availability of vascular specialists with endovascular skills. You should have uh, enough stocks, enough stock with suitable regular grafts. There should be a smooth operation with other specialties within our hospital and good communication with referring peripheral hospitals. Team experience is important as there is a learning curve to overcome. You have to, an easy, you have, to have an easy access to an open operating room suitable for both open endovascular repair and uh, use local anesthesia and bifurcated endographs whenever feasible, aortic occlusion balloon in unstable cases, and active monitor for and aggressive treatment of an abdominal compartment syndrome. Thank you very much from Thessaloniki. Thank you very much for this uh, very interesting presentation for, from both colleagues. Um, a first question to uh, Professor Bulalakis. Uh, I would like to ask you, wh what is the average uh, uh, time between the EVA procedure and the rupture? Because you show that the relationship with time, or maybe I'm misunderstood, uh, saying that the the the, dura the 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 duration is increasing more recently. But what is the average time? So, uh, Do you want my my? I think it will open. Or can you try again? Okay, I will try with this one. Okay, can you hear me now? It's okay. Uh, so, I think that uh, our period of time could be distinguished in two uh, cut-off points, the before 2014 and after 2014. We found out that the mean time from rupture in the initial cases up to 2014, it was approximately uh, 32 months. So, in the later cases, after the 2014, it was found that it was approximately more than five years. So we, 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 we attempted and we tried to find out what's the reason for this uh, finding. And we gave the explanation that maybe due to the availability of new endographs, of the fourth generation endographs, that can be adapted in better neck anatomies and also to have a better proximal and distal fixation, maybe this could lead to the explanation that these endographs have a better outcome. Uh, thank you, yes. Do, do you think these findings should uh, have in, an impact on the on the ongoing, I mean, developing new guidelines on AAA? They, they will be probably presented in Belfast, hopefully, uh, about uh, the, the duration and timing of uh, Surveillance after EVA? Uh, 
I think that this is a very important issue that you have to discuss uh, more deeply and uh, we have to consider it. Uh, you know that there are a lot of uh, EVARs that have a rupture. In the last uh, four years, there is an increase in rupture after EVARs. We know also from registry data that there is an increase in the incidence of uh, rupture after EVAR. I think that surveillance should be followed for more meticulously for a long period after the initial uh, operation. And also there is, a, is not innocent, as I said, the type 2 endolix. Type 2 endolix can appear also three, four years after the initial event, even if they are not uh, present in the first two, three years. So we have to be very, very cautious with the follow-up. And of course, I, I, I have to agree with your opinion that the future guidelines should give more focus on this issue. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Professor Molkakis. I have a question for you. So I suppose that the majority of patients you've treated uh, were, with EVA were patients with degenerative aneurysms. So my question is, have you uh, encountered patients with post-dissected, isolated abdominal aneurysm, which you treated with uh, EVARs, and were there any difference in terms of rupture after uh, these patients? Well, uh, the majority of cases was all in short cases uh, with standard EVAR. There were not any kind of uh, post-dissection aneurysm. So, uh, unfortunately, I do not have any data to provide you to give an answer to your question. Uh, now, if you ask my personal opinion, if this was differentiate the final result, the final outcome. I would say that the dissection is a totally different uh, pathophysiological phenomenon from the standard EVAR. So I assume that uh, might be a difference, yes, in post EVAR after dissection, and this is something that we must see in future, in future studies. Thank you. Uh, I have a question uh, for Professor Kakos. Uh, <coughs> Hypotension, resuscitation with hypertension, we, we all can understand the, the physiological basis of this, but it can be quite tricky, quite dangerous, especially doing that in the transfer time uh, with maybe people that are not, you know, um, ex extremely experienced uh, anesthetists. It depends probably on the countries and the setting. Uh, it, at the same time, you probably will go completely into... Uh, uh, renal failure, if you have a uh, systolic blood pressure for 70 for an hour, even if the patient is conscious. Uh, can you comment a little bit more on, on, on the, this tricky part? Thank you. It was an excellent question. It's a tricky subject, and there's not a lot of evidence. And we borrowed this evidence from uh, trauma patients. And uh, we all know that soldiers and the military trauma and we all know that trauma patients and uh, military trauma patients are young individuals who probably tolerate a, a 70 or even lower millimeters of mercury uh, period of uh, hypotension uh, without uh, having too many of these uh, deleterious effects of uh, renal failure, uh, ARDS, etc. However, we have a patient who is uh, in his 70s, 60s or 70s, or even uh, uh, older, and uh, this may have uh, cardiovascular morbidities, and of obviously you have a point that uh, a, a low S low B pressure S seventy may not be well tolerated for these uh, people, and they uh, have a cardiovascular morbidity and renal morbidity. Uh, and this was shown clearly in the improved trial, and say that uh, uh, the cutoff limit for the uh, for the hypotension is seventy. The seventy and below, they do worse. So. The target now is between 70 and 90, and uh, it can be a passive process of not giving too much fluid. So I think this can be, uh, uh, this uh, concept can be uh, translated to and transferred to junior doctors and uh, not over resuscitating, not, let's not do this physical process of uh, if you have low blood pressure, raise the blood pressure and uh, start, stop all uh, crystalloids and uh, transfer the patient uh, as quickly as possible to a center that can fix the aneurysm. Uh, obviously, uh, some people, some centers or some organized centers may uh, go even in an active approach of uh, using nitrates to lower the blood pressure, but this is not uh, very evidence-based and therefore we should keep it 
uh, uh, give a doubt. But uh, obviously, uh, the, the message here is not to over resuscitate the patient I, I and understand. lose time. Thank you very much. I think it's uh, it's a very uh, thoughtful discussion on a, on a tricky subject. And thank you very much for sharing your experience with us. For the sake of time, we have to move on. And thanks again to both speakers. So we have to move on with the next uh, speech. Uh, I would like to invite Zoltan Seberin from Hungary to give us a talk about the in-hospital results of the treatment of infrarenal aortic aneurysm results from the Hungarian National Vascular Registry 2010 to 2019. So dear colleagues, my name is Martin Bertzali and I will be presenting instead of uh, Dr. Seberin, who is unfortunately currently sick two days ago, but he is really thankful that we were invited to this conference and hence sends his best regards to the organizers. So the presentation will be about uh, our national registry and uh, the results on infrarenal aortic aneurysms. The basis of the study was published last year in a Hungarian journal. We were interested in our in-hospital mortality data regarding AAA repairs because in the past uh, decade, we implemented the uh, EVAR as into our routine aortic care, and, and we were uh, also interested, and we are big advocates of centralizing aortic care, and we were interested about the results in smaller and uh, bigger centers as well. So we prospectively collected our data uh, from the Hungarian Vascular Registry. It means 26 vascular centers. It's a voluntary database and we examined the 10-year period. So we divided this 10-year into two five-year periods. Um, we got around 1,200 intact abdominal aneurysm cases in the first five years and around 500, uh, 1,500 cases in the, in the next five years. The average age was around 70 and predominantly male patients were treated. When it comes to rupture, in the first five years, we noticed around 240 patients and 270 in the next five years. And then when, when it comes to technique, uh, we did not notice any significant change in terms of numbers in open uh, repairs for intact abdominal aneurysms, but we did implement EVAR and we recognized a significant, significant increase in the numbers of EVAR. When it comes to rupture, uh, we did use rupture, uh, EVAR in ruptured cases as well, but we are more confident doing it open. Um, when it comes to patient volume, we divided the centers to two big and smaller centers. The threshold was 30 cases per year performed, and uh, we did uh, notice uh, that there was uh, a significant, obviously, a significant difference in number of cases, but also in the next, in the last five years, a difference in ruptured cases as well. And then, when it comes to in-hospital mortality, we we noticed a significant difference in big and small centers in terms of open repair. When it comes to EVAR, there were only one patient treated by endovascular repair in smaller centers. And uh, we also had uh, a difference, a significant difference in in-hospital mortality when it comes to EVAR versus open repair in, in big volume centers. And then the shocking numbers from the rupture data, we had a significant difference there in terms of mortality too, but in smaller centers, we experienced a 45% mortality rate, in-hospital mortality rate after, uh, after ruptured aneurysm treatment. And also we noted this significant difference in terms of EVAR versus open repair in big volume centers uh, when it comes to in-hospital mortality. So in conclusion, um, we believe endovascular aortic surgery and cases should be performed in high volume centers, which uh, resulted in lower perioperative mortality. And we believe there is a need to centralize aortic care in Hungary and uh, make endovascular surgery available to all patients around the country. And we are organizing the symposium next year where we would be more than happy to see you again. Kuala na Pajni. So thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, it's, it's impressive to see, to see the, these, these numbers.
I mean, we have published uh, several editorials in the European Journal about the need for centralization of AAA repair. It's not only for AAA repair, it's also for carotid, it's for, I mean, almost everything actually in medicine. I mean, if you have more experience, uh, it's, you, you get better results, there's no question about that. Any, any question from the audience, I think, please. center opinions are completely different for instance according to American guidelines uh, uh, open repair of AAA can be performed in centers with at least 10 procedures per year and with perihospital mortality of less than 5% my question is how is it possible to guarantee such good results with such small experience due to this as one of reviewers of the current European guidelines, I insisted on at least 30 procedures per year, so I agree with you. Thank you. Yeah, in the European guidelines, I think we, we ask for 30 procedures uh, per centre per year. I agree with you, definitely, yes. Moro. Thank you. Thank you for this fantastic presentation. Uh, um, you reported two different periods. Uh, in, uh, when you reported uh, the results of open repair, in the second period, in the big centers, you had an increase of mortality if you compare with the first period. What is the reason for this? Well, it is challenging to answer that question because I, I, I do not uh, familiar with the data itself. So I, I would have to ask Dr. Severin about that. I'm, I'm sorry, I don't know that number. But I noticed it too, and I don't know that. Question for you. So did you change anything in strategy during open surgery of, of rupture of abdominal aortic aneurysm? Perhaps where do you put the clamp? Did you put a superciliac or you moved for inferior clamping or what? Did you change anything starting from the, the first phase to another phase? Not that I'm aware of uh, that we changed. It's, uh, I believe I see you care, but better, uh, maybe worse. What is your strategy? How do you operate a rupture? Well, if we, you put the clamp? if we can have an inf uh, inferior clamp, then we obviously go for that one. But the, if it's hazardous to have that, then we go for supraciliac clamping. Okay. Yes, one final comment, please. Christian Alexander Behrendt. Yes, thank you for this uh, impressive presentation. Uh, maybe a question not only to you, but also to the other uh, uh, lecturers. Um, if, we, if we centralize aortic care or PAD care or carotid care, for aortic care in prevention of ruptures, do you think it, it is possible that the centers, the centers with high volume, will have better results because the more unstable patients will die on the way to these centers? I mean, it will be challenging to centralize in a country like Germany with 500 hospitals uh, working with patients with AAA. So, I mean, this is an ongoing debate. Maybe you will answer that. Well, I, I think we all can comment on this. I, I think there is also a difference between uh, uh, acute, I mean ruptured, and non-acute. And also PAD and AAA rupture, these are different things. Uh, still, I think that you could, uh, in, a, in a big city, or in a significant city, you could have only one or two large centers instead of multiple going around. Of course, if you have a patient with ruptured AAA and you have to carry this patient for two hours in an ambulance, that's, that's not acceptable. So there's probably a balance there, I agree. I don't know if anybody else want to, to comment on that. I totally agree with your opinion. Uh... Yes, Dr. Philip Cole. I just want to say that the distribution of the areas in uh, different countries is individualized and there is a variation. For example, if I take into account the variation in distribution of the geographical distribution in my country, you see that there are, also, there are a lot of islands which uh, 
in this case, uh, I would say that it's very difficult to make a centralization. And uh, there, is, there are some centers in which you need more than two or three hours to get transferred to a tertiary uh, hospital. So uh, I think that centralization is an issue. It could be uh, achieved in uh, complex aortic cases and in elective cases, but in case of uh, emergent or urgent cases, this is an issue that has to be solved in future by more data. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well. Thanks for taking time, but I would like I would like to emphasize another side of the story from the Serbian point of view. We don't have a problem with centralization. We have the problem with the, how should I say in English, peripheralization. Because we're in problem that uh, we need uh, developed vascular surgery throughout the country so that we could perform our complicated job as best as possible. That's the problem in the Balkans. So I understand this. In Germany, it's quite different. You have 500 hospitals. In Serbia, it's much easier. You have 6 million, 7 million population. You have two, three, four, five centers. That's it. But we need much better vascular surgery at the periphery. Thank you. OK, thanks, Professor Ilyevsky. We, For the sake of the time, we have to proceed. So. Uh, <clears throat> I call the next presenter, Dr. Mladen Gasparini, for, the, for his presentation. Thank you, dear president, distinguished colleagues, and ladies and gentlemen. I came from a Slovenian vascular society. Just to have an idea, if you put all the vascular surgeons in Slovenia in one bus, there will be still some places free. So we are a small community, but we are doing uh, a lot of things. Today, uh, my talk will be on mini laparotomy for the treatment of AAA. Not to advocate the open surgery, but to say that open surgery should not talk as a dead man, so it's still alive. Well, if we don't know exactly where things about EVAR and other procedures are going, the market does. And this is the projection for the stock market for the next five years. They predicted a 30% of increase on the selling of devices for EVAR and even more for TVAR. So on the market, if you sell more of something, probably you have to reduce something. And of course, the numbers of open surgery has decreased in the States for about 80% in the last 10 years. So concomitantly, we have an increase of centralization we have heard now in centers when all 90% of the open surgery is done in centers and teaching hospitals. Now, COVID has also changed something. It has reduced the number of procedures. So again, something very bad for training. Those are data for UK uh, vascular registry. And the reduction was in the last two years for about 35%. But interestingly, the proportion of open surgery remains stable like about 40%. So we have quite different reality in Europe and also in the world. If you look at those data, Hungary, as we have seen, has changed a lot in the last year, but no so far away they have 80% of open procedures done for AAA treatment, while in the States they do 80% of EVAR for AAA treatment. And the interesting thing is that if you have a fee for service, like in Germany, it's more sure that you will do either. And it's also more uh, probably that you will do less than the optimal aortic surgery, so less than 5.5. And if you have a fee on population-based reimbursement, so you, you will do less fever and you will do less small aneurysm. But let's see at the data. This is a big systematic analysis published this year on almost 33,000 patients treated for AAA. There's a medical match database, and they followed them for six years. And the conclusion was that the overall mortality was higher with endovascular repair than with open repair. And also, the endovascular repair was associated with significantly high rates of long-term rupture and reintervention. So not to say that EVAR is not a good choice. It's certainly a perfect choice, but not for everyone. So 
don't forget also, as Professor Davidovich has mentioned, that the last recommendation are that in patients who are fit for surgery in young patients, so we should use uh, open surgery as a preferred method. But 20 years ago, so a surgeon in the States thought that maybe we can improve also open surgery because Ever is improving all the time. What about open surgery? Well, he thought maybe if we reduce the laparotomy, then we get better results. So just do it through a small 8 to 12 centimeters incision. And he concluded in his small series that minimal incision aortic surgery is safe, cost effective, and it's an alternative to endovascular treatment. So not a lot of papers have been published in that, but all concluded that minimal incision aortic surgery is a safe and feasible pro procedure that combines the early advantages of endovascular repair with long-term advantages of open repair, classic repair. But then 10 years without a single important paper, and then we have in 2018, uh, we have this publication which stated that uh, it comes from Italy, that minimal incision aortic surgery have failed to gain acceptance in the vascular surgery community due to intrinsic procedural problems, and is currently practiced in a few highly specialized centers. So I don't think I'm working in a highly specialized center, but still our results are quite comparable with EVAR. Those are results for EVAR and also again in our hospital. Of course, we have longer stay in ICU and total hospital stay. Of course, we have some um, time to oral feeding, which is longer. But when taking account what really matter, morbidity, mortality, we are comparable with the data for EVAR. So now I will show you the fastest and shortest video on treatment of AAA as we're doing in our hospital. If, of course, it will be running. It is done by urologists, so maybe there's a mistake. He is a video fan, and sometimes he helps us. Okay, super. I will have even no time to comment on this, I think, because it, it's going so fast. So in marcation. Okay, so it's a preparation. Incision, clamping, opening, removing the thrombotic masses, suturing the lumbar arteries, cutting the edges of the neck, select the graft. The head is on the left, yeah? suturing the, the, the proximal part. Okay, tightening the suture. He forget to remove those stitches additional. It's not polite from him, but he's a urologist, as I mentioned. Two additional hemostatic stitches, not cutting the distal end, suturing the distal end, completion of the anastomosis, releasing of the blood and then suturing of the sarcophag, retroperitoneal, and the skin. So this is our hospital. Once the view from our hospital, once again, I'm not here to advocate open surgery, but I just say that open surgery is something still, sometimes still needed. And if we could improve the result of open surgery, there will be still improving of the result of treatment of our patients. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Professor Gasparini. Are there any questions from the audience? Yes, Professor Konkar. Okay. Uh, thank you, Vlad, and a nice presentation. Congratulations uh, that you are developing this. It's not easy procedure anyway for those who start to do it. Uh, we were mentioning in previous speakers mentioned the anatomical feasibility. Is there anatomical feasibility for this technique? Yes, of course, but you, you can always prolong your laparotomy. So if you need to treat also iliac arteries, you will go a little bit further. And if you have to treat the hostile neck, you will go a little bit uh, cranially. So it's not a problem just to open a little bit more. So. 
Okay. Are there any more questions? Okay, thanks, Professor Gasparini. Thank you. So we have to proceed. We have one more presentation left, and I call for Dr. Natalia Bogunovic to present us preclinical investigation for the AAAs. Good morning. It's an honor to be home in Serbia to talk about my preclinical translational research into aortic aneurysms. So I don't have to tell anything about aortic aneurysms to all of you professionals who actually treat them, but I'm going to tell something about the unknown molecular mechanisms we're trying to study. So as we know, some of the risk factors for, obtain, for getting an abdominal aortic aneurysm are smoking, male gender, and advanced age. But even though there are many risk factors associated, we don't understand the mechanism. Why is this important? If we understood the mechanism, we could collaborate with the pharmaceutical industry and start developing a pill which could potentially slow the growth of the aneurysm, potentially prevent people from getting an aneurysm, or revert the progress of the disease. So in our studies of the aorta, we focus on the smooth muscle cells. These are the cells that are in the middle, of the, the, in the middle layer of the aorta. In a healthy aorta, they are involved in vasoconstriction and vasodilation. They provide structural support and produce the matrix. You can imagine them kind of as the bricks of the house, so they really keep the, the whole aorta together. In an aneurysm, these cells die out, making the aorta less stable. They lose their proteins, which make them, which involve, which, uh, make them constrict or dilate and they don't produce the matrix. So the house is really unstable right now. The cement is gone, the bricks are uh, starting to look like sponge. So what we want to do is recreate the aorta in the lab so that we can study why this is happening. So in our model, we want to focus on recreating the smooth muscle cell layer, so the medial layer and the intimal layer, which is uh, consisting of endothelial cells. So how we do this? We take these smooth muscle cells that we isolate from uh, tissue which we got from open aneurysm surgery. We put this, these cells onto a scaffold which we got from our collaborators. So this is a kind of 3D printed network which then allows these cells to settle in and start acting like bricks so that once the cell starts dividing, we have more bricks and more matrix. And in five weeks, we have a small piece of the aorta in the lab, something like in a Petri dish. Then with the endothelial cells, we now have a patient-specific small model of the aorta. Um, I'm going to uh, need a bit of help because I put a lot of videos. Could you please start from the left? So in the first video, you see in red, oh, sorry. If we can go one back. Yes, can you first uh, play, play the left one? Or it doesn't work. Ah. Okay. Ah, here it goes. So what we can see is that after one week, in red we have these cells. So you can see that there are many cells and many layers, but there is still a lot of space between them. Then after week three, in the middle video, you see that there are more cells. And then finally in week five, on the right, You see that we now have something, which I at least imagine that this is how the aorta looks in real life. So we have many cells tightly connected to each other. So we have managed to recreate this layer. Now we add the endothelial cells. And then here, actually, this I think will explain well why this is a good model. Can you please click the video on the left? So the video on, on the left is a model made with healthy smooth muscle cells from a post-mortem kidney donor. So in red, you see the cells tightly packed. In green, the matrix that these cells produce. So it looks like a very tightly connected structure. So we can imagine that this aorta will not dilate. It looks very stable. Whereas on the right, the same model uh, made with patient cells. Uh, 
Can you click, please? It looks much more empty. The cells are not so well connected. There is barely any matrix. So we can actually imagine that this is, if this is how the aorta looks uh, in the patient, there is no wonder that, this, uh, that these cells cannot sustain the pressure in the aorta and that everything starts falling apart and there is dilation. So we published our method uh, last year in the Journal of Endovascular Therapy. But let's go back to context because I know that this is quite abstract. So this is the first in vitro model with aneurysm patient cells. This allows us to study these processes in the aorta, the different interactions. And now what I've shown you, this, uh, these last reconstructions of the healthy aorta and the patient aorta. For example, in the next step, we're going to try to make a tube, and then we can also see if specific patients respond differently through shear stress or pressure, or we can immediately try to test drugs and see how if these processes are improved, which is then the first step towards developing pharmaceutical therapy. I would like to thank you for your attention and uh, also to the team at the Amsterdam UNC and Dr. Kuke Young, which uh, is probably familiar to most of you, who is the PI of this research. Thank you very much for your attention and once again for the invitation. Well, that's very interesting. Congratulations for, for doing this. It's really obviously transnational science. Uh, how many years did, did it take to the center to develop something like that? So Dr. Young, I think, started collecting this biobank of patient-specific cells more than 10 years ago. Uh, this specific, so I went there seven years ago to start my PhD, so I think this specific study took a couple of years, but it is really based on the fact that these cells were already available. So I think, yeah, let's say a decade to, to start up this whole program. Okay, thank you. Is there any question, any comment from, uh, from the audience? And what would, uh, do you think would be the most uh, uh, promising at this stage uh, drug or treatment to test using this model? So one of my colleagues is using this model and some other models to test metformin. So because of the indications that metformin might be promising mm -hmm. for AAA, we're now trying to identify does it really work like that in cells and do, can we measure some positive effects? So that is one application. And the others are, we're, yeah, we're mostly in this pre-preclinical thing to identify things and then we would then pick uh, drugs to test. Mm -hmm. Yes, I agree. I mean, metformin, of course, could be, and maybe other drugs too, but uh, and what about statins? Do you think it, it, there's a room for statins there? Yeah, it could be. So that is actually the nice... So my whole PhD research was based on developing these models so that we can, in the next stage, indeed test these things. So statins could also be, because then if the model is solid, we can just design different studies based on all of your suggestions. And uh, yeah, and then just check how these drugs work on the cells. Thank you very much. You have a question, Igor? Yes, I have a question. Thank you, Natalia, for coming and sharing. Where is uh, our role in your uh, research, and how can we help you to, to continue? I mean, we as a clinicians and surgeons. So I think that, uh, well, first of all, this would all, of course, not be possible without all of you performing open surgery, which we, as we have heard, is not to be neglected, because during open surgery, we obtain these, this material. But also, biologists such as myself can get really carried away in the details, so that is why this link between, let's say, the lab and the clinic is very important, because all of you who treat patients are constantly reminding us why this is important, okay, stay on track, will this actually be translated to the clinic? So I think that is the role. You are in the end the, well, you are the bosses of the disease. Thank you. Thank you very much, and congratulations. Yes, please, there is one more question. Apologize, uh, just kind of suggestion. Uh, whether you could reverse the enhancement of the aneurysm is one question, but please do something with aneurysmal wall thrombosis. You are going to help us a lot. Okay, I'm on it. Next year I will tell you about it. Thank you very much. So now I think we have the industry symposium before the coffee break. Igor, I'm correct here. We have okay. 
And so um, prevention of underleak type 2, uh, Theodosius business from Greece is online. Theodosius, you hear us? We don't hear you, your microphone is off. Perfect, can you Perfect. hear me now? Yes, please go ahead. Perfect. So, uh, hi everybody. Uh, hi Igor, thank you very much uh, for the very kind invitation uh, this year to uh, your great Congress. I'm sorry that I'm not able to participate um, live there. You have my best greetings here from Athens. So um, I have the, the great honor to present you uh, a new device, um, the Safe Memory Polymer, uh, which actually expands all the embolization therapies um, every day in our uh, daily practice. So a few words about the, um, the uh, Safe Memory uh, Polymer. Uh, it is a porous uh, bioabsorbable bio uh, polyurethane uh, foam, um, an open scaffold that enables stable clot formation. Uh, then within this uh, scaffold, uh, we have a cellular growth, uh, tissue infiltration without, however, chronic inflammation. And of course, uh, this uh, will provide you a unique opportunity to have an embolization and at the end uh, to have no uh, material uh, inside the aneurysm or the vein or whatever you are trying to embolize. So um, the, the big thing and the nice thing is that you have a transition between two memorized uh, shapes in different environments. Uh, and this is, uh, it depends on uh, if you are in a fluid like the blood and regarding the temperature that you're working. So you have a secondary crimped shape that it is for the uh, catheter delivery. And then after uh, the um, insertion of this um, plug inside the bloodstream, then you have a primary expanded shape uh, for the vessel uh, embolization. So you have two different types of embolization plugs. You have the embed embolization uh, plug and the embed if FX. Uh, the difference is that in the first one, you have an anchor coil at the very proximal part, which actually provides you the stability uh, to really uh, close something very precisely. Uh, and then uh, the second part is the safe memory polymer. And at the end, you have the radio part marker. When you just want to close a big, uh, let's say, part of uh, you, the body, like an aneurysms, and you don't uh, really control and you don't have any concern about where to uh, put exactly your uh, plug, you can use the embolization, uh, the impede e fixed uh, embolization plug. Um, the uh, diameters are, are from six to 12 millimeter, uh, and uh, you have that, that means six, eight, and 12 millimeter plug. And this actually can uh, embolize vessels from two to 10 millimeter in diameter. Regarding the delivery system, you have four friends uh, for the six millimeter plug, five friends for the eight and six F uh, for the 12 millimeter. It is pushable through O35 and O38 uh, guide wires. You may uh, have it in your uh, cath lab through different, through three different uh, types. The first one is the embed embolization plug where you can appreciate uh, here uh, with uh, my um, mouse here, you can see this is the plug uh, and this is the coil inside the plug. Then you have the embed FX embolization, uh, FX embolization plug, which actually does not have any coil. And if you want a rapid fill, this is very common when you're working uh, with aneurysms after EVA, just to close uh, the whole aneurysm sac, uh, then you can have five plugs, uh, the one after the other in one uh, device. Now, um, regarding the approvals that we have, we have a FDA 510 uh, for impede and impede if X, but not for uh, the rapid fill. However, C mark approval uh, already exists for all three types of uh, plugs. Now, uh, looking at the uh, polymer, this is how it works. It is actually very comfortable with the pulses of the vessel. And uh, what you can uh, do is just to embolize with an uh, just normal plug without the coil and then 
close it with a call in order to have a more stable uh, position and you want to, to avoid any kind of uh, um, migration of uh, the plugs. Now, um, looking to the uh, how it looks like uh, in a fluoroscopy, you can appreciate this is the coil. It is very uh, radial lossened uh, without uh, artifacts, uh, in, even in the CT scan. Uh, you can see the CT scan here is the coil. Here is the uh, radio pack marker at the very proximal part. And as I said, this is how it looks like here in an embolization of a hypogastric artery during uh, EVAR. Now, uh, looking to the advantages that this device has, uh, you have a high volume, uh, actually the highest compared to any other packing volume in the market. Uh, and of course, in, in case that you need multiple coils, uh, you need, of course, less uh, indeed uh, plugs in order to close uh, the aneurysm or uh, the vein uh, or anything else that you want to embolize. Very important is, of course, the aneurysm healing, the shrinkens of the aneurysm. And this is a porcine model, uh, 90 days and 180 days post implantation. And compared to bare metal coils, you can see that the decrease is already uh, there at uh, 90 days with an 82% uh, to 86%, depending on the aneurysm area. And uh, then at the eight, at 180 uh, days, you have already 93 to 89 um, percent depending as i said to uh the bigger uh, area that you have already embolized but this is an amazing result if you can compare it with the uh, bare metal coils that they have achieved only 40 uh, to 36 percent and 34 to 18 percent as i said in the porcine model now um important is of course the inflammatory response uh it is very industry very important in case uh that you have uh, you want to avoid post-implantation syndromes, you want to avoid um, uh, inflammations in the uh, structures around the vessel that you're embolizing. Uh, we know that we have two types of inflammatory response, ones through the M1 macrophages, this is actually the bad uh, scenario, and the M2 that is actually very good because they have a, a we have in the, uh, anti inflammatory cytokines there. And uh, actually, what we see is that we have M2 macrophages uh, elevated uh, in all these devices until 90 days. And we have also the IL 10 uh, that it is actually higher in the SMP uh, devices um, compared to coils. Now, uh, that can lead to a following conclusion that we don't have chronic inflammations. We have a greater anti-inflammatory collagen producing uh, microfacts compared to bare platinum coils. And this is exactly what we want, especially if we're talking about uh, AAAs. Now, this is the uh, way that the rapid field works actually you you are uh, advancing and you are in, uh, implanting the uh, bifurcated devices. Uh, you have before the final implantation of the contralateral lip, you are inserting uh, a sith, almost five French sith here. We are using the hollow from BD, but you can have uh, the destination. You can have cook flexure, whatever you want, uh, parallel to the to the uh, the limb. Then you are uh, or you are uh, completing the implantation of the contralateral limb, and afterwards having the sith in place, you're just starting inserting the plugs. Uh, so by this way, the rapid fill is of unique uh, utility because you are, uh, as, as the word says, rapid. You are faster with the um, really th with the embolization of the whole aneurysm. Um, so each one uh, is one point twenty five. That means you have six point twenty five millimeter milliliter of safe memory polymer in a single uh, push. And uh, this, as I said, you can push it through a five friends or, si or six friends uh, of the self seeds. Uh, we are using the BD from Halo. You can use whatever you want uh, regarding uh, seeds. Now, uh, the question is, of course, how many of them are you? Uh, do you need uh, inside the aneurysm sac after the implantation of the bifurcated endograft? Uh, of course, there is a measurement, a calculation before uh, the implantation, which is actually uh, the, the, the company measures the uh, flow, lumen, volume, 
uh, minus the stem graft volume. Uh, that is the reason why the company always needs uh, the device that you're gonna use and how many components are you gonna use. And by this way, it can uh, the company uh, calculates the sack fill volume that is actually can be then calculated in a number of uh, indeed uh, effects uh, plugs. This is, for example, a case that we have done uh, in May, uh, where we had an aneurysm with a high grade stenosis at the level of the bifurcation. So we were able uh, to uh, have this calculation from uh, the company and uh, then to have the number of the plugs that we have uh, to uh, use. So uh, in that case, uh, we uh, have inserted, we have uh, inserted the uh, Gore device due to the very long proximal neck. After the implantation of the uh, contralateral limb, you see here a high-grade stenosis, but this was treated at the end with a balloon expandable stent. So at that level, after the implantation of uh, the contralateral limb, we have left uh, a hollow sheath inside the aneurysm. You can see here that um, we have implanted uh, 15 uh, IMP uh, FX rapid exchange. Uh, and uh, here is interesting to see that we have used a little bit of contrast agent inside. It was a very first case. So we want to avoid contrast agent inside the aneurysm sac. So at the beginning, you need a little bit of learning curve, but it is not something too difficult. You have to think about even if you put more than uh, the company has uh, suggested, uh, it will never uh, happen uh, in a rupture because they are very, very flexible uh, plugs. And this is the completion and geography. This was a very important, uh, this kind of uh, embolization in this patient because due to the high grade stenosis of the iliac arteries, uh, a massive uh, collateralization that has been seen already uh, in the CT scan has been developed uh, from the lumbar arteries. So we wanted to avoid type 2 endolic. Some very interesting uh, indications, uh, further indication. This is a case uh, from uh, Robert Morgan where he has uh, tried to embolize the uh, hypogastric artery for an EVAR. Uh, in uh, our cases, this is a case where we had to treat uh, bilateral hypogastric uh, aneurysms. There were four and 4.6 million uh, centimeter uh, re massive. And this is after the implantation of biobands where we have already uh, pre uh, embolized the important, uh, sorry, important um, uh, branches of the aneurysms in order to land into the gluteal artery at both uh, sides. Uh, another interesting case is the case where we have implanted a nexus 10 graft for an aortic arts uh, aneurysm uh, uh, post type A dissection. And you see here, after the implantation of the nexus 10 graft, the in-situ fenestration of the uh, device and the carotid subclavian bypass, we have implanted at that level here uh, the uh, in beat. Uh, in order to close the uh, hypogastric artery, the uh, sorry, the left subclavian artery. However, here is a small limitation that if the hypo, the uh, left subclavian artery is bigger or larger than uh, 10 millimeter, you may have a problem that the impede is not one impede is not enough, uh, and you may need a bigger uh, plug. But in that case, due to the fact that it was a post dissection um, uh, stenosis of the left subclavian artery, was ideal for that uh, case. And here, it, how it looks like uh, the uh, mark of the uh, impede effects uh, plug. A very nice indication where I really love to use this device because important is that we have less inflammatory reaction is the pelvic congestion syndrome where we are in getting uh, into the left ovarian vein uh, through the left renal vein. And here you can see a number of uh, devices. It is really important because they are bioresorbable after several months. And that means for these young ladies, there is no uh, coils uh, staying inside the, uh, the vein. You have less inflammatory reaction and a very uh, nice uh, result, especially when we are talking about young uh, people, or even uh, if you don't, uh, we are talking about young uh, men uh, that they have uh, varicose veins uh, in, uh, in the testicular uh, vein. So another um, example of the same problem, that means uh, pelvic congestion sy syndrome treated by coils, you see the big difference also in the fluoroscopy uh, and in the number of material uh, inserted into the left ovarian vein. 
Another indication is the pre-splenectomy splenic artery embolization. This device uh, is not actually ideal if you want an, uh, uh, an uh, embolization of an isolated splenic uh, artery aneurysm, uh, ex except of uh, the, uh, let's say, um, the scenario that you have a very nice uh, proximal uh, neck of the aneurysm where you can uh, safely uh, introduce uh, these uh, plaques inside. Uh, inferior mesenteric artery to prevent type 2 endolic, a nice indication uh, to do it uh, with uh, the uh, impede uh, with a coil uh, plug, and of course, uh, EVAR type 2 endolic repaired with the impede uh, EFIX system where you can really uh, instead of introducing uh, onyx inside, you can introduce nicely uh, these uh, plugs. Another case that it is coming from uh, Guzman from Orlando, where he had a Niva type 1A endolic repair with a bit effix. So he went really inside uh, the, the way inside the part of the of uh, the neck where he had the endolic and he uh, inserted several uh, impede uh, plugs and here is uh, the final result and uh, finally uh, you can see also and uh, here is uh, the result uh, if you try to um, do it with uh, coils so it is actually uh, an, a disaster compared to uh, using only uh, plugs and finally uh, this is a very nice indication uh, coming from Reinen from uh, Netherlands, where he had the type 1 uh, endolic after Chivas, where he uh, tried to uh, fulfill uh, the gap uh, with the impede effix uh, coils. Where would I have used SMP in the near future? This is a case of an iatrogenic aneurysm of the brachial artery after um, extensive limb pandenectomy where in this young lady it would be much better to uh, introduce here uh, impede uh, instead of coils and of course uh, this is the uh, fourth case that we have done now in uh, Athens uh, where we had a post dissection aneurysm of the superior mesenteric artery where in order to avoid this kind of uh, massive coils here uh, material which is actually causes only artifacts to assess uh, the patency of uh, the uh, bare metal stand. Uh, here you can nicely use uh, plugs inside the uh, uh, false um, uh, false lumen. So in conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, the safe memory polymer is a new and unique tool in the endovascular armamentarium of all interventionalists. A number of clinical scenarios can be treated safely and effectively with the SMP. Uh, several advantages uh, exist, exist uh, compared to coils regarding packing volume, uh, volume uh, inflammatory response, aneurysm healing, and that they are resorbable. And with this, I would like to thank you again for your attention. Okay. <clears throat> thank Professor Business. So, Theo, I would like to have a question for you, just to, to tell us your indication for uh, treatment of endolic with the uh, SMPs, type 1 endolic, type 1A. When do you use yeah. this in particular? How do you choose your patients? And uh, thank you for your uh, lecture and uh, hope to see you next time in live here. Thank you, Igor. And again, congrats for the organization of the meeting. Uh, so um, very good question. Uh, due to the fact that we have at the moment several uh, ways to treat type 1A endolic, uh, I would say that uh, I would use it in a very specific scenario. First scenario is a type 1A endolic after an uh, implantation of a device uh, which actually like the alto device or the ovation device where you have very few um, treatment options, uh, how to uh, repair the type 1A endolic because they are not the normal uh, standard river devices. Second, uh, when you have a type 1A endolic after normal standard EVA, where you cannot put a cuff or an aptus device because there is no other option and still uh, have a type 1A endolic, or, uh, and of course, you cannot put a fenestrated devices uh, or brand's device because these are the device, the cases where you have very um, uh, angled proximal necks where even a fenestrated cuff could be uh, really challenging to uh, implant. My first option would be there to uh, treat with these uh, plugs. And third, of course, the uh, people that they are 
um, let's say multi morbid or they have, for example, a chimney technique and they had a type 1A endolic, this could be a nice uh, option. Okay, thanks, Professor Business. Uh, one more question, Dr. Duvniak. <coughs> Thank you, Dr. Theodosius. I have a question. Do you have any concern about possible recanalization of the vessel once the biopolymer bio disappears from the body? So after two, three months, the, the polymer disappears, so we, we can have problem with the recanalization. Not maybe in the, in the aneurysm sac, but if you embolize the splenic uh, pelvic vein or other vessels in the body, so we can get in the problem with the recanalization. Very good point. So uh, the, the answer is we don't know yet. We still, of course, due to the fact that we have the development of collagen uh, through the M2 um, pathway of uh, macrophage response, uh, we, uh, concern, we, don't, we still do not have this concern of recanalization. But still, uh, the point is that this is something that we have to follow uh, in our patient because uh, the first experience, it is uh, actually uh, not uh, longer than five years in, uh, with these uh, polymers. So uh, this is something that we have to uh, look at the registries uh, with a different uh, embolization strategies. But this is, of course, a good point. <clears throat> One more question. Good morning, Theo. Mauro Gargiulo is speaking. And uh, uh, my question is uh, regarding uh, the role of this device in the prevention of endolic type 2, persistent type 2 endolic. And you reported uh, uh, the, um, that you need to modify the numbers of the devices. How you define, how you define exactly the numbers? Because uh, I understood very well that uh, you reported that you have to evaluate uh, the sac volume free of thrombus, free of graft. But uh, you have a raw curve about uh, the numbers of the device that you need to use, or uh, how you define exactly the numbers? Yes, that's a good point. It has to do with the software that you're measuring the volume. So <clears throat> what they are uh, using the, uh, the company is the endosize uh, software, which actually gives you the opportunity to define exactly uh, the the volume of the um, of the uh, thrombus-free aneurysm sac and the volume of the respective uh, device. The the volume of the respective device uh, is uh, standard. The volume of the uh, of the aneurysm is, is is something that it is calculated from the uh, from the software. Then you know that its plug when it is fully expanded. Um, the 12 millimeter, uh, it is 1.25 millimeter in, uh, in volume. And by this way, you know, uh, the, the final volume that uh, remains after um, uh, removing the volume of the stent graft from the volume of the AAA. And this is then is divided by 1.25 and you know the number of the plaques, the minimum number of the plaques that you can insert uh, inside the aneurysm sac. <clears throat> Okay, thanks, Professor Business. I think that this will be all. I would like to conclude this session and thanks all participants and presenters for their nice presentations. And we can go for the coffee break. Okay, thank you all. Bye. Hi, good morning. Um, we're starting the, this next session. Um, uh, I'm stepping in for Hortian de Borst. I'm Federico Bastos Gonçalves, and um, I come from Portugal. And with me in the table are Professor Petrov, good morning, and Professor Markovic. Um, I'd like to start by thanking the Serbian Society and the ESVS for this great initiative. It's, it's very good to be here, um, and uh, especially to, to kind of pioneer this, this idea of mixing the European societies with the local societies. Uh, we think it's very important. Well, this, this session is really a roundtable on application of guidelines into clinical practice. And the first speaker of the day is uh, unfortunately not able to join us because of a uh, health problem. Uh, so uh, we are um, with a lot of time for this session so we can have a, a good discussion. Um, Maybe we can start off by having the first speaker, yeah, which is um, Christos uh, Karkos from Greece. 
Christus, are you there? He's online. Yes, thank you, Federico. Hi, Christus. Greetings from Thessaloniki. Uh, let me share my screen. You can see the my slides in full screen. Can you confirm that you can see my slides? Yeah, we can see your slides, Christos. Okay. Uh, I will start. Uh, thank you very much once again for the kind invitation. Uh, I would love to have been in Belgrade, but due to unforeseen circumstances, I was held back here in uh, my hospital. So I'll uh, do this online. Thank you very much uh, for the kind invitation for the Serbian uh, Society for Cardiovascular Surgeons for having us as uh, representatives from the Hellenic Vascular Society. And uh, since I was involved in the preparation of the uh, aortic guidelines last time, uh, I will give you uh, an up-to-date uh, about the ruptured abdominal aortic aneurysms, focusing on endovascular techniques. And I will uh, uh, present you some of the guidelines on ruptures and uh, how we can discuss later on how we can uh, implement this in uh, the real world practice. And uh, we have uh, recently two, uh, the, the two major societies published uh, uh, with one year difference, uh, their guidelines on uh, abdominal aortic aneurysms. And uh, I'll go straight to the points on uh, ruptures. And both uh, societies, both the ESVS and the SVS recommend uh, EVA and the vascular repair as the first option for rupture triple A's. And the uh, class 1B, class 1C recommendation from both societies. And this was uh, based on uh, the analysis of the three major trials, major rupture AAA trials, the UK IMPROVE, the Dutch IX, and the French ICA. And uh, although the 30 day mortality between the two groups showed no difference, at one year, when the results were put together, EVA had a consistent but non-significant trend for lower mortality. When they analyzed the three years results of the IMPROVE, they showed an endovascular strategy was associated with lower mortality, again, in quality adjusted life years, similar levels of interventions and reduced costs. And the authors of the publication concluded that this finding support the increasing use of the emergency EVA for rupture cases. Now, one other issue when we dealing with rupture cases is the imaging. All of us agree that in, stable, in a stable patient, the CTA is the imaging modality of choice because ultrasound, although useful in identifying an aneurysm, which is very suggestive of a rupture in an unwell patient, cannot confirm rupture. And also it lacks information about suitability for EVA in the current endovascular era. A key point that we should all keep in mind is that uh, we should image the entire thoracic abdominal aorta to avoid any surprises because you can have a rupture or you're, you're going to get involved in a rupture, AAA, but you can have a, a big extension, a dissection, or a th second aneurysm further up a thoracic aneurysm, which may complicate things, especially if you do endovascular repair. Things are more controversial in the unstable patients. Most unstable patients, however, are still stable enough to have a CTA for consideration of endovascular repair. And this is preferred because we have shown that the EVA in unstable patients may be associated with lower mortality compared to open surgery. Those patients not stable enough for CTA should be transferred directly to the operating room for emergency open surgery or 
in certain cases, intraoperative angiogram with or without an aortic occlusion balloon to determine whether the case is suitable for EVA. And if it's not suitable, inflate or maintain the aortic occlusion balloon and proceed to open surgery. If it is suitable, then you should select your endograft with subsequent measurements obtain either via fluoroscopy or intravascular ultrasound. However, in my personal view, in my personal experience, uh, this is a very unlikely scenario. A key point when discussing the management of rupture cases is the permissive hypotension. We discussed earlier on in the previous uh, uh, presentation, uh, what's permissive hypotension? It's a policy of delaying aggressive fluid resuscitation until proximal control is achieved. And this may leave excessive hemorrhage by allowing clot formation and avoiding the development of the androgenic coagulopathy. And both society agrees that we should do a permissive, we should practice permissive hypotension, both during transfer and during uh, the hospital stay until the anus is fully excluded, either by open or in the vascular repair. The key point here is the conscious patient. If the patient loses consciousness, then probably we have to forget about this and go and uh, uh, do whatever it needs, intubation, uh, etc. The type of anesthesia is also important. And uh, it has been shown early enough that uh, endovascular repair, as in the elective case, can be done under local anesthesia. Rupture cases can be done under local anesthesia. And uh, it's even more beneficial in rupture cases because uh, this prevents circulatory collapse caused by the induction of a general anesthetic and may promote and maintain peritoneal tamponade while you're doing the case. So if we have a, a, a patient who can tolerate local anesthesia, this is the anesthetic of choice. And uh, this was based in many studies, but uh, most uh, important of all, the improved trial, which showed clearly that patients who had been operated under local anesthesia had uh, lower mortality, 30-day mortality, than those who had the GA. Device configuration is also important. It has been shown that uh, uh, bifurcated grafts may be more beneficial than our unialix in terms of outcome uh, and uh, should prefer one anatomically suitable. And this is because uh, less people doing uh, our unialix these days and our routine during the elective EVA is with bifurcate devices. And the team has considerable experience with that. So whatever you used to do in the elective case, you should do it and quickly in the rupture scenario. And then we have the aortic occlusion balloon, which can stabilize some very unstable patients, which uh, is the Achilles heel of the rupture cases. Uh, it's an important adjunct. Of course, it makes the procedure more complicated, more complex. It adds an extra step in the routine, but may save lives in certain cases. And uh, it has been shown that uh, uh, we've done a meta-analysis a few years back, and uh, we saw that uh, every one in 10, or two in 10, 14% uh, is the utilization rate for a balloon occlusion. And uh, studies we have a high rate of balloon use had the lower mortality, which is an indirect uh, indication that uh, may be benef beneficial in certain patients, the use of the aortic occlusion balloon. And then we have the silent killer. You've done a, an excellent operation, technical procedure, and the patient is still alive, but then you forget about him. We should not forget about him because the uh, uh, situation getting, gets uh, worse if the patient develops an abdominal compartment syndrome. And uh, you should uh, monitor uh, quite frequently, early postoperatively, these patients because they can develop intra-abdominal hypertension or a full-blown abdominal compartment syndrome. 
and you can uh, have all the medical treatments uh, mobilized to avoid uh, escalating into a abdominal compartment syndrome. And uh, if you do have a, a full-blown ACS, then you should decompress doing laparotomy. And uh, the guidelines have uh, shown this clearly. And if you have uh, uh, a patient who is uh, who, you, who you, you use the balloon occlusion, uh, you have severe congulopathy, massive transfusion, pre-op loss of consciousness, low pre-op blood pressure presentation, or you have to convert intraoperatively from a bifurcate to an orthogonialic device. These are risk factor uh, for the development of an abdominal compartment syndrome postoperatively. So these patients uh, should be closely monitored, and uh, these are the candidates to develop ACS. And uh, once you open the abdomen and the patient survives, then it's a, a real uh, marathon to, for the resources of the hospital. The patient is a long stayer. And you have to use whatever you can to mobilize the abdomen and the close it quickly. VAC devices, a mesh mediated traction can help that to facilitate earlier closure uh, of the patients. But this is a quite high risk patients, and they have to they have a lot of resources spent on them, a lot of patients. And uh, we have the rupture. Juxtanil anus, all those uh, things that we said earlier on, it was from the standard infrarenal cases, but occasionally and uh, quite often you can uh, be faced with uh, juxtanil with little neck and um, uh, endovascular anjuncts, such as the physician modified fenestrated stent grafts, of the self branch stent grafts, and parallel graft techniques may all be used uh, in. Uh, uh, or in combination with open surgery. And uh, in certain cases, certain centers who have uh, very experienced in the vascular teams, uh, they have shown that they almost completely replaced open surgery. And this was taken into account in the uh, recommendation, the last recommendation of the RT guidelines. And uh, they left it to the discretion of the team uh, whether they will do open surgery or they will do any of these endovascular adjunct techniques to fix the case. And it all depends on the patient status, anatomy, local routines, team experience, and patient preference. So to summarize some of the basic facts, uh, endovascular repair for rupture triple A's, uh, it seems that the EVA is the first option for a rupture aneurysm, if it's suitable anatomically. Permission hypertension is a key element, and we should practice whenever we can. We should have uh, easy access to a CT for imaging of the entire thoracoabdominal aorta, and this can be done in both stable and unstable patients. And we have to have an easy access to an open operating room equipped for open endovascular repair, hybrid, or even complex cases. And uh, whenever possible, use local anesthesia because it will maintain the muscular tone and the peritoneal tamponade. Use bifurcated endographs whenever possible. If you, have, uh, if you are faced with an unstable case, you should stabilize with endoclubbing using a balloon occlusion technique. And uh, don't forget abdominal compartment syndrome postoperatively, active monitor, actively monitor for it and aggressive treatments. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Christos. It was an excellent talk. Um, maybe I can start the discussion while people, if you, if you have any questions from the audience, please move on to the microphone and be happy to take them. But um, to start off this discussion, uh, I'm going to ask you, Christos, a question and extend that question to, to the, my fellow um, uh, colleagues in the table. Um, so, these guidelines are extremely important to, to our practice, of course. But uh, do you think the guidelines should adapt to the reality of, of, of healthcare providers? Or should they uh, offer the best possible solution and have then the healthcare providers adapt 
to, to change their practice in the way that the guidelines are suggesting. Well, thank you, Federico. It was an excellent question. Uh, you, can, uh, you can use it both ways. Okay. The guidelines, first of all, uh, is, a, as you know, a, a combination of uh, people from different uh, countries in the Europe, if you are talking about the SVS guidelines, and with diff different uh, work environments, different experience, and uh, all are experienced on the, on the subjects, and, uh, but they can have uh, different opinions. But uh, if you, for example, uh, say that EVA is the, the first option for an open repair, but uh, a certain hospital in a certain country hasn't got an endovascular service, then you cannot change a very good open repair program uh, to, uh, in one night. You cannot convince the, uh, the health care providers that uh, this is the case and we should swap uh, altogether. It cannot be done uh, straight away, but you can use the guidelines to educate, first of all, the, the surgeons and the, their working relationships around it, and then you can use this as, a, as an application to change uh, the, the, the way of uh, doing things. So uh, if you do an open repair program, and a very successful open repair program, and you want to implement the guidelines, then you should uh, discuss this with the colleagues and with the hospital and start thinking, or oh, how can we uh, transform this, uh, this uh, repair to uh, endovascular service? So uh, obviously, if uh, it, it won't happen in one night, but uh, it can use an argument and uh, it can use a format to discuss and to develop over the, the, the following years. Professor Petrov. Yeah. Professor Kakus, I am Professor Petrov from Bulgaria, Sofia. I would like uh, to focus on the small group that you said uh, about the unstable patients with the ruptured aneurysms. Um, some 11 years ago, I published the results from our center with the Associate Professor Nikov of 32 ruptures. And do you know how we operated them just on echography? No scanner, no anything else. Directly from uh, the emergency ward to the operating room. And that uh, uh, made possible to have only 25% uh, open surgery uh, mortality. Do you use, uh, do you think you can use uh, just this method? Because I also may say that I have lost several patients unstable just going to the city and going back. Uh, thank you very much for your question. Uh, that's why I said that it's a controversial issue when we discuss about unstable patients and not many people agree. First of all, what is unstable? There are different uh, degrees of instability uh, and uh, people, it's intuitive. People will go straight to theater uh, and uh, open up the, the, the patient and uh, up, apply a cross clamp. But we all know at uh, all this that uh, there is a high mortality in these patients. Obviously, you have a 25% mortality, which is uh, great for an unstable group. And not many people can uh, achieve that, maybe your, your own experience. And yes. we're talking about people who can uh, 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 apply this in the broad uh, spectrum of uh, surgeons. Uh, but uh, in my experience, uh, most patients who are considered unstable, uh, can still have uh, 10 minutes to go to the CT scan to have, uh, first of all, to confirm the diagnosis, because uh, up to then, we don't know whether this is uh, the true diagnosis. You can have uh, an uh, ultrasound, which shows an aneurysm, but uh, not necessarily go gives you the diagnosis of a leak. Obviously, if it's an aneurysm and uh, uh, Abdo pain and the acute abdomen, probably the most likely diagnosis is an abscess, but sometimes you can have a pancreatitis, you can, sometimes you can have a, a myocardial infarction, and uh, you can get into trouble, get the patient worse, first of all, by operating him without having the diagnosis. And uh, if, uh, in my experience also, 
if you have the CT scan, a quick CT scan, okay, uh, then you can be better prepared to uh, do these cases, uh, know how to approach it. And, uh, and also, the third uh, scenario is that uh, when you do the CT scan and you develop, a, you have an unstable patient, you can uh, go before intubate him, you can apply an aortic occlusion balloon by the groin transfemorally, and then as the, the, the anesthetist to intubate him, and then go with the balloon inflated, you already, already achieved endoclamps, endoclamping, and go in and do your open repair. So this is other scenario. So uh, in that case, that, uh, what I'm saying is that uh, uh, you have uh, an unstable patient which will not uh, survive open surgery many times, give him an extra 10 minutes, do a CT scan, and then approach him uh, ac accordingly. 10 minutes, I think, cannot be enough to make the CT scan. You must be a champion to do it, a champion to do it in 10 minutes. But anyway, because several patients can be lost during this time, of course, you can apply balloons, you can do a resuscitation, you can do everything. And it's also a legal problem, I think, because we need nowadays uh, surely a CT scan because otherwise we cannot be sure, as you said, if you have a rupture. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Karkos, from your really instructive presentation. Uh, I'd like to ask you a much more simple question than my colleagues. Uh, you are coming from, from a large university hospital, okay, from Thessaloniki. Yes. Uh, how many centers in Greece are dealing with the Rapture AAA? Is the first question. And the second question, how many of them uh, have been implementing EVAR for Rapture aneurysm? Well, I will uh, tell you about uh, our experience in Thessaloniki. In Thessaloniki, we have four major hospitals uh, that uh, are on call every fourth day. We have one in four rota. And uh, when uh, the hospital is on call, they receive all emergencies, including ruptures, from all North Greece. And uh, I have to say that uh, all four, three out of the four, and maybe occasionally the fourth, will practice endovascular as a first choice. Uh, it depends on uh, who is the person uh, on call that night, but uh, I'll say, let's say, is 75%, 80% of cases uh, that can be done uh, with EVA uh, will be done in, with EVA uh, in, uh, in Greece. So over the last few years, we have seen transformation. We have been uh, the only hospital in Greece in uh, the early years to the, 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 the only hospital in North Greece that uh, will do uh, EVAs for rupture in the, the, the very early years, but very, very soon, most of the hostels in the, the area, the four big hostels, started practicing endovascular repair. Uh, okay. Uh, the many hostels in Athens do the same thing. I ca can't give you answers about the Athens uh, specifically, but uh, uh, they have uh, adopted endovascular first policy, many, many hostels. Okay, so all the patients from Northern Greece are coming to Thessaloniki with Rapture AAA? Most of them, yes. Most, so they are not treated in uh, regional hospitals or larger hospitals in, in Northern Greece? They all come to Thessaloniki? Yes, yes the, 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 these, the peripheral hospitals do not have vascular surgeons. And if they do have one which is uh, in consultation uh, manner, uh, they will be transferred to the central hospital, so to Saloniki. The other hostels in surrounding areas do not have vascular service. Okay, thank you. Uh, I think this is this topic about the implementation of the guidelines, especially in Rapture AAA, is, is uh, challenging because it is a typical uh, guideline that, according to my, my thinking, my experience, it cannot be always implemented in the in the real world. So I'd like to ask you, my colleagues from the round table, what is the situation in your countries? For example, in Portugal, uh, are all the patients receiving uh, endovascular treatment for up to three parade according to the, to the guidelines or 
somewhere they are treated elsewhere with open repair in maybe smaller centers that they cannot do here. Well, thank you. Well, that's, that's exactly the reason why this talk was put in this session, I think. It's because it's, it's the prime example of um, uh, something that is difficult to put into place and has many variables that are locally influenced. Um, and then the evidence might point in one direction, but your logistics will force you to do something else. So it, in our reality, um, we have uh, also a centralized care for ruptures. And I would say very large majority of ruptures are taking care in um, f one of five, uh, six uh, hospitals in the country. So they're the okay capable with yeah. dealing in... Uh, and, and all of them will have 24-hour uh, two surgeons uh, uh, available for emergency care, and they will have um, availability of both open and endovascular for uh, the patients. And we, because of guidelines, and, and not only of guidelines, but also of, driven by guidelines, some of these departments have been pushing forward to, to implement a 24-hour-7 uh, EVAR program, um, which was not the case in all situations, and also to have uh, the logistics set up in a way that you can have a CT at the door of the hospital so that you don't spend any time. So it's, it's also a matter of logistics. I was in the Netherlands years ago, and I was very surprised that uh, the first thing the patient sees when he comes into the hospital is the CT scan and then the doctor. If, if there's a, sus a, suspect, a suspicion of bleeding, like a rupture, that's the, that's the, the logistics, that's how it's set up. And the, the CT scan is actually at the door of the emergency room, so it's very quick. It should be. And it's a 30-second exam. I mean, it's, it's really quick to perform if it's available, if they're all aware and if the logistics are set up. So it's not a problem if the logistics are set Of course, if you, if you don't have that set up and if you have to wait one hour or two for a CT scan, that's terrible for the patients. It's terrible. And what is the situation in Bulgaria, Dr. Petr? Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, the situation is the same, I think, because uh, we have uh, problems with the logistics. We have 23 units of vascular surgery in Bulgaria which is certified to operate uh, such uh, an entity. But I think that uh, we need no more than five or at least six in the country like this, like Serbia, like Greece, like uh, Bulgaria. And we should concentrate in the, these teaching hospitals where there should be 24-hour uh, surveillance and um, routine uh, surgeons who can manage both the ways as they are. And now Evar is uh, still more and more coming in every way, you know. It's getting better results and uh, more and more patients. But I would like to ask uh, the audience about a question. The patient comes and sometimes he's not conscious. Who is taking the decision and how you think that uh, which is the better way to do uh, whether VARO operate in open surgery? Uh, in our, uh, according to our experience, it's relatively easy. We, uh, we uh, make a quick consilium in the on-call doctors and we together make decision if there is no one from the, from the relatives of the patient and he, if he is unconscious, then decision is according to the urgent team. So we drive, we wrote down our decision and it's like conciliar decision, conciliar, yes. We never had a problem, I mean, it's, it's working. Federico, may I comment something? Of course. Uh, two things, one was about the, the availability of the CT scan and to answer to Dr. Petrov uh, uh, about uh, uh, earlier on about the case, uh, if you have a, a, a very easy access to a CT scan and uh, all people are waiting for you and then it won't take more than 10, 20 minutes, then you should do it. 
uh, if you have difficulty in, in uh, getting the CT scan, if there's a big delay, or if you have to get the person from the emergency department to the ambulance to go to the opposite building to have a CT scan, then obviously EVA is not an option there. You should go straight away to do an, an uh, open repair. So it all depends on the local situation and how we can overcome these obstacles. Uh, that's my, 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 my main comment. Uh, also, to help the discussion, uh, Igor tell, told me to have three uh, questions for the audience, three scenarios uh, we can use whenever you want, if we have time, to generate discussion. So whenever you tell me, I can present them. I can give you the, the question and you, you give me the answers. Sure, we can do that. Okay. Uh, one scenario is uh, that you receive, you are on call and you receive the rapture AAA call from a peripheral hospital who is two hours away. Uh, it's a typical patient, male, 70, uh, came in with abdo and back pain, collapsed at home, and uh, he has a history only of hypertension and he's an ex smoker. The emergency doctor who is on the phone, who is uh, quite rational and sensible, seems uh, to know what he's doing. He tells you, the patient now is, seems stable, he's conscious, but uh, he's pale and clammy. His systolic blood pressure is 85, his heart rate is 100 per minute, and the CTA we've done locally, it shows that there's a large infrarenal rupture aneurysm, maximum diameter 7.3 centimeters, it's not involving the iliax, and there's a large in retroperitoneal hematoma and evidence of retroperitoneal blood in the right and left paracolic gutter. So the question is, what would you do? And I have uh, four selections for you. Try another hospital. We're too busy fixing another case. Another aneurysm. Start IV fluids to raise the blood pressure to normal during transfer. Delay ambulance transfer until blood is cross matched. And the last one is accept the patient, suggest a permissive hypertension policy, and insist on seeing the CTA images online. Right. So, can, can we have a show of hands? <laughs> Who would choose the first option? <laughs> I can choose it, the first option. But, no, I think uh, it's, I, it's quite clear. <laughs> I thank you very much. I, uh, <laughs> um, very interesting options. I think that the last one, accept the patient and suggest uh, permissive hypertension is uh, the best on seeing CTA images online. But this is the way to shorten the so-called rapture time from the time from rupture until the clamping of the neck of uh, the aorta. And uh, anything that is uh, helping is worth, I think. So we should keep to this strategy. I cannot but completely agree with you. <laughs> it's, it's clear. Well, it's, it's a very good point, Christos, that you make there on the CT images online. And I think this will be reflected on the upcoming guidelines as well that um, it's, it's quite critical that you implement some sort of strategy to see the images beforehand, because it will save a lot of time before, especially because everything is nice and quiet and you have the time to look at the images, decide whether you want to do open or, or endo. And if you do want to do endo, then you have the time for planning. And we all know how important planning is in the, in the endo scenario, especially for ruptures. So it's, it's critical that you have some sort of system that you can see the images before the patient arrives. And that, uh, that's just a point I'd like to make. Uh, yes, uh, and uh, you can see here that both the SVS and the SVS guidelines recommend permissive hypertension. And it's ideal to see the images before the patients, either through, if there is any one, an inter-hospital image network, or using simple free software such as we transfer. We asked the, one of the junior surgical team or the local hospital to uh, download the CD, to upload the CD, and uh, we have and see the pictures before the patient arrives our door to minimize that uh, door to clamp uh, time. And it's so important 
that uh, in the SVS guidelines, uh, it has been incorporated in the form of a checklist. And the, this is the checklist here. And you can see that uh, the Americans use a tick box for permissive hypertension and the tick box for transfer of images, either by upload or CD. So it's so important uh, to uh, minimize delays. Great. Uh, do, do you do want you, some more? Do you have a second case for us? <laughs> yes, but there's no right or wrong answer and it's controversial. So here it is. Uh, you have a stable patient. You opt to get him to the CT scan, but while he's having the scan, he becomes unstable. He manages to finish the case, the, the examination, and uh, you look at the pictures and it's suitable for Eva. Given his hemodynamic instability, what would you do? And I have three options for you. I don't know what is the answer and what's your preference, but here you are. You go directly to the operating room for open surgery. You insert and inflate an aortic occlusion balloon under local anesthesia in the operating room, and then proceed to open surgery under general anesthesia. And the third option is insert and inflate an aortic occlusion balloon and proceed to EVA under local anesthesia. Okay, can we have a show of hands? Who would go for it directly to OR and open surgery? One, two, three, four. Five, six. And who would insert and inflate an aortic occlusion balloon under local and then proceed to open surgery with general anesthesia? Anybody? That's not something you do? Right. It depends on the options you have in your facility. You have both options. You have uh, open repair and uh, So let's say you have both options and you can do them equally as fast. No? And inflate, insert and inflate an aortic occlusion balloon and proceed to EVAR under local anesthesia. Who would do that? Oh, not a lot of people there. <laughs> so it's a tie, I think. <laughs> it's, yeah. You, you, let's, to do let's, this. Let's ask the chairpersons, what would you do, each one of you? All three of you. <laughs> yeah. To do this, of course, you need to have the logistics for a Wartic balloon in place. Please. Can I comment on your... Uh, on your... Um, uh, you, you explained that, uh, that you try to place the art occlusion balloon in, in, in unstable patient may, uh, while the patient is on the CT scan. So it could be very difficult, as you know. You have the problem with the access. You don't have the X-ray. So you have to place the 12 front sheet inside the iliacs. You don't know the, the where the guide wire is. So it's very difficult to place the occlusion balloon. It looks, uh, it looks nice to, to proceed with the occlusion balloon and perform the EVER, but it's very difficult in the real world. And again, there's the same discussion about the guidelines and, and, and the real world. So just some, some comments Ex about Excellent that. comment. Thank, Thank you. you. I think you're right. It's very difficult. Okay. And the logistics was, uh, have to be writing, put in place. Uh, uh, Frederico, when I was writing the, the options, I was thinking that the patient is transferred to the operating room. And then with fluoroscopy and cut down, you can put the uh, balloon in theater uh, under local anesthesia uh, before the patient goes to sleep with the CR uh, and not blind in the CT scan. Yeah, I agree. Uh, there's a lot of um, research on trauma patients, especially in war scenarios where they put the vertical occlusion balloons blind. Um, so it, it, it has been done um, before and there's some research on it, but I agree if you're in a hospital and you can take the patient to theater and put it in the theater with fluoroscopy, it's better. Just a, just a comment, I think in this critical situation uh, you should do what you do the best. So if you are good in putting a balloon, uh, then of course uh, you can try to. But if you are good in, uh, and you have a good team that can fast go to OR, open the patient and clamp, I think this can be the best solution. Because trying to do something what you don't, don't do every day in this situation is, is difficult. Yes, I agree. Thank you. 
Excellent comment because you do whatever you do uh, every day. It's uh, uh, you, you need to do it very fast and efficient. So if you're not used to it in the day-to-day -day practice, then it's uh, more, even more difficult to do it in the emergency when everybody's stressed, the patient is dying in front of you. Just a small comment about the hypertension. I'm a little bit afraid if this proceeds to total lack of tension because you know that uh, the patient is unstable and if you have a big retroperitoneal hematoma, it blocks immediately the kidneys and most of the patients which are unstable, I think, haven't any diuresis at all. I personally proceed immediately in the fastest way the patient from the emergency to the operating room. Well, I have one question also, um, one, well, for, for everyone actually. What do you think about doing EVAR under local anesthesia and then after, after you finish excluding the aneurysm, then proceed to general anesthesia to relax the abdomen and have a lesser chance of abdominal compartment syndrome? Do you have an opinion, Christos? Well, difficult. I don't know the answer to that, but uh, intuitively I would say uh, I won't do it per se. I would do it only if the person is very ill. Uh, I would uh, prefer to keep him uh, awake if he's tolerated the procedure and to see what's the effect on his general health, general status, hemodynamically wise, uh, he has done the exclusion of the aneurysm. If I see the patient uh, is uh, uh, stable, is stabilized with the exclusion, then I'll keep him awake, finish the operation. Before he leaves the table to go to the ICU or to the high dependency unit environment, I will measure uh, a bladder intra, blood, intra abdominal pressure, bladder pressure, to make sure that it's not very raised. If it's raised, then yes, you've got the points. Uh, you can uh, give muscle relaxants and uh, see what we can do. But if it's not raised, then uh, go back to the ward or to the high dependency ward and keep a close eye on him. I wouldn't intubate him, uh, I, I wouldn't give him muscle relaxants per se. I will uh, see how he is. Selectively, I will do it. Okay. Well, I we have, have a third scenario if you want. Oh, yeah, please. We have uh, 10 more minutes, but uh, we need to take uh, a bit to, for some closing remarks. So please give us the third one. Uh, you, it's uh, for those who will embark on EVA in a rupture case, you attempted a bifurcated EVA for a rupture triple under local anesthesia. So that's so far so good. Uh, you have great problems to Casterize the contralateral gait, and uh, the patient is getting uh, more agitated. The anesthetist is getting losing patients, and uh, uh, there's ongoing hemodynamic instability and bleeding. What would you do in these cases? Uh, the options I have here for you is you use different shape or steerable catheters to facilitate cannulation or do a crossover and snaring approach. The second option is convert to open surgery at the GA, at the general anesthesia, or conversion of the bifurcate to an aortouniliac uh, configuration at the local anesthesia. And the last one, inflate an aortic occlusion balloon, if not already done, and then opt for any of the above. Right, so who would choose the first option? Just continue choosing different catheters and maybe cross over. Anyone? One? One person. Convert to open. Who would convert to open at this point? No one. So once you're committed to endo, you do endo, right? Conversion of bifurcated to aorto -iniac. Unieliac and their local. Who would do a conversion to Aorta Unieliac? 
One, two, three, yeah, four. So we have some proponents for that. That's also acceptable. <laughs> Inflate an aortic occlusion balloon if not already done, and then opt for any of the above. Right. So three people. So I guess the uh, conversion to AUI is uh, winning here. I think it's it's acceptable. It's an acceptable alternative. Actually, my my comment on this is that if you do ruptures you need to be thinking about this beforehand because you never know how long it's going to take to catheterize. And uh, for me personally, I never take more than two or three minutes to try. And if it doesn't work the first two or three minutes, then I cross over a snare and done. That's my approach before everything starts to develop with instability. Yes, I think in, in such cases, as you said, uh, it is best to choose the, the, the fastest, the, fast, the most fast option as you must proceed to the end of the operation as soon as possible, I think. And uh, if you choose some of other solutions, maybe the last one that seems quite correct, it can be time consuming. You're coming again to the beginning putting the inflation balloon and then thinking what should I do, starting again, I think it's going to to lose some, some time. So maybe the third one is the, the, the fastest option. According to yes, me, it depends on the facilities. And I think that Igor was quite right when he said you must do the best that you can and you have the options. Do you have any comment, Christos? Uh, no, just uh, I agree. There's no right or wrong answer here. That's why I put it provocatively. Uh, and uh, for the history, I did, con I did the, f the third option. I converted to an aortic unialiac, which uh, found very quick because the existing bifurcate graft was uh, already uh, there. It uh, had the marks of the top end and the bottom end, so it was very easy. Uh, to be honest, this was uh, 15 years ago when I did this, uh, and uh, we didn't have any. I, I was felt embarrassed because I managed to uh, consume from the hostel budget uh, a bifurcated graft and then an aortogenialic, so it's double the price. Uh, but it was the only option, and the patient survived, luckily. Uh, but uh, since then, we didn't have any other case like this, mainly because we are more aggressive and more experienced in. Uh, getting uh, the right shape catheters and the cannulate uh, or crossover at snare because you're right and Igor is right. You have to uh, be uh, proficient in doing that uh, in elective cases and uh, be uh, something that the, the whole team knows and recognizes and not to rehearse for the first time in, uh, in uh, the rupture case. So uh, there's no right or wrong answer. Anything, you do it, do it to save the patient's life. Well, thank you, Christos, for your great participation in this round table. Uh, we're about to close the session. I would just want to make some remarks and have uh, also my fellow uh, colleagues on the table to do so as well. Um, about the development of, of guidelines and the role that they have taken in the ESVS activities, and also the great contribution I think they have for the improvement of care, but also in an educational perspective. I don't know if you have the same experience as I do, but many of the uh, residents and even the, the, our colleagues, they use the guidelines to update their knowledge and to study. So it's also a great contribution in an educational sense. And um, I, well, just to, to kind of let you know how it works, to develop a guideline, it's several years of, of, um, of process. So first you need to come up with the topic, of course, and some of them are renewal of former guidelines and some of them are just brand new guidelines. You have a committee that's made up of uh, several people um, that look into this problem, that choose the topics, that choose the writing committees, they go to the um, to the experts in the field and they choose the best experts they think they could compile the evidence and come up with recommendations. Then there's an extensive review process that involves dozens of people in the, and in, in they're all also experts in the field making sure that there's no errors and that it's 
as good as it possibly can be so that then it can be adapted into our practice. And if you haven't done so already, I highly recommend that you start using the guideline app, which is a great tool that you can have on your phone that has not only all the recommendations, but also some very practical uh, tools, uh, like cal scientific calculators for scores, risk scores or bleeding scores, for example. Um, and also all the flow diagrams are turned into um, uh, online um, tools that you can use to help you decide what to do with your patient when you see the patient. And it's all there on your phone and it's free of charge. So if you, if you haven't done so, I suggest that you do. Um, do maybe you, you'd like to have any co further comments on the... On uh, I was very happy today because uh, it turned out to be a very nice uh, conversation and presentation from uh, um, the colleague. And uh, we saw an experienced uh, uh, and uh, motivated person who is uh, working at his best and I think he has very good results. And it was very fruitful for the audience also. So I thank you once again. Thank you very much for your cooperation and uh, I completely agree that the guidelines are very, very important. Uh, if they are not uh, approachable in, in, in local circumstances, they are giving us the best possible solutions for, for the best medical care. If they are not uh, implementable and uh, in the local uh, facilities, uh, then we must find the, our local best solution according to our logistics experience, etc., etc. But anyway, the guidelines are very, very important, I think. And this was the very best topic for for this roundtable because the rapture aneurysms are very challenging cases and sometimes you cannot implement that it is written in the guidelines. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. We'll close this session. Thank you very much for your, your attention. We move on to the next uh, roundtable. This is on national registries and vascunets. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'll ask the, my new fellow <laughs> colleagues on the table. Uh, this will be Zlatan Zabrin. I think he's not here, is he? It's you? <laughs> oh, you, you're, you're, you're here. OK, great. And um, Slobodan Tanakovic is here. Right, so we're off to start this, uh, this new roundtable. Uh, as I mentioned, this is on national registries and vascunets. Great topic. Um, uh, with me, uh, Christian Berendt, good friend, and Zlobodan Tarankovic. And uh, we'll jump right into the first, uh, first talk, which is by Christian Berendt, the role of ESVS vascunet and development of registries. Thank you, Federico, dear colleagues and friends. Um, yeah, thank you, Igor, for the uh, kind invitation. It's really a great honor to be here and uh, to present uh, what I think is one of the most important spirits of this society. And as Professor Cole uh, mentioned before, this connection with national societies is uh, likewise very important in the, in the Vascunet Registry Committee. Um, I have a few minutes to give you some things to discuss or maybe question afterwards. So let's just move forward. I have no disclosures. Um, let me start with a paradigm that I find illustrates very well why we are moving towards real-world evidence these days. 
Uh, it was Erwin Schroeder, an Austrian physicist, who 100 years ago uh, described a construct what he named the Hell Machine. And he used this construct to uh, explain the complex interactions in quantum mechanics. And I think there are some similarities to uh, modern decision making in uh, healthcare. There was a machine, this hell machine, where he put a cat in, and there is an atomic decay that would uh, start uh, a little hammer, and there is a capsule I was seeing it, and uh, you can use a mathematical function to estimate the uh, risk uh, if the cat already is dead or still alive. But you will never know if you will, will, uh, if we would not open this machine. So this is just a predictive model that we use if we uh, are working in everyday clinical practice. We use results from randomized controlled trials and we try to estimate the risk of any outcome or any benefit for the patient uh, from these trial results. And he described this as blurred model, and I think uh, this is still a problem in modern healthcare. We do not know the result until it actually happened. Here you can see how the digital revolution changed how we understand medical treatment. In 1980, only 1% 1 of the information worldwide were stored digitally. And in 1997, a very, very small group of uh, registry enthusiasts uh, founded the Vascunet Committee in Lisbon, actually, at the ESVS annual meeting in Lisbon. One year later, the Google uh, was founded in San Francisco. And during that time, only 1% of the Europeans used the internet. I think this is really an interesting aspect and culinarity. Eight years later, or nine years later, the situation changed completely. In 2007, almost 96% of the information globally were stored digitally. And the first smartphones came on the market, and also the first Vascunet reports. During that time, since the Vascunet Committee was founded in Lisbon, uh, this small but growing gr uh, group met on the different annual society meetings in Paris, Copenhagen, London, Madrid, and so on and so on, and it grew uh, further. But all this uh, topic around big data and real-world evidence started not before 2008 uh, in a nature special issue on big data. And in 2012, the Harvard Business Review uh, even elected the data scientist as sexiest job of the 24th, uh, 21st century. That's interesting. So this is what we deal with, and this is what we are arguing all the time. Data conquer the world, and today it is really not possible uh, to not process data. It's processed everywhere, when you sit here, when you walk around, but we always collect the data for a reason. And the question is, is the data that we collect really describing real world, real world situation, real world evidence? And what you should take from this slide is that there can be a clear systematic bias if we have a single center study and maybe the PI is trying to uh, show the good results, but he will not uh, present the bad results. There can be a moderate red bias, this could be a multicentric study where you don't have this uh, kind of selection, but there can also be a data with no bias at all. But I think even if you uh, take uh, all the data from Google or Apple and all together, you will never have access to all data. So we use uh, inference statistics and what is the final result is that every bias can distort the results uh, and affect the central conclusions. Let's come back to the Vascunet. Today, this is uh, growing so fast that we have 28 national and regional vascular surgery registries. Not all of them have own registry data. Some of them are using administrative data, claims data. We have different continents, different time zones, different societies all over the world. And we have different branches of this uh, work. We have a methodological branch, we have main branches of projects for the most frequent vascular diseases and even for low frequent uh, diseases. We have a committee, um, an executive uh, uh, level where we try to organize everything around the meetings uh, th uh, twice or three times annually. And we even have uh, a good collaboration with associated researchers. You, you don't 
have to be a member, an official member of this committee to be part of the projects, of course. So let me present one or two uh, examples why it is good to have international uh, registry data and an international audit. In a romantic vision of healthcare, every patient receives the same treatment. We have uh, guideline-directed therapy and good and predictable outcomes. But the reality is there is unwarranted variation and the healthcare systems as well as the patients differ widely. There is no standard patient. We have more or less fit patients, educated, more or less intelligent patent, uh, patients. We have to deal with patients uh, with multiple comorbidities and the construct of frailty is getting um, increasingly uh, important. The poverty of regions or between sexes uh, is getting increasingly uh, important. So there are a lot of inequalities between sexes, regions, and even between countries. And this may be illustrated by this slide, and we heard of that before, healthcare systems differ widely. We have prototypes of uh, population-based budget, like in Sweden, with only 28 vascular um, uh, units and two beds per 1,000 inhabitants, and then we have a prototype of a fee-for-service DRG system in Germany with 670 vascular units providing care to patients with vascular disease, PAD, uh, AAA, and this counts up to eight beds per 1,000 inhabitants. And even the health expenditures between these countries differ widely. You see on the right side here uh, the healthcare system in Germany or the US, typical DRG systems. Uh, cost the most. And on the left side, I didn't uh, mark that, but these are Eastern and Central European countries. So there are a lot of uh, indisparities even um, in Europe and even amongst high income countries. As you can see here, the poverty rate differs widely 24% in the United States and only 12% in Denmark. So this is also a striking result. You may remember the Vasconet amputation report, and there we found that in Hungary and Slovakia uh, uh, considerably high major amputation rates, and uh, in the same study period the gross domestic product in these two countries was the lowest. So it is valid to say there is any association between outcome and income. And this is not new, this is a striking indisparity uh, that was raised for decades. And the truth is that we cannot randomize where we live. And you will never get into that, dive into that, when you don't have access to international registry data. We try to dive into that topic even more with another, uh, another PAD Vasconet report, including 12 registries from 11 countries, more than 1 million hospitalizations. And we tried to reach a population-based approach uh, on invasive revascularization for symptomatic PAD. And there were a lot of disparities or differences between countries. But what I wanted to highlight here is there was a, a, a sex-specific treatment. Uh, women were treated at an older uh, uh, when they were older, and they were treated more often endovascularly. But we don't know why, because all the uh, valid practice guidelines do not contain such recommendations. So even these questions you cannot uh, find or uh, discuss without uh, registry data in my eyes. We publish about two or three reports a year on the different branches. For my personal opinion, I think we are focusing too much on aortic disease, to be honest, because the main workload is PAD, and we should be very active as vascular surgeons in that field as well. But I think we are moving to the right direction and working more uh, in the PAD field and carotid field right now. Let me show two more slides. What are challenges uh, and future directions in a great world where only randomized controlled trials are the holy grail of evidence? Devices changed, we have heard that. People say that in the EVAR versus open repair field, it's not valid anymore. We need more randomized controlled trials because the first, second, and third gen generation devices failed maybe, but now we have better devices. This is valid for all the fields, even in PAD or carotid field. And also the environment changed. I mean, in Germany, I could imagine there are a lot of units where you do one or two open cases a year. 
and it's no longer a main part of training. So this environment changed completely. So we, we need more concepts, better concepts in the future, like experience-based randomized controlled trials. And this is another one, the power of consensus with such a group like the Vascunet, you can have uh, an international consensus on registry data collections. We finalized that for PAD, acute limp, and patient reported outcomes, and another recommendation on AAA and carotid registries uh, will follow soon. So let me conclude, Vascunet was ahead of of its time in 1997 in my eyes. It's becoming more and more popular to use big data methods and big data uh, overall. It's an important scientific committee with more than 20 years of experience and I think we need audit and benchmarking of national results. This is important to detect unwarranted variation and generate important hypotheses. And it's also likewise important to validate the data and the registries. The next validation study will uh, happen in Switzerland next May uh, for the Swiss WASC data. Thank you very much. Thank you, Christian. It's a great talk. Um, before we start into uh, the commentaries from the different vascular societies who will be um, making uh, some, some uh, commentaries just after. I'll ask uh, uh, Professor Taskovic uh, to make a short uh, comment or a question. Yes, uh, thank you for this uh, invitation to make a comment. Dear Christian, first of all, welcome to Belgrade. It's very nice to see you here and thanks for accepting our invitation. Thank you for bringing up the importance of the vascular registries to, in the, to the improvement of the vascular healthcare system in every country and uh, with this in the whole world. This is a very important topic. You, you found your work very detailed and enthusiastic. I had one question, maybe your comments. Uh, do you maybe see some improvement in technological, uh, technological improvement maybe in data analysis? Because uh, do, you see, do, do, do you see maybe some new softwares for, for quicker analysis and, and everything in order, because you said big data and everything in, in order to make, uh, make things uh, simpler and easier? Thank you. Ab absolutely. Excellent comment. I think there are some rapid developments right now uh, in all the machine learning fields. Uh, I think we are scratching at the tip right now, and I can only... Uh, suggest or recommend that we liaise with um, statisticians and methodological departments because they have the power to use these data. And what we do is usually using R, Stata, SPSS during the weekend and working on that and find a statistician who helps with lasso methods. But this is really not what you mean with big data. And they have the capabilities and the experience. And then there are uh, other topics like in this, uh, instrumental variable. We are trying to find causal relations in observational data. And this is a rapidly developing field, still experimental, but also we should liaise with statisticians and data scientists in that field as well. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Uh, maybe I invite now uh, Professor Konkar to give us uh, his commentary. Uh, regarding the serb vasque registry. Yes, thank you. Hello, thank you, Christian, also for your uh, lecture. Uh, uh, serb vasque as a, a vascular national registry started in 2019. We become, uh, we have uh, our uh, representative in Vascunet uh, since 2017. Then we initiated uh, our work here. We started uh, to invite hospitals uh, to join us, and at the end we have about 20 hospitals. Uh, not all are performing vascular reconstructive surgery. Some of them we invited uh, and included them because they do amputations, because we wanted to have as much as possible uh, data about amputations. But also we have other main vascular centers. At the moment we have about 5,000 patients in the registry. And uh, some of the results will be presented today. So I don't want to make any presentation about this because Slobodan will present uh, PAD results and uh, uh, Marco Draga should present in carotid session also some of the of the results there. Our what was good uh, that we started late and uh, we managed to see all the variables that are used in different countries and then the vascular growth and it was easier for us to standardize the variables that we are using. So we have a, a lot of variables in the registry. We connected with a company that is doing international hair care 
system in Serbia, and this company is covering about 80% of the hospitals. And this was good that they made actually this, this registry for us. And then they, we are connected with uh, in hospitals who are using this, uh, this uh, system. Whenever the operating list is written, the patient is automatically in the, in the registry, which is then facilitating entering the, the patients in the, in the registry still. We are missing some data and we are struggling with, you know, uh, work of the doctors to, to fill in this data and because of that we are motivating in between us, we are making uh, two times a year a meeting in between us, we discuss. We have our representative in Vaskunet now, it's Slobodan, so he is send, giving us uh, reports from the Vaskunet what is going on. And now with the results after two years, we started with the uh, promotion in, uh, in the media. Actually, Professor Davidovich, the dean of the faculty, who was here this morning, he started also to discuss with journalists and we, we will discuss also with the authorities how to improve our healthcare with this data. You will hear today, so I don't want to go into the details, but about our tachyneurism, for example, 30% of our patients are younger than 65, which is good for the next session of screening. Because if we screen uh, older than 65, we, will, we are missing some patients in our population. Doesn't mean that it's uh, everywhere like that. And also, what is uh, what is important that 30% of the aneurysms are uh, admitted in hospital by urgency, which is also very high, very high ratio. This is why one of the messages at the moment from these two years of the of the registry is we need screening, for sure. So I don't want to go more to, for the sake of time to save more time for discussion, but this is just a report from our registry. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Konstantinos Moulakakis from the National Registry in Greece. Good morning. Uh, I represent the Greek Vascular Registry, and uh, I have prepared a brief uh, Presentation. I would like to say that uh, our society was first founded in 2019. There is a steering committee which is composed from me and Andreas Lazarus, is a colleague from the University of Athens. Uh, you see here that there is a site in vascularregistry.gr and you see that there is the third year of our life. Now you can see here in the map that uh, in this uh, HIPAR uh, uh, registry contribute about 23 hospital participating. There are about 78 physicians and almost uh, 400 and uh, 4,400 procedures have been recorded. Now, the HIVAR main point you can see is uh, to improve also the surgeon's personal logbook with, with, with a brief description of cases. Uh, also to, to increase the scientific uh, activity by creating a tool with detailed description of diseases. We have created four modules, as you can see here, the aortic annular disease, the carotid artery disease, the lower limb ischemia disease, and also the vascular access. Now, uh, you, if you go to, if you get in into our uh, vascular registry uh, site, you can see that there are some charts, maps, or graphs. You can see, for example, that in the last 12 months, approximately 827 cases were registered, 268 cases with carotid disease, and approximately 280 cases with lower limb ischemia. Now you can see here the, <clears throat> the time trend analysis of the four module from 2019 up to 2022. We have not entered the last uh, data from April till now because they are, they are not registered in directly in our site. You can see that with the relative color is the module for the aortic disease, for the arteriovenous fistula, for the carotid artery or the lower limb ischemia. So uh, overall, 2,300 cases of uh, aneurysm uh, have been registered. You can see here that the open repair comprises about the one-third, one-fourth of all cases. The blue is the aneurysm disease, aortic aneurysm disease, which has been treated endovascularly. It's approximately the 70%. And the, the gray and the white color, you can see the complex aortic aneurysm with fever, beaver, chivar, and all the advanced complex techniques. Now, things to be done. I think that uh, 
An important issue that should be emphasized and uh, raised is that uh, we have to attract more surgeons interventionists to participate. In my country, the participation from all the departments accounts for approximately 50%, 40 to 50%. We have to increase the variety of recorded disease. That means that we have to work uh, further and uh, increase the modules uh, that have to be entered in our database. We are now considering of doing an internal validation and in the future an external validation. And I think that the most important thing that has to be discussed is that in our uh, registry, the registration of data is volunteer and not obligatory. We need a central institutional mechanism to make it obligatory and this will increase the visibility, the scientific uh, uh, research uh, validity of all this data and also will increase the validity of the registries. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next up is the uh, National Registry in Hungary. It's uh, Zlatan Zebrin, but he's not here. I'm not sure if he's been replaced. No? Okay, we'll move on to the National Registry in Bulgaria. This is uh, Dr. Nikolov from Bulgaria. Dear colleagues, uh, my name is Nadlin Nikolov. I'm from Bulgaria. Uh, unfortunately, in Bulgaria, we do not have yet a national registry. Uh, I'm trying to create such in uh, 2020, so it will be very helpful for, uh, for me and for vascular surgeons in Bulgaria to help us. As um, my colleague showed, Bulgaria is a blind spot on the registries in Europe, so we have to, um, we have to build such system and uh, fortunately uh, we are beginning to gather data. For example, for the AAA, uh, for one year, we have uh, 280 cases collected in Bulgaria, 66 ruptures. Uh, this is the situation in Bulgaria. We have 28 vascular surgery units uh, there. So we need uh, such help to gather information. And uh, with the regard of uh, our Greek colleague, I think uh, maybe in the Balkans, I, don't, I won't comment Western Europe, but maybe in the Balkans and especially in Bulgaria, I think uh, it will be very helpful for these registries to, to be obligatory and not volunteer really, because uh, some of the vascular surgeons in Bulgaria won't give their results. Uh, so that's for us. <laughs> Thank you. Well, there you have it. Um, it's great that we are uh, able to discuss this issue a little bit further because we all know, of course, that if you look at uh, sort of single center data, that tells you what you can do. Then you look at the RCTs, they tell you what you should do. But the registries tell you what you're actually doing. And that is also very important in policy making and decisions that are then influencing the healthcare of the entire population. So we have a really important role for registries here. Uh, Christian, do you agree with this? Absolutely, and I think that we should, I mean, I love real world data, and I love registries and administrative data, um, but I have to admit the, the critical issue with selection bias and how we use the registry data, how we compare it to randomized trial data, uh, should be further discussed. We cannot just, you know, uh, exchange what we know from randomized controlled trials with, with registries. But on the other hand, I think that we have learned that many results from randomized controlled trials, like in the carotid field or in the PAD field, in the AAA field, do not match what we learn from real world practice, where healthcare uh, reimbursement systems. Uh, come in and other external factors. So I think I, I could not agree more. On the other side, let me uh, allow me one comment. I mean, uh, Igor mentioned that you have 30% below 65 in your registry. And I mean, we, we all know the Medicare data. I, I, I think these are excellent publications, but there you don't have the share of below 65 years usually. So we always need to consider what we use, what is the registry providing, what is the <clears throat> selection bias, and then maybe add other data or discuss that. 
Yeah, I think this should be discussed more. We should have more methodological discussions. Well, on the same subject, the issue of uh, whether registries are voluntary or um, mandatory is also quite important, I think. We, uh, maybe we can have the representatives from the national registries also comment on this, because I saw many of them were voluntary registries. And in Portugal, we also started recently our, our national registry, which only has, uh, for the moment, two modules. But it's, all, it's also uh, voluntary, although it has quite a good capture, but it's also on a voluntary basis. So how reliable is this and how can we make sure that it translates into the real life? Yeah, that, thank you for, for the question. I think one of the first thing is motivation and awareness. And this is why uh, we have to do these kind of sessions to increase the awareness of the physicians that registries are important, especially when you show the results, especially when you show them the results from your country, their results, then I, I feel that the awareness and enthusiasm among the physicians for the registry is growing. Another thing is that uh, besides the enthusiasm, the work is still going on. And I think this is something different. So for the enthusiasm, we have to work on it and we have to make a groups, we have to make a publications and then, you know, gathering the, the physician is, is important. But for the doing things correctly, we need to have some systems that will uh, provide automatic uh, entering the data into the registries. Otherwise, it's really difficult to, to, to be persistent and to to enter the data every day. This is really hard work and of course no one of us can do this uh, every day. So I think automatization of this data is, is very important and then hospitals should help and uh, authorities, uh, national authorities have to help. I think adding, adding to that comment if you don't want to add for the Hellenic vascular registry. Yes. Uh, in my country, uh, as I said, the main problem is the, that there is a great proportion of uh, physicians who are afraid of putting their data in this uh, local system. Uh, this is because in some way they're afraid also for the evaluation of their results also, and this is an issue that we have to further discuss and uh, further evaluate. Uh, I think that uh, from the point of view bias, we can say that if one center puts consecutively all the cases, at least this is, uh, at least this is an objective uh, option of the registry. So this, let's say, in some way doesn't create any kind of bias. I think that the mandatory option of the old cases is something that has to be uh, directly resolved from uh, the Ministry of Health, uh, also in Greece, but also from uh, the SVS and the Vascunet. So in some kind, there should be some kind of uh, guideline from the ESVS or from the European Society to the National uh, Ministry of Health that should be forced on this direction and should be forced all the physicians to put the data on the, this local system. This is the only solution that I can uh, see and I can uh, propose. Thank you very much. And are you in contact with your authorities, with other stakeholders? Because my impression is that we as vascular surgeons are not really no. discussing these topics with European Union or European Commission people. In the United States, they all have a close contact to FDA people, always, when it comes to registries, device evaluation. In Europe, this is not happening. At least I have never heard from that. I, I think we need a, a strong task force from different societies, different countries, and then directly push the European yes. Commission because right now they are just not interested in that. That's my impression. I don't know if you have other experiences. Uh, we have made some appointments with the Ministry of Health now, and uh, we try to find a solution of how we can fix this problem. Uh, unfortunately, I, I, I can uh, say my personal opinion that they cannot understand us so well they cannot understand the point of view of a physician, of a vascular surgeon, or of a medical doctor, because they are saying from another point of view of how they can increase the numbers or they can uh, decrease the cost of the health system. 
Uh, I think that there should be some kind of force from the European society through the UMs and also through the national societies to the Ministry of Health, but this should take some globalization character and not to be just one society, the Hellenic, the Greek society, the Serbian society. So it should be globalized, I think. That's a very good point. Uh, the easiest way, of course, to do it is to be counter reimbursement. So if you don't register, you don't get reimbursed for the procedure. And that makes a whole a, a big difference. But of course, if, if government start telling you that it's mandatory, then you start asking the government, then provide me with a tool. And then they don't want to finance it. So it's a complicated discussion. Philippe, please. I, I fully agree that I think the ESV has as a role to play there. Uh, in uh, in Brussels with the EU, I mean, with the help of national societies. Uh, the ESC, which is much bigger than, than us, uh, has opened a few years ago an office in Brussels, and this is one of the reasons, is to lobby, actually, the European Union. And so uh, I think we could actually uh, maybe team with, with them and, and, and go because we're fighting for the same cause, which is the the, the, the well-being of our patients. And, and definitely, yes, and I think registries are, are really uh, extremely important, and I'm sure that we, we, we really need and, and are able to convince the EU uh, to launch big projects about that, because you've shown uh, Christian Alexander very nicely that at the top of period of evidence are RCTs. Huh? We, we put that as level A in guidelines. Uh, but RCTs usually uh, exclude a lot of patients, like 90-95% uh, uh, of patients may be excluded unless we're talking about all commerce type of study like the syntax trial 15 years ago. And so we assume that um, the, the results that are observed in a very selected population uh, will be uh, applied or can be applied or are the same for everybody while in registries actually you have real real results for for everybody for all comers uh, for individual surgeon individual patient uh, and 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 mainly at the center level so definitely yes i think the es the uh, the esv has a role to play there can i have only one comment uh, I don't know, Christian and Stefano, uh, what do you think about follow-up, follow-up data? Uh, I think these data we are missing a lot uh, because in the register there are not follow-up data for after maybe one year and uh, two years and five years. And in order for us to know if the registry are improving healthcare system, for sure we have to know what happened with these patients after one year or, or five years, not just after 30 days, right? So I think maybe uh, this point is good with the uh, randomized controlled trials that we could maybe include follow-up data and use the registries for the RCTs. Yeah, I, th I think um, what we, we, we recently, or recently, 2017, started a prospective cohort study where we really, we paid the hospitals, uh, enrolled patients with PAD revascularizations, tried to follow them for one year with um, quality of life questionnaires and everything. Uh, and why I tell this is uh, because I'm very, I was surprised and a little bit disappointed because for the quest, uh, quality of life questionnaire, only 70% accepted to, to, to submit this uh, questionnaire, the basic questionnaire. After one year, only 20% of the patients. They all withdraw the study. They didn't want to be followed. So in my personal opinion, it's we need a pragmatic approach like uh, using administrative data because insurance companies, at least in countries like Germany, we really know if the patient is still living because they get the payment from the patient or the relatives. Um, but in, in terms of clinical data, there is a reason that most projects out of registries, multi-center registries, international registries have 30-day or inpatient outcomes and not one-year outcomes. This is the reason. The collection of long-term follow-up or mid-term follow-up is the biggest challenge of all times because if you miss only those who were amputated or die or yeah, get lost for any other uh, adverse event, you, your, your data is useless. So you need a complete follow-up. And we learned that in the Paclitax sale debate. I mean, the, the entire RCT data changed during that discussion because they tried to get the access to the follow-up data. Before that, nobody was interested in that. 
only after the paclitaxel debate. It, it's, it's a problem also in RCTs, and they pay a lot of money yeah. for that data. And do you think the, the regulations on GDPR, so the protection, the privacy protection laws that are so strict in Europe actually are a major barrier for this uh, kind of crossover uh, uh, checks? Yeah. So you could, uh, by um, hypothesis, gather, check if patients in a specific registry are at least alive or if they had interventions using administrative data, which is very difficult at the moment. I mean, in terms of GDPR, we have a very experienced uh, person, the president of the ESVS, who is an expert in GDPR as well. But to be honest, I think it was not a bad thing. And I think the first two years were a pain. Uh, but now, even in Germany, the, the lawyers and the um, uh, judges uh, accepted that this European Union-wide legal framework of data protection introduced new ways of collecting multicentric data even without any informed consent. And this is happening right now. So maybe we have to wait two or three more years and it will be more easy. In Germany, some of the data protection officers are now trying to convince us to omit all the informed consent crap. It's really, really, really annoying to have 20, 20 sheets of paper discussed with the patients and then collect it, put it in, the, in, in, in your wallet, wherever, and then have it if you got sued uh, 10 years later. But you can just omit all that and just collect and process the data if it's for research or quality improvement. And this took a while for them to accept that and now it's, it's growing. So I think we have to wait a little bit more. But in the first two years, it was really, really challenging. Well, we have five more minutes. Do we have any more comments from the audience? What do you think about this registry's uh, information? Is it working in your countries? Is it something that works here in Serbia? Do you, do you get feedback from the results? You will today, right? Yes, actually, we will just see the feedback. We results now know we among ourselves, but uh, there are a lot of uh, interesting data. I don't want to tell them because it's not fair to Slobodan who will uh, speak about them, but uh, the results are terrible. And actually, if we see our numbers as a clinic, and as you heard uh, in the previous talks, and you know uh, some of your fellows are coming to our clinic, so for example, we are, have, have a good vascular surgery, and in terms of numbers, everything is great. But when you see the results from the registry, then you see that actually what we give as a care to the whole population of the Serbian patients is not good because we are missing some patients, uh, there is a lot of problems with prevention, etc. So there are a lot of data that can help us to improve. And I'm sure that now when we have these results, uh, even the registry that went so far so good will go even, even better. And I'm really thankful to the, everyone uh, that is participating in this registry because there is really a great enthusiasm and people understand what uh, this actually means. And this is advice for, for Bulgarian colleagues. So to, to collect uh, together uh, enthusiasts, uh, it doesn't have to be all, all, always experts. It can be even youngsters and someone who, who really understand and share this idea. And uh, people who likes it and who understand it will contribute uh, much better to this than, than someone else. And do, if, do you have any re real, uh, real time access to the results? Yes, actually, we uh, as uh, as administrator of the results, we can we have some uh, uh, opportunities to automatically check the number of patients per clinic, the number of patients per uh, category per per disease. We can check the number of uh, patients per uh, per age, per sex. Uh, so some some basic analysis uh, we can do just by a click. It's really it's That's really very easy. useful. Yes, and then we can see, I, I just uh, two months ago, I checked the number of patients per clinic, and I called some of them and say, guys, look, I'm sure you did much more than this. And then in the next two or three weeks, uh, of course, they, they fill it in. So I think th this is really nice that you can follow up what's, what's going on. Yeah, it's also important for benchmarking. So if you, what we did in our national registry is that we developed this automatic um, statistical uh, analysis. So every time you register a patient, you have on your screen 
the overall numbers, your numbers from your clinic, the overall mortality and your mortality, and, uh, and another few metrics like this. So if, if at a certain point you're registering and your mortality is always higher than the median of the others, you need to do something. And that's real-time uh, information that is useful for clinics. Yeah, I agree. I, I think this is very useful, yes. And I think if you, if you consider all the very successful registry collaborations like PQI, Nesquip, uh, Vascular Low Frequency Disease Consortium, the, the key success point is that they grant access to the community. Um, what we must avoid is that some enthusiastic people are collecting the data and using it for publications and others have to do the workload and just submitting the data. This is never working out yeah. because then you don't get valid data and you don't get complete data. You need to involve them as well and try to motivate them to work with the data, publish the data or give them access to a benchmarking. Yeah, I just it, sorry to interrupt you, but for us, we're very beneficial because we just copy paste the concept of the Vasconet. So we co we invited people, we submit the data, we make a publication, we write the public. Everybody is in the publication. Th there is this kind of motivation as well. So this is very good to have like a, you know example how to do it. We have two more minutes. How about validation? Important. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, validation is, is really important, but it's also um, time consuming. Uh, in Zurich, uh, during the next spring meeting, we will have a validation study of the Swiss VASC data, and three of our colleagues will travel from center to center and cross check if the data is internally and externally valid. And this is free time. They have uh, holidays or get paid for that by maybe by some, com uh, by some hum uh, hospitals, but um, I mean, they volunteer to do that. I think it's important, but it's challenging. Who should pay? I think the societies, the national societies running the registries should pay for that, because they are most interested in, in valid data. On the other side, uh, I could imagine there are some business models behind that in some societies, because if you collect device data, for instance, then you can have other mechanisms to pay for validation. But if you ever had a, an external company validating your data, you are easily in the 250K or 500K area because it's really, really, really costly to have a professional validation. So and we are talking about 10 or 20,000 euro for a week of five or six colleagues traveling through Europe validating the data. I mean, every society can more or less afford a validation, a little validation by colleagues. What others do is this cross-validation that colleagues from one center travel to the next, and so on and so on. And so you just validate the data of your colleague next door. Uh, but this doesn't work in a country like Germany with 700 hospitals. <laughs> Would be a lot of traveling then. Right, this was a great session. Thank you very much for your participation. and Thank you to my colleagues here in the table. Uh, we'll move on to the next session, which is on national screening programs. Thank you. So we have to continue for the sake of time, and uh, I will jump in as a moderator to spare, um, not to leave Slobodan alone. So the, the first speaker in this session about screening is uh, our guest, Federico Bastos Gonzalez from, uh, from Portugal. So Federico, please. Oh, thank you. Uh, you. You're getting a lot of me this morning. Sorry about that. So I'm, I'm here to uh, tell you a little bit about the, um, the effect of non-screening for AAAs in my country. So these are my conflicts of interest. So what is this screening all about? Well, according to the World Health Organization, it's the presumptive, presumptive identification of an unrecognized disease in an apparently healthy asymptomatic population by means of tests, examinations, or other procedures that can be applied rapidly and easily to the target population. And this actually comes back to a publication from the 60s by Wilson and Younger, 
And there are three uh, essential conditions for this which remain today. The condition should be important, either very prevalent or very life-threatening. It should be effective means to treat the disease. And there should be a screening process that is effective, acceptable, and affordable. Uh, the uh, World Health Organization, together with the European Observatory on Health Systems and Policies, actually published on this uh, two years ago. And um, they point out three important issues here with screening, that screening may bring benefits, but it also may bring harm. Just because it can be done, it doesn't mean that it should be done. It also says that screening should always uh, uh, mean a screening program that includes all the steps in the screening pathway and not just the screening itself. And it also states that the principles that I just showed in the previous slide remain valid today and are still the gold standard. And this is what they actually propose that you should have in place to have a screening program. So you need to identify the population, invite them, test them, refer for screening of, reported, uh, of positives and reporting of screening negative results, the diagnosis, confirmation, intervention, treatment and follow-up, and reporting of outcomes. If you don't have this whole chain, you shouldn't be doing screening. And it seems that AAA actually suits screening really well, right? Because it's asymptomatic, but with a deadly complication, as we all know. It has reasonably well-defined phenotype, so it's males, mostly smokers, and the diagnosis is quite easy with ultrasound, so it suits screening well. Problem is, the overall prevalence of AAAs is coming down, as probably related to the prevalence of smoking going down. And this is from a nice publication um, from, uh, from uh, Martin Bjork and Anders von Heinen from Sweden, and they, they actually show you that uh, there is a relationship with the decreasing proportion of smokers and the decreasing prevalence of AAAs, which makes the randomized trials on the effectiveness of screening probably not so valid today as they were 20 years ago. There is a recent publication on cost effectiveness of screening, and this is from the Veterans Affairs from the US. And they do, uh, I'm not gonna go into details on this, but they do um, screen uh, males who have smoked at some point, and they come up with the conclusion that it's still cost effective today to screen for triple A's, even though the prevalence is decreasing. How about the Portuguese case? Well, Portugal is a small country uh, planted at the Atlantic coast of Europe. Uh, it has 11 million inhabitants. It's quite multicultural, so we have people from a lot of African and American countries also. We, although we're not Mediterranean, we do like to enjoy a nice Mediterranean meal, and that may explain why our life expectancy is one of the highest in Europe. We are very proud of our football players, and we make uh, uh, we invented MacIver because we make our national sport out of coming up with good solutions in the last moment. But uh, coming into more serious business, we also spend a lot of money on healthcare, and uh, here is the 20 billion euros uh, we spend yearly on healthcare which makes us uh, above the average of European countries on healthcare expenditure per capita, uh, right about where Netherlands and Finland are. So we do spend quite a lot of money on uh, healthcare. And what do we know about the effect of screening for AAAs? Well, we know that there are important uh, discrepancies in the rates of treatment across Europe where you have countries like Germany operating on a lot of elective uh, aneurysm per million inhabitants, per uh, 100,000, sorry. And you have countries like Hungary, Portugal, or Spain operating on a lot less. But importantly, and I would like to point out this here in the slide, importantly, you have a number of 
ruptures that it's not so different per hundred uh, per hundred thousand inhabitants. So meaning that it's the screening which is implemented in these two countries pointed out the UK and Sweden has not made such a large difference in reducing the number of patients treated for ruptures. Also, the uh, mean diameter at which an uh, aneurysm is repaired is, uh, again, the countries who do have screening programs, they kind of fall in the middle again. So what is the real effect of the screening here? You would expect if everyone is screened that everyone would be repaired at a lower diameter threshold, but it's not the case. Actually, uh, both uh, Sweden and uh, the UK have re relatively in the middle, like in between uh, 60 and 64 millimeters in diameter average, uh, whereas other countries like Denmark have uh, larger diameters uh, as average and Germany has lower. So what is, what is the real effect of screening here? And it's interesting that Portugal, having no uh, implemented um, uh, screening program, has a mean aortic diameter uh, repair, very close to the ones that do have screening programs implemented. Uh, so uh, it doesn't seem to make a big difference for us, at least. Also, our rates of rupture have not changed significantly over the last uh, 15 years, as you can see here in this population. And although we do have a bit of um, a high mortality for ruptured aneurysms, that's probably because we take culturally basically all comers. If the patient is alive, no matter how old, unstable, or sick he is, he will get an operation. That kind of drives the numbers up. But this is really the most important slide here, I think, or the most important two slides. So, the problem is you want to prevent death from aneurysms. That's why you want to repair them electively, and that's why you have screening. But in my country, it seems that at least in the 1990, we had the lowest aneurysm-related mortality in Europe. So uh, unlike the UK and Sweden, who had quite high mortality rates, AAA-related mortality, in their countries, we didn't have that problem. Moreover, if you move ahead 17 years, you still have the lowest rates of AAA-related mortality in Europe. And although the Swedish and the UK, with their screening programs, have reduced their AAA-related mortality, ours remain the same. If you look at this, it's basically the lower part of the curve has been reduced and the upper part of the curve remains more or less the same. So it's interesting observations, which makes me, um, well, think that probably a, a screening program in Portugal would not have such a dramatic result. Also, we have to take into account the incidental findings, and there's a proportion of maybe 35 to 45, according to this publication, again, which I cite, um, there are, uh, it's, uh, the screening is offset by incidental findings in a proportion of 35 to 45% of cases. And the more exams you do, and the, it's more common that you do more CTEs, more uh, abdominal ultrasounds for different reasons, the more you do them, the more chances it is that your screening will be ineffective because you'll find your aneurysms anyway through another examination. And the only um, uh, study that is published on Portuguese data on this subject demonstrates exactly this, that you do detect a lot of incidental findings, only we're not doing so good at then referring these patients to care. So maybe they're not reported in the uh, radiological reports, or maybe when they are reported, they just don't reach the vascular surgeon for uh, known reasons. Um, finally, two pilot studies in Portugal and Spain, which are culturally very similar. Um, we have um, one in Portugal who screened 715 male patients, age, mean age 72, so higher age than it would be in a screening program at 65, 
and the prevalence is quite low, it's 2%, with only two patients out of this entire population reaching the repair threshold. And the same thing happened in the region of Barcelona, um, where this, the, 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 the prevalence was even lower at 0.5%, uh, making screening probably not effective in this scenario. So in conclusion, um, to come up with these three um, dogmas from this publication of Wilson and Younger, the condition should be important, life prevalent or life-threatening, but the overall prevalence of AAA is decreasing and AAA ruptures are not significantly different, so a yellow sign here. There should be an effective means to treat disease. I'm gonna give it a green, although it's controversial, especially with the long-term results of EVA. And then the screening process should be effective, acceptable, and affordable. And well, in our case, at least, the AAA-related mortality is not higher. Pilot studies are not dramatically convincing, and incidentally, incidental findings are likely to increase, so yellow sign again. So is screening dead? No, I just think it needs to adapt to the reality of today. And this means improved literacy in the population and doctors like we did in our campaign in our national society recently. They improve the management and logistics of these patients, including referrals of incidental findings. And probably the most important, we need to start targeting screening, maybe to only focus on people who are smokers, maybe even only active smokers. And uh, in my opinion, at least, in patients who are families who have a high prevalence. I invite you to take a look at this uh, advanced uh, endovascular course that we run in Lisbon. And it will be running from 14 to 16 of June. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Federico. Join us and uh, finish your morning here with us, and then in the afternoon. I hope you will have more free time. So thank you for the lecture. And uh, obviously, the, from your point of view, screening in Portugal is, uh, is not important. Any, any comments or questions from, um, from audience? Do you think actually that only the, let's say, the mortality of AAA, that this, this result is uh, en enough that we can uh, consider it valid and uh, enough that we can avoid screening and uh, abandon it or maybe just wish to Im improve the, the mortality from AAA can be a motivation for screening? Yeah, I, I realize this is not a very popular point of view that I just, <laughs> just mentioned. Of course, if, if, if the logistics were very simple, if you could just implement uh, there will probably be no big harm in doing this uh, kind of um, uh, screening. But I, uh, my point is we probably have a lower AAA-related mortality than in other uh, European countries uh, for genetic reasons, maybe. I don't know. Um, because we both in Spain is the same. We have quite a long life uh, longevity. So it's it's... People live a long time, and still they're not dying of a lot of ruptures. So uh, maybe it makes the screening less attractive for uh, healthcare um, um, people who decide on healthcare policy, and they rather focus on other kind of screening programs like breast cancer or colon cancer or something. Um, for years, I was a strong proponent of having a screening program in the country, and uh, actually. Um, a few, a couple of years back, I was in a thesis defense from a, a, a doctor in Portugal whose thesis was exactly on the subject and it made me study the, uh, a little bit further and um, come to the conclusion that probably we shouldn't invest on a, on a global uh, scale, but uh, targeted screening is probably a lot more effective and still um, um, be useful for, for healthcare in general, for the whole population. Yeah, what, what about other pathologies, vascular pathologies like carotids on peripheral? Do you have any kind of screening for that? 
No, we, we don't unless it's targeted screening again. So we, have the, we follow the recommendations of the guidelines, actually. So it's, if you have a patient with a, with a carotid disease, then you should screen for peripheral arterial disease and so forth. And the PAD, they should be screened for other uh, vascular territories. But uh, other than that, no. Yes, only one question, comment. Federico, do you, uh, do you uh, perform mostly EVARs or, or open AAAs? What is the ratio between yeah, the Yeah, mostly and EVAR. And the, in the country at the moment, we have the national data. Um, I, I put it on one of the slides. I think it's there. Uh, it's about 80% EVAR, which is a very high proportion. And I don't think we're doing the right thing, actually. Right, because of that, because uh, I, I saw this... Uh, Low mortality rates and the, the, the screening program did not affect did not affect your mortality rates, but maybe surgical techniques in uh, some other countries and in Portugal. And, and if you're performing a open or, or or endo, and the comorbidities of the patient could influence these, you know, mortality rates. Yep. Yeah. Could be. Yeah. How is the situation in Greece? Yes, uh, congr congratulations for your presentation. I, I was wondering whether there is some kind of genetic predisposition which is not expressed in uh, the Spain and Portugal population and can justify why the screening test is uh, not, uh, let's say, has a benefit for the, for the final result and the outcome of the patients. So what I'm trying to say is maybe the familial aneurysms are predisposed genetically are not uh, expressed or are not so much the high uh, rate in the incidence in the Portugal population. So uh, do you have any data regarding this issue? And my second question is, uh, you showed some very, very nice uh, graphs in which the Portugal is relatively to a high level of uh, decreased rupture rate and decreased mortality. Do you think that by implementing even with these rates a screening test tool, maybe you might have some better results relatively to go to the first uh, level, not to the third or the fourth that you showed in the slide? Thank you. Yes, two, two very good points. The first, I can only speculate, but we do have a, a high proportion of diabetic patients, which is sort of, we know, uh, kind of a protective thing for aneurysms, whatever the reason for that is. Um, but it could be an explanation. Um, of course, genetic predisposition, familial associations, they can also be uh, important, but we don't know. It's strange because we, we have um, a relatively high proportion of smokers still compared to maybe uh, uh, northern European countries whose pr proportion of smoking has decreased a lot. Um, as for your second question, of course, just because we have a relatively low mortality, um, AAA-related mortality reported in, 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 uh, like in administrative databases, we have to also take that into account because uh, it's not common to have a routine autopsy for every patient. So it's, there can be some misdiagnosis in ruptures that are coded as something else in the death certificates, and this is the data that we can have. So it's possible that it's higher, but I, I don't think this would be a mistake that is only made in, the, in this country and not the next country and the other one. So it's probably the same everywhere. So. Um, yeah, we, we, implementing uh, 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 screening could even make these results better. But I have difficulties believing that um, the policymakers, the people who make decisions and need to invest money on this or that, will actually be convinced based on this data that this should be a priority. But I agree, if we can convince them that we should at least target the screening to certain high-risk populations, then um, maybe our results would be even better. Uh, <clears throat> you mentioned also that uh, 
There is an increased rate of uh, incidental finding, incidental diagnosis of uh, AAA annuals in your country. And you also mentioned that there is uh, relative your country has a better funding regarding the economical stability to invest and to find some economical, uh, let's say, funds to give for the patients. So if we correlate these two, to these two points, would you say that for some reason, due to the fact that you give a lot of money to the health in Portugal, maybe you have a lot of examination and this could lead to the increased incidental findings and incidental diagnosis of triple A's or, for example, carotid disease or whatever, a vascular disease. Thank you. Yeah, it's, it's, both are possible. So it's, uh, as you probably know, Portugal is a social, social system and most healthcare is provided by the government and not by uh, private uh, um, or companies. Um, and there is a tendency towards a high investment in healthcare, um, which can then lead to a number of examinations done by, for, for a, a number of different pathologies that then lead to incidental findings. But uh, we, I don't have really good data. It's only, there's one study on a re reasonably small population of, uh, of the north of Portugal that did this incidental findings. And what struck me for this um, uh, particular paper is that there were quite a few incidental findings of aneurysms, but only a small proportion actually reached the uh, outpatient clinic of vascular surgery. Most of them were lost in the way. And the reasons for that are unclear. So maybe it wasn't reported in the notes, so people didn't look at the images and it, it passed. Or it was reported and the GP or whoever else was taking care of the patient thought, oh, it's just a small aneurysm, no need to uh, refer the patient. Because most of them were actually very small aneurysms, like three and a half centimeter aneurysms. But of course, even those are important because the main reason why you should do screening nowadays is not to identify patients to operate, it's to identify patients to give secondary prevention to avoid the operations. So that's actually the main reason for screening. Yeah, thank you. Well, Vladan, yes, please. Yes, thank you. Well, um, what do you think about uh, when we generalize, and we say general population is very high to screen, but the most risky patients are coming to our office every day. What is your experience now if I'm a Claudican coming to Portugal and would I be screened for AAA or carotid artery disease? Because we, I, at least in my country, we are missing the opportunity to deal and to screen this most high risk population. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, there's no strict rule written on this that I'm aware of. So we follow the general uh, ESVS recommendations. And at least in my context where I work, if you're there for a PAD, you get a carotid screening and a triple I screening and, and vice versa. So we, we do this cross screening for vascular disease. Although it's the secondary prevention is very similar in any of the cases, but, uh, but it is, uh, we do that. And, and we do find a lot of patients, those, those are high risk populations, as you mentioned very well, it's, it's the targeted screening that we should invest in. Yeah, we in the Serbian Society for Cardiovascular Surgery, we were admired to the presentations of our Swedish colleagues. And you know those slides that are already presenting with the vascular surgeon sleeping at night uh, because there are no more ruptures. So we said, let's do it here in Serbia because uh, let's become Sweden. And then uh, we approached to the four uh, general hospitals in Serbia and uh, invited them to help us to, to do uh, like a pilot study and screen patients for several months and see how it goes, what is the incidence, etc. And out of those four hospitals, only one hospital accepted to help us. And, uh, uh, this hospital uh, is now going to present uh, uh, what they did in, uh, in 
in three or four months, we have enthusiastic uh, colleague, Vanya Kunkin, who is a general surgeon, who is the head deputy of the hospital. And he did a lot of efforts for three months to, to try to screen uh, population. So Vanya, please uh, show us what you did. Thank you. So, uh, I'm very pleased and uh, honored uh, to uh, speak in front of such audience and uh, experts. And uh, uh, I need to uh, tell that I'm general surgeon. Uh, and uh, this is a little bit uh, slippery territory for me, but um, uh, I go through that uh, pilot program and, uh, and I can tell uh, something about that. Uh, there was uh, a lot of challenges and uh, I, uh, I will uh, try to share it uh, with you. And uh, I'm sorry because of my uh, English. I can speak and without that. <laughs> so, I am uh, uh, my uh, current position uh, in uh, our hospital is that I'm uh, deputy director for medical affairs, and uh, because of that, uh, Dr. Conchar called me in uh, the end of the last spring. Uh, he asked me uh, if I uh, want to help him uh, and uh, all society of uh, cardiovascular uh, surgeons in uh, Serbia. And uh, uh, because of my history, I started uh, uh, on vascular clinic on, in uh, uh, Novi Sad. It was a very uh, great and uh, tough period of my professional career, but uh, it's... Uh, from a uh, current uh, perspective, it's very important for every uh, surgeon to, to go uh, through that. Uh, oh, it started. Uh, our hospital uh, covers uh, about uh, 188 uh, inhabitants, uh, uh, so uh, there's uh, a lot of work. Uh, and we have uh, some uh, data about uh, this screening. Uh, so I will uh, show some of that. Uh, uh, when uh, Igor uh, called me, uh, my headache uh, has started uh, because I, I know uh, such uh, which effort uh, we need uh, to do uh, to conduct uh, this uh, project. Uh, first uh, uh, step was uh, promotion. Uh, uh, we talked about that. Uh, is it enough to send some uh, pamphlets, uh, some papers, billboards, or something that like, uh, like that, or to do um, uh, through uh, written or uh, video media? Uh, we decided that uh, video media is best for that. Uh, uh, we uh, also use internet portals, uh, social networks, uh, uh, e and uh, that was in form of uh, uh, announcements like uh, interviews and uh, uh, conferences. Uh, first conferences was uh, in June. Uh, you will see uh, some graph about that. Uh, and uh, we thought it is that. Everyone will come. Uh, it is great. Uh, it is for the, uh, their sake. Uh, it will be crazier with uh, inhabitants, uh, uh, everyone will come. And that was so in the first uh, two or three weeks, and then it stopped. So uh, we uh, think what we should do, uh, uh, and we uh, came to conclusion that we should repeat it. Uh, and uh, we done it several times, uh, and uh, now I can say uh, it's necessary to repeat uh, such announcement in every two or three weeks. Uh, first, uh, uh, we uh, formed uh, our call center. Uh, they worked for uh, every weekday, uh, eight to uh, 
uh, 12 a.m. and they uh, made uh, lists of uh, appointments for inhabitants. Uh, we have uh, two inclusion criteria. Uh, uh, we uh, ex asked them uh, uh, for uh, smoker, uh, uh, does they uh, were smokers uh, uh, currently or uh, does they were a long time uh, smokers, uh, at least 10 year uh, package year, uh, and uh, if they are older than 65 years. Uh, there was also problems, they lied, they were younger, uh, they didn't smoke, uh, so uh, different peoples uh, came to exam uh, and uh, we, need, uh, we needed to reject them. Uh, next step was uh, to educate our radiologists and uh, persuade, persuade them uh, to do uh, such uh, uh, examination. And uh, I can say uh, I uh, succeeded in that uh, because my wife is a radiologist uh, and she is the only one that accepted uh, this challenge. Uh, and be, uh, s uh, software is uh, made uh, from Heliant in, uh, uh, in deal with uh, Dr. Konchar and uh, uh, Serbian Society of uh, Cardiovascular Surgery. Uh, she said uh, to me that is a little bit uh, complicated, uh, but uh, there is a list of uh, question uh, that uh, she need to uh, fulfill. Uh, I don't know about 20 or 30 questions and uh, those data are uh, going to uh, cen uh, central base uh, in Heliant. They uh, process and analyze that, uh, those data and we uh, done this uh, publication. Uh, those are basic data. Uh, on the left side, uh, you can see uh, the number of patients through months uh, uh, from uh, beginning of uh, our uh, study. Uh, actually, uh, that represents our, uh, our media activity. When we announced uh, that screening is on, uh, they came to exam and then uh, in July it stopped. Uh, then we discussed uh, about uh, uh, new announcement and we go to uh, we went to a local uh, paper and then uh, repeat announcement and uh, from since then uh, we uh, repeat that announcement every two to three weeks so we have continuity uh, October is uh, low because uh, we are gathering uh, data from from uh, uh, this month. Uh, in last uh, Friday we have uh, 19 patients, but uh, we found uh, no uh, aneurysm. Uh, a gender uh, statistic uh, is uh, approximately uh, half, uh, uh, half male, half uh, female, uh, exactly 48% of female and 52% uh, of male. Uh, when we look uh, age, uh, uh, most of patients uh, was from range uh, of uh, 65 to 70 percent and a little less, uh, 70 to 75 years old. Uh, when we look uh, comorbid comorbidities, uh, we can see that uh, diabetes uh, uh, was not so uh, predominant uh, at our uh, examiners. Uh, few patients, around 20, uh, was on uh, uh, Peros uh, therapy and uh, just one on uh, insulin uh, therapy. Uh, if we look uh, for hypertension, uh, uh, about 50 patients uh, hadn't uh, uh, hypertension. Uh, treated, well controlled, uh, was about uh, 105 patients. Uh, uh, just a few uh, uncontrolled but treated and uh, a little less uh, without any therapy. Uh, when we look uh, uh, weight of patients, uh, uh, most of patients was uh, overweighted. Uh, a little less of them was uh, uh, normal weight uh, and uh, 
uh, small amount of patients was uh, class uh, two and class one of uh, obesity. Uh, when we look at uh, uh, smoking habits, uh, uh, that was one of uh, inclusion, uh, inclusion criteria. Uh, former smoker was uh, about uh, seven, uh, 70 patients and uh, act active uh, smoker was about uh, 19 patients. And we, I don't know how, a uh, few patients uh, come, uh, came through uh, uh, like non-smoker. Uh, when we look uh, uh, amount of uh, uh, cigarettes, uh, we can see that uh, most of patients was uh, between a range of uh, 20 and 40 pack year uh, and uh, a little less uh, in the range of uh, 0 to 20 pack years. When we uh, look uh, measure the amounts of uh, blood vessels, uh, aorta was uh, predominantly in the range of uh, uh, 15 to uh, 23 millimeters, uh, right iliac artery between uh, uh, 8 and uh, 12 millimeters, and uh, left iliac artery uh, is the same like right. Uh, and uh, the most important part of uh, our screening was uh, uh, AAA. Uh, we found uh, uh, most of uh, patients was uh, in range uh, from 25 to 35 millimeters. We uh, uh, put uh, uh, patients with uh, subaneurysmal uh, diameters uh, from 25 to 29 uh, millimeters. Uh, there were uh, 13 patients uh, in range from 36 to uh, 45 uh, millimeters. There was uh, nine patients from uh, 46 to uh, 55 millimeters, five patients and one patient uh, uh, above uh, 56 uh, uh, millimeters. Just one patient uh, was sent to our ER because of uh, uh, later and uh, a later diagnostic uh, because of uh, suspicion of uh, dissection. Uh, in percent, uh, it looks uh, like that. 70% uh, of uh, examiné uh, was above uh, uh, 25 millimeters, and 9.1 above 36 millimeters, uh, 3.7 about uh, above uh, 46 millimeters, and just. Uh, and 0.6% uh, uh, above uh, 56 millimeters. And that is uh, uh, what uh, is published in a few studies. So uh, next is uh, uh, to use this like uh, argument in uh, uh, development of uh, national health uh, screening system and uh, if we can see uh, is it possible or not? That is, that is higher than me. Uh, I done, and I will co continue to <laughs> to do what can I to help uh, in this mission. Thank you for listening. Thank, thank you very much for all your efforts and for this uh, presentation. So instead of uh, it was not easy as obviously, but instead of asking you, I would ask Federico. Based on these numbers, would you do screening or not? Oh yeah, yeah. Based on these numbers, but you you also did some sort of targeted screening because you aimed at smokers above 65, both genders, which I thought was very interesting. But um, yeah, I mean, if you have a 10, almost 10 percent um, prevalence, then it's a good argument to do screening in general, at least for this population. But, Actually, we don't know. These are, uh, these are the, the individuals that were, uh, let's say, called us when we told them that we can offer the screening. So those are maybe patients who are more severe than the general population, above 65. Those are more They those... knew what they have done, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we, this is not so well, well represented of the general population, but still I think the incidence is uh, it's pretty high. Uh, any comments from the, from the audience and question for our colleague? General Surgeon, who 
who helped us a lot. This is my mentor. Yeah. Okay, well. I, I feel responsible for this guy and I need to make a comment about uh, First of all, thank you for being so enthusiastic to, uh, uh, to hand out all this uh, screening program. Uh, and you showed how does it work in Serbia, actually keep it in the family if you want it to work. Yes. <laughs> Uh, we are uh, presented here uh, very interesting data. First of all, one that actually uh, Dr. Concha mentioned that we have uh, quite high prevalence of uh, aneurysm in this screening group. Uh, that it seems like the, we are more prone to aneurysmatic disease compared to uh, Portuguese people. And the other, uh, we showed that you uh, we saw that you showed us uh, data about some other uh, diseases. Uh, so my question is actually, uh, when you decide, we're talking here about the uh, aneurysmatic disease screening program, but when you decide to make a screening, would it be co more cost effective to team or to group a screening program? So for example, if you're screening for aneurysm, uh, to screen for something else, to collect the data about other, uh, other diseases that are interesting to, to general population and general health system. So, question for everybody. Yes, of course. Thank you for the question. Do you know any other disease that could be of interest? Or you mean? Uh, we're discussing uh, PAD, we're discussing CAR T disease. Uh, of course, we know, we know that in CAR T disease, that screening program is not cost effective so far, we know that. But for example, uh, diabetes or I don't know, uh, other uh, hypertension, uh, it might be cost effective to, to screen for all these diseases altogether. Or if you're doing uh, ultrasound of aorta, you can do, I don't know, like a, a quick examination of carotid arteries. So would it be more effective or not? So we can uh, include more criteria or something like that? It is possible, I know. Yeah, that's a topic to, to consider for sure. Yeah, thank you. I think it's a good idea. So, thank you, Vanya, very much for the presentation and everything. So, uh, we have to close the session. Uh, our lunch is almost uh, ready. Just as a conclusion from my side, looks like uh, screening is not so easy. It's very demanding and uh, still we are not sure if it's uh, working in any, which format it is working based on all this uh, information we, we got here. So Frederico and Slobodan, you, you want to add something? Yes, uh, sorry Frederico, yeah, yeah thank you. Um, I would just like to point out that um, Clinical Center of Serbia is known to have the, the highest, the highest uh, rates of the ruptured triple A's, the highest series in the European, in the world, and in Professor Davidovich and Dr. Conchar. So uh, having this in mind, this high, uh, high rate of uh, rupture in our country, and in that we saw that 9.1% of the patients uh, had uh, above 36 millimeters. Okay, this was the small, uh, small sample, but uh, if we can project this to our country, I think that we, uh, and based on our research that 30% of the patients are below 65 years. So I think that uh, Serbia for sure deserves the screening program. And um, okay, maybe we should be targeted, uh, targeted with, these, with these smokers and, and males above 65 years. But I think that, um, that it would be significantly decrease the rupture rate in our country. That's my opinion. Yes, uh, I'm, I'm sorry to bring the unpopular point of view, no, no, no. but it's, no, no, no. you know, it is, it is what it is. I mean, um, of course, it, it all depends on the prevalence. If your prevalence is high, if you have a higher proportion of ruptures versus elective than you should have, then of course, general population screening is uh, probably uh, really relevant. Um, then you have to convince the policymakers to uh, except that there will be an increase in elective treatment, so they will have to pay more, have more logistics put in place. So it's not only, it doesn't end when, di when you make a diagnosis, then you have to deal with the consequences of having more patients to treat. Um, if your prevalence is, is lower, then I really think you should focus on specific groups where you know uh, that, that you will find more cases, and those will be active smokers, male, especially male, direct family members of patients affected, yeah.
Okay. Thank you very much for being with us the whole morning. Don't uh, run away after lunch. There will be another session about education and then carotid and peripheral uh, expert talks. Stay with us. See you. Uh, I think we can start with a session. Uh, yeah, Philippe. For the rest of those who are outside, they can, of course, join us. Still at lunch. Can you show me the first, the first slide? Yeah. So thank you all for joining us. Thank you, Philippe, for coming and uh, making our uh, event really interesting. So uh, we're going to have a really nice talks, three of them. And the first one is going to be a Philippe Kohl, the president of the European Society for Vascular Surgery. And he's going to give us a talk on how to publish in the European Journal for Vascular and Vascular Surgery. Thank you very much for the invitation. I already welcomed everybody this morning and, and enjoyed the, the various sessions organized this morning. And uh, I've been asked briefly, mostly for, for younger colleagues maybe, but not only, uh, to uh, say a few words about how to publish in the European Journal. And you know that I had the honor to be senior editor and editor-in-chief of this journal uh, back to 2019. So, the key questions when you submit your manuscripts are, why did you undertake the study? This is what should come out from the introduction. Uh, what did you do? That's the materials and methods. What were the findings? These are the results. And what does it mean? And that's the discussion. We all know, in addition to the biography, of course, and the abstract, these are the key parts of a manuscript introduction materials, methods, results, and discussion. Usually, introduction and discussion are too long. This is quite often. They have to be sh the introduction has to be short. A good discussion is one, one and a half pages. And when I say one and a half page, I mean uh, word double-spaced. It's not printed. And the discussion should be three, four pages, not more than that, five at the really the most. The discussion, I will come back to that, should not be, you know, rediscussing uh, everything which is known in the literature. And usually, and this is from 1998, uh, from Bern in the UK, but you can say that 25 years later, it has not changed a lot. And methods and results can be too short. That's a number of responses to uh, colleagues who uh, read manuscript, and that's about the evaluation. The first thing, of course, is the title. You don't have to write the title when you start. You can finish with the title. Of course, when you submit a manuscript, you have to have a good title. And the title has to be catchy, like treating claudication in five words. Sometimes, it may be the reason someone writes your paper shouldn't have any abbreviations, never any abbreviation, if possible, in the title. And it should be short and informative. And if you, if you have a, a good title, uh, well, people will read it. Uh, if you have a title like somebody put a bullet in Putin's hat, everybody is going to open it. If you have a long title about uh, the biography of Putin, maybe that's not that interesting. Abstract. Well, uh, that should be an accurate summary of the study. You should never put in an abstract something that's not in the core of your study, uh, in the core of the manuscript. And you should never, uh, you should avoid also not putting all important material. That can be a difficult and tricky balance because sometimes it will be too long. So you have to think about what to put there. The aim should be clearly stated, what you aim to do in one sentence. And then the methods in the abstract, is it a retrospective or prospective study? Never fool the reviewer about that. Don't try to say it's prospective when it's retrospective. That's uh, uh, re really bad. Is it randomized? Uh, is it a registry? Uh, what are the inclusion uh, period? And be precise. Uh, if it's 2019 uh, through 2021, that's three years. Be precise. The state the number of patients, because if you report on 150 patients, that's not the same as if you report on 5,000 patients or animals, if it's an experimental study. 
uh, at least a sentence about the statistical analysis, for example, multivariate analysis. The most relevant uh, results should be presented, and if possible, always privilege multi variable analysis and not univariable analysis in the abstract. And the conclusion should be supported by the results that you wrote in the abstract. Never come with something which is not based on results in the abstract. Okay? If you, if you give a conclusion about, well, this technique is associated with uh, improve uh, mortality, uh, you need to report about mortality. If you discuss about endoleague or length of stay, it should be in the result of the abstract. Second, the introduction should be rather short and focused. What do you want? Why are you doing this study? What are your hypotheses? A couple of paragraphs about current knowledge that should be summarized. Okay, we don't reinvent the wheel or hot water. The statement should be supported by appropriate references. Okay, you cannot say, if you say, well, cardiovascular disease is the leading cause of death in, in the Western world, it is true, but at least provide one updated reference. You don't need to have 25 of them. Uh, is your work built upon previous results from the same group? That's always good if you say, well, we have previously reported that, blah, 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 and you cite this reference, people will look, ah, that's a study published in this journal two years ago, that's, they already know what they're talking about. Uh, of course, you have to start at some point and clearly aim to clearly state the aim of the study, and it's very important to try to limit to one aim. If you go to an article in the Lancet of New England, you don't have four or five aims. You cannot um, come with various results, uh, delivering various aims in the same study. That's impossible. That's a major cause of rejection. Now, the method should be extremely uh, adequate, if the methodology is inadequate, the study will likely fall apart. If your introduction or your discussion are not good, but the methods are good and the results are interesting, it's likely that the editor will say revise, okay, if it's high enough in the priority. But if the methods are not good, there is nothing we can do. That's garbage. And if you have garbage in, you will have garbage out. The method should be fully descriptive. The idea is that someone else should be able to repeat your study. So is it retrospective or prospective, if it's so randomized or not? Is it a single center or multi-center study, possibly multinational? Inclusion period, inclusion and exclusion criteria, length and methods of follow-up, and experimental protocol, if uh, any. Be careful with the definitions and always try to define things. If your methods are at some point too long, that's not a problem. Maybe the editor will say, please, this is supplemental material that will be web-based only. We do that in our journal. A lot of journal, you can have journal, you name it, they do that. Uh, how do you define renal insufficiency? Is it creatinine serum level? Is it uh, clearance? Is it drop in clearance? Whatever, okay? This needs to be clear. Myocardial infarction, you know, there is a huge guidelines about universal definition of MI. Hypertension, diabetes, everything needs to be clearly defined. And the key is the statistical analysis. And I advise you, before you undertake a study, to consult with a statistician ask him or advice about the methods that should be used. And you can always have a statistician, if appropriate, as a co-author. That's always appreciated. If you have two different groups, retrospective study that you compare with a lot of differences, you will need to balance for the bias, possibly through propensity score analysis. You, you have to know what it means. The results should be clearly presented. Um, Again, with statistical differences as appropriate, 
and is it univariable or multivariable? Sometimes you report both. You start with univariable and then you go for multivariable. Use illustration. That's very important, especially nowadays with social media also. And uh, a, a couple of figures should be very catchy because we will use them to promote your research. Please avoid redundancies between the text, the tables, and the figure. The text of the results section can be very short, sometimes one or two pages. But then with a lot of tables and figures, okay? If you have Kaplan-Meier curves, you don't need to explain in the text uh, everything in detail. A couple, uh, one sentence is enough. And as I said, uh, tables and figures enhance clarity. Then comes the discussion, which you start normally the, a, a good manuscript well, the discussion will start with a summary of the results, the key results in one paragraph. You should place your study into appropriate perspective with the literature. So these are the findings of the study. And this is the second paragraph of the discussion. This is in accordance with this and this and this study, or in discrepancy with this and this study. And then why is it discrepant? Possible explanation. Now, these are hypotheses, of course. As I said, something key that's sometimes missing, and usually the reviewer will tell and the editor will say, if we go further in the review process, please add a couple of paragraphs clearly acknowledging limitations. There are always limitations. It's impossible for a study not to have limitation. You have to be humble. You have to say one, two, three, four, for example. Then at the end, are they clean, what are the clinical implications of your findings? Does it impact clinical practice, your clinical practice or others? Is, are the results important enough so that we should take them into account in the next episode of the guidelines on the topic? Okay, if it's major, something prospective with a large number of patients, maybe it has an impact on the next set of guidelines on AAA, PAD, venous insufficiency, you name it. And then, of course, a conclusion. And the conclusion should be based on your observations, not something you dream of, not something you think may have happened, you didn't see it. It should be uh, Cartesian. Why are the papers usually rejected? Well, because the experimental design was poor from the beginning. Because it's a, rep because it's a repetition of other studies. The hypotheses are not explained. Uh, the description of study methods is bad, as well as the statistical analysis. The sample size is too small. That's the end of the story. Uh, the follow-up is too short or inadequate. If you discuss about the results of EVAR, I mean, nowadays, most important data are from long-term data of Andolik. If you report one-year data, it's probably not very interesting. Uh, the text is not comprehensible. Uh, you don't conform to journal standards. The, the journal will not adopt to you. You have to adopt to the journal, to adapt, sorry. Uh, the results have been overinterpreted. There has been a poor literature review. For example, you select articles only that goes into your, the direction of your findings and you're not objective. As I've said already, the conclusions are not supported by the data or are not justified. And also, uh, never ever start to argue with the reviewers. That's really bad. Usually the reviewer will win. Uh, the journal, most of the time, we choose good reviewers. Uh, reviewers have to be respectful. This is something as editor we checked, we check. Uh, and you have to answer. You can say, you know, often when, when I write a manuscript and then I get into review and I get comments, I can very much say, well, with this comment, I agree and we change that. And you show clearly what you have changed. You can also say, well, I respectfully disagree with this reviewer because of that and that. This is perfectly fine. But you should not be unwilling to amend your manuscript after re in, in the review process because it will most likely be rejected. So what we do expect to receive at what we will 
be happy to publish in our journal are high quality manuscripts that have an impact on clinical practice. We are mostly a uh, clinical journal, vascular forum may be uh, also open to basic science and translational research. Manuscript that will trigger further research that will be of interest for our readership and bring incremental knowledge to the field of vascular surgery and vascular science more broadly. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Philip, for this uh, very extensive overview on how uh, a paper should be, should be planned and developed. Uh, as a piece of advice for uh, a young vascular surgeon that is approaching such a tough journal to be approached, uh, your piece of, of advice on which is the part that uh, you should start uh, writing as the first part of a paper when you are actually planning to, to do so? Probably the methods. Probably the methods to be, to, to, to be clear in your mind that you, you understand really clearly the methods, discuss with the statistician, then put your results in tables and figure, write a text around it, this is the core of the manuscript, and then you discuss and you introduce. You don't have to you know, follow like you read a book, you know, starting with the, with the introduction and the, the methods. If you can do it, that's okay, but, but usually you'll, you'll, I would start probably with the methods and the results. Thanks. We do have a question from the audience right there. You said that the aim should be one, but the, the hypothesis can be... Well, what, what do you aim to show? I mean, no, you, you, you say my, the, the aim is to report uh, long-term results of this particular undergraft to treat uh, chronic AAA, for example. This is a clear aim. If you add to that that you want to report uh, mortality, quality of life, uh, economic analysis, and show and a lot of things, that's, that's become confusing. That's what I mean. Any more questions from the floor? Uh, please, Professor Gajulo. Philip, thank you very much. I think that this uh, was a fantastic presentation. Thank and you, uh, I think that uh, we need to have this presentation the first year of the residency in all uh, the school uh, in Italy. I'd be happy then, to uh, take my luggage and go around. Yeah, it <laughs> could be a good idea. Then thank you very much. No, my question is regarding um, the um, relationship between the e European Journal and uh, the different type of uh, studies. What do you think about uh, the relationship between the journal and uh, the single center studies and the multi center studies? You think that um, it is uh, better to propose a multi center study to the European journal than not the single? And why not the single? Because sometimes in the single center study you have a lot of information, probably from one center, from one idea. But uh, again, uh, sometimes with a lot of uh, numbers uh, a lot of, of uh, discussion. I'm not the editor-in-chief anymore, so Florian and, and Martin uh, soon may have different ideas. I know Martin is promoting multi-center study a lot. Um, w when you have an impact factor that is high, like six, seven even, and we are way above the others, and we, we, we took this journey years ago, it means that you need to reject a lot of manuscripts. So our rejection rate are usually uh, now probably 80, 85% for original manuscripts. So that's a lot. Um, and so, so to get through, you need to uh, have an incremental value. If you have, let's say, I don't know, again, I'm talking about an undergraft because there's a lot of material there on EVAR, but you could talk about carotid disease or things like that and you have already five centers that have reported the results of a large series, and you come at the sixth center with about the same number of patients and the same type of results, it has no incremental value or very mild incremental value and interest for the readership. For the center itself, yes, because you compare with what, with what the others have done. So, in, in a case of a single center study, I think it should be either new, innovative, or very large number, 
like the one you show in your presentation, there is no question about that. And then the interest also is that it's homogeneous. But if you pull together data from several centers, I mean, the interest is much larger, uh, it's much bigger because the size, the sample size is much bigger. And then you can also uh, make possibly some, some comparison depending upon how deep you would go. So multi-center uh, results, multi-center, yes, results from, from multi-center uh, sev from several centers have a higher likelihood to be accepted by definition. Now, RCTs, I mean, of course, also. I mean, what is also, I think, very interesting are registries, uh, to come back to the discussion of this morning, because registries, especially nationwide registry, if you get uh, a report uh, nationwide with long-term results, it has so much value. Any more questions, comments from the audience? I will just have a short question for you. So, uh, in Europe, uh, you really showed us uh, very nice on the one uh, slide what are the reasons for the rejections. But uh, in order to give a piece of advice, at least for the trainees for Balkan Peninsula, so what are uh, kind of uh, uh, papers that the EGVS is actually looking for? Are those mainly RCTs, observational trials, meta-analysis? So, what is uh, the focus that we the, should... Uh, well, you, you look, you, you, I mean, registries are certainly at the top of the list. Randomized control trial are also there. But then if they are high quality, they will probably go into, you know, circulation, jack, or things like that. And then maybe sub-analysis of our CT would be of our interest. Multicenter studies, innovation, innovation. We had introduced this JUGAR section years ago, uh, some good papers, on, 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 and then we try to cover uh, every aspect. There are always, if you look at any single issue, there is usually, or there are usually more papers on aorta as compared to PAD, for example, or carotid or venous, or lymphatic disease also. We, we try to be broad, but the idea is really to, to be innovative and to report long-term data. We also published a few years ago an ESVS position paper, on, which was an editorial, to, to say, uh, to state very clearly that we need long-term data. On everything, we need long-term data. And that's, again, why, why that's more expensive. I think industry can also help us there, because it needs to be funded as long as this, uh, these, these results are, um, are correct, are, 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 are truthful. But long-term data are really very important. Very good advice, thank you. Any more questions? Okay. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you very much, Philippe, for a wonderful talk. I really enjoyed it as well as the others, I suppose. So I would like to announce our next speaker, Stefano Anchetti from Bologna, Italy, who is going to talk us what are the educational modalities available for the trainees. So very interesting talk for the audience. Again, uh, good afternoon and thanks again once again for the kind invitation that is indeed really much appreciated to be back in Belgrade. Uh, I have to say when I uh, read the title of this presentation the first time I was a little bit worried as this for due reason mainly. First because the educational modalities are continuously changing in particularly in the last decade and second, because uh, this presentation could have become a very boring list of things that the audience uh, actually knows very well. So the educational modalities that were used a few years ago and the new educational modalities we are uh, actually living. So I, I'm about to try to give you my interpretation of uh, educational modalities in Europe right now. And let's start with something like this. T times are definitely changed. Uh, I'm pretty sure. Uh, the big guy on the left top, the big guy in the middle, uh, received quite a different kind of uh, educational modalities uh, during their training. And I'm definitely sure the small guy on the right bottom received a very different education if compared with the other two guys. Definitely surgery gone from being something for a few, talk as master to pupil as a craft speciality, to being something for many, talk on a large scale. And this is because of many, many reasons. 
and different reasons. So I took a look at the statute of the three main uh, uh, educational um, bodies we got around the world, worldwide, the American one, the European one, and the UK one. Uh, and I found, effectively, three very long and very busy list of uh, procedures that should be accomplished at the end of a period of time, not a specific one. Uh, a level that should be accomplished in this period of time and also uh, a long list of educational modalities that, as I said, we always talk about and that probably all of you know as well. I also realized that I was lucky during my residency as my residency was very effective in giving me the vast majority of the things that were listed in, in these three uh, statutes from the societies. So what I'm about to do is giving a, the list in a quite lighter way uh, showing what I did during my residency program because I think my residency program was quite complete and I will propose this kind of list to all the, the, the training environment around Europe and around the world. Uh, as you can see, there is a list and the three uh, first aspects of this list are quite basic. I expect all the people in the audience actually add such uh, a training during the training in residency. The last three are a little bit advanced and maybe no, not all the centers are uh, exposed to something like that. So let's start with the preclinical pre attendance. Something really important in my opinion, so the fact that people start attending uh, a vascular ward, a vascular unit, and vascular operative room before starting the residency. Some people just are uh, thrown inside the residency program without knowing what they are uh, actually uh, about to do. And I think uh, many people that currently enter uh, a residency program uh, are not even sure this is a job for them. We should, we should also discuss the fact that uh, this preclinical attendance could be mandatory. It wasn't mandatory when I uh, was a, uh, a trainee, but I did and was very useful in my opinion. Second thing, of course, theory, so frontal lesson. That's what I did during the five-year span that was my residency program through a monthly inter-school lesson that were live at that time, but that are online right now, where we actually rise in terms of complexity along the, the five years uh, going through basic general, cardiology applied to vascular surgery and stuff like that, basic vascular surgery, specific technical on vascular surgery, so how to treat a particular segment of the vasculature, infrarenal, suprarenal, ending with ultra-specific technical um, lessons on vascular surgeries on how to use some specific materials and devices. Then, of course, we got the hands on that is learning and doing, learning by doing, learning by using your hands, that could be divided, in my opinion, in surgical and non-surgical. We got an hands on surgical, so, of course, uh, through the five years, I've been exposed to basic surgical skill implementation and basic endovascular skill implementation. And since the first year, we were, as a trainees, exposed to planning in first person. So you are the, the, the person that plan uh, the treatment, and then you discuss with the mentors such uh, treatment. As you can see, the first part of the residency is uh, more a senior to trainee relationship, while the last part of the residency is a trainee to trainee re relationship where both parts actually learn from each other. We got the hands on non-surgical, so a list of things that are uh, very important and mandatory in a training, like uh, understanding where you are and how things are working, of course, in your department the first year, going through learning how to perform a duplex ultrasound, learning the basic medical therapy in the vascular patient, both preoperatively, postoperatively, and then chronically, the imaging interpretation, how to perform dressing wounds, and also, in our case, specific case, how to speak in a daily meeting in the morning. Those are the pictures that were taken at our daily meeting in the morning that could be very scary at the very beginning of the residency, uh, as you can see on the, in the picture on the right side, there is the fear in the, in the eyes of the, of the fellow with a, with a white coat, actually. But that is very important for a young physician that also need to understand and learn how to speak to senior and how to explain the work and how to explain how the things are going in the ward and in the OR. Those were the basics. Uh, I think that for several reasons, uh, 
simulation and augmented simulation, that is the next topic I'm about to talk, uh, are gaining uh, importance. And those reasons are that the learning by doing concepts still works in surgery, but should be reconsidered for many reasons. Current surgical trainees are limited by a lack of opportunity of what comes through the door. And in recent years, there has been a greater emphasis on simulation as a surgical training tool to achieve same level of competency and maintain patient safety. That is mandatory nowadays. Uh, let me give you a very brief view of this uh, paper that was published by DDST, uh, by Averginos in 2023, that through a review, uh, after a survey to trainees in, Italy, in, um, in Europe, tried to give a, a, a view uh, and uh, drawing a profiles for vascular trainees in Europe. What we can actually understand is that increasing num we, got, we are assisting an increasing number of trainees um, every year increasing, an increasing request in terms of time and financial optimization by hospital boards that is leaving less space for education, and also many difference in uh, a country like Europe uh, because of difference in training curricula, operative procedure, exposure, training evaluation, logbooks, and so on. So a very heterogeneous and overcrowded situation with most probably an insufficient time to learn. Then we also have been affected by external uh, event like COVID that uh, furtherly and further um, affect the training. Uh, as is reported in this paper that I had the pleasure to publish together with other EVST colleagues, 73.5% of trainees reported COVID-19 pandemic have neg neg negatively affected their training and education and agreed on some kind of compensation after such a disaster. And we finally know that Simulation in vascular surgery is effective, is well established in many fields of vascular surgery. It could actually replace somehow open aortic treatment and is very effective in endovascular simulation. So how it worked in my, in my department. We are lucky because we have a sort of lab, a simulation lab next to our department where the trainees uh, I won't say they are free to go, but uh, the, the lab is always open. Uh, you just have to ask to go there and train both on, in uh, um, open and endovascular surgery. So we were lucky by this point of view. Also, our mentors and professor pushed on um, attending courses on simulation, uh, in particular in those aspects that we cannot actually cover within our department. Uh, like animal lab and cadavers lab that are two options other than simulation with simulators that I had the, the pleasure to, to attend during my residency. We had the society that is always pushing to uh, improve the condition of trainees around Europe in different countries and is doing so through the Yes Yes Academy that is the wing uh, that is related to education that is actually providing five different paths on the five main topics of education to uh, fulfill the requirements of trainees and uh, compensate what the uh, training program around Europe are lacking. Those, by the way, are the results in 2022 of the SVS Academy. Finally, we got the new technologies that could have a role. Sometimes they simplificate everything. Uh, Live cases, this is a lesson that was uh, held by our chief uh, to all the Italian trainees. They were doing actually a, um, a standard procedure with a particular endograft, and all the trainees around Europe in a multi-school um, multi lesson were actually exposed to such a procedure without moving from home. And in the same occasion, we had the, the, the opportunity to also try this new tool, this new toy of augmented reality that in the future most probably could help even more uh, by the educational point of view. Finally, research. They definitely push a lot on research on us. Uh, Philip also stressed this aspect and uh, Professor Gajulo stressed this aspect uh, with his question. Uh, we have been exposed to uh, research since the first year. This is very important because you get used to that. Um, you start with data harvesting, database, and follow-up, the most simple parts. Then you go to case reports, court studies, and literature review. And then you end the last years with more complex papers that, of course, must be mentored by more experienced 
um, writer, I would say. Finally, we also have courses that could help uh, trainees in developing the ability to perform science. This is one of the course we are taking care of every year in Bologna. The, the translation of the title is Scientific Communication in Vascular Surgery. Uh, every year a bunch of trainees have been invited from Italy, have been invited uh, in Bologna and they got some kind of time, like one day or two days, to read some literature and try to make a draft of a paper then at the very end is reviewed by um, very expert uh, writers. And concluding, reading is something that the former chief before the actual chief that was Professor Stella always said to, to me and to all of us is that reading is uh, mandatory for a vascular surgeon and for a doctor and for students for many reasons in order to develop an oriented and critical view uh, to the professional world we, we actually choose and also be updated on the current best clinical practice that in particular in a small speciality like, like the one we have chosen is continuously changing and evolving and also to be stimulated in challenging and questioning already published research. So reading to become uh, a writer at the end. So in conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, and I hope I did not bore you with this quite long list of, of educational uh, tools. The past decade has seen uh, the beginning of a re revolution in the way surgeons uh, learn the aircraft. Challenges for a complete vascular surgery training are many and differs in each country, sometimes even in the same country. For the teaching hospital, being conscious of their limits represents the first step to overcome these limitations. And simulation-based education, new technologies, international internship and fellowship that weren't listed but could be another way to compensate something that is lacking, represent powerful tools to offer uh, a complete education in vascular surgery. And of course, uh, don't forget about reading and doing research. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you Stefano, for a really nice uh, presentation. Uh, I would like to call the next speaker, uh, Veselin Petrov, who is, yep. Uh, we're going to have discussion after uh, uh, Professor Petrov uh, presentation, who's going to give us a talk on how much open surgery should a young vascular uh, trainee do. Please. Dear moderator, dear colleagues, dear professors, it is nice for me to present to you uh, some kind of uh, uh, another point of view. Stefano gave us. Uh, the very scientific uh, way of uh, the education, but I will try to give it a little bit different. So, uh, as you know, I will not speak more about uh, history, but since uh, the 90s, you know that interventional radiology is developing very fast. Uh, a lot of people that are not vascular surgeons try to perform it, especially in my country. That is the point of view that, uh, that I want to discuss with you. Uh, the financial dependence, uh, dependence of our vascular surgery is very high because after drugs and prostitution, you know that interventional radiology proved to be the most profitable business, one of them, in the world. And all this pushed the open surgery into the corner. It's difficult to work with an energy consuming and wanted by most vascular surgeons in comparison with the rapid results of interventional radiology. Additional pressure for the development of interventional radiology is given by the directors of the hospitals in which there are such laboratories for the purpose of financial gain. And you see here, the interventional radiologist who is the king or the emperor and the vascular surgeon who is fighting the complications of this. And this is a financial equivalent. And this is the production that is for the young surgeons. They must get used to that for the rest whole of their life. And this is the interventional radiologist giving interviews and the vascular surgeon is crucified, as you know. The fight for patients, which is nowadays taking place, is uh, <clears throat> very much depending on the decision of the responsible physician, and it is uh, increasingly in favor of the interventional. 
saving effort and burden in the operating room and the surgeons, but frequent complications after interventional radiology as well as significantly worse long-term outcomes are not addressed. They are not speaking. As Professor Davidovich this morning said, I like it very much, you should explain to the patient all the things that will happen to him after you finish and do the job. And not only immediately, but after five or ten or more years, if he is still alive, of course. And all this, uh, <clears throat> when we uh, make uh, our presentation to the patient, is very nice uh, looking, but uh, it sounds wonderful without considering the complications. In my country, there is a process that is, uh, as far as I see, demoralization and demotivation of the vascular surgeon to work. Why? In state hospitals, there is currently a process uh, which is uh, considering low salary, lack of depreciation of the facilities, increasing urgency in the most serious nature, increasing demands from patients and their relatives to the surgeon, going as far as physical self-motivation and constantly current reduction of personnel. All this leads to a mass departure of vascular surgeon from the state to the either private hospitals or to outpatient practices where there is no urgency, they work more comfortably. Uh, but in this table you can see the number of doctors in private hospital, there are many very active in the states still very few not interested in work. And I will speak also about the nurses. They are young, thin, beautiful, and many of them in private hospitals. And you see only beautiful and pensioners in the state hospitals. Uh, I spoke about the vision of the director of the hospitals uh, and <clears throat> the medical facilities. The truth is in open surgery. I would not like to neglect the intervention of radiology, but we should not forget this simple truth. More and more studies around the world show that, and this should not be missed when you talk to the patient uh, before the action you are going to take with him. A vascular surgical intervention with a good prolonged result is called bypass. Every young vascular trainee surgeon must know and be able to perform the main types of operations before becoming a specialist. Here is the five necessary things a young surgeon must do in the operating room, surgical operations. You can see, I think that this is the base on which you should upgrade <coughs> constantly when you become a specialist. And to say some words before I finish about the working condition of young vascular surgeons, uh, <clears throat> in order for them to learn to operate and not be afraid of the encounter in pathology, which uh, we are more experienced and must create conditions for them to get to know, participate, and learn the basic vascular surgery techniques and knowledge in the operating room. I remember a lecture of Professor Paul Sergeant who told me that uh, uh, he has uh, a fellow from Uzbekistan, a young trainee who has done 400 times hands-on something outside of the operating room. And when he got in the operating room, he could do absolutely nothing. So have that in mind. Taking a specialty in vascular surgery should be done after proven mastery of all the operations and techniques described above, so that we do not create specialists that just to fill the vacant staff numbers of those who have left. And that is all for me. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you for Professor Petrov and uh, uh, for your nice talk and presentation. So I would like to open uh, now uh, time for discussion. Uh, is there any questions for Stefano or, or, or Professor Petrov from the audience? Yes. Is the radio our? Stefano, your uh, Can you give him, him the, the microphone? Hello, Stefano. Uh, so, during your residency, how many hours during a week uh, you spend uh, in operating room? 
Well, I should, I should count a little bit, uh, for sure less, uh, if compared when I was a medical student, uh, because of course I had to spend more time doing clinical practice and all the outpatient clinic and stuff like that. It really depends. Uh, in, in, our, in our department, we are many trainees. We, we were many trainees, actually. Uh, so everything is very well divided. So you got your week of um, surgery, your week of um, outpatient clinic, uh, your week of counseling with the, um, with the senior doctor. So I, I cannot quantify, actually. If you are in your, your uh, week of surgery, you go to the to the OR uh, nine o'clock to seven o'clock in the in the evening every day. Yes, yes. We, yesterday when Cindy from US uh, explained, she have only one day in operating room in Friday. Yes. So well, I, I have to say the the view that that colleague yesterday gave us was more centered on research, and yes. the, her position was more a research position than a clinical position. So I understand that out of her work, one one day out of seven is is. What she got. And, and more on question, uh, uh, if you compare open surgery or endosurgery during your education, more cases were like open or endo. Okay, in, in our particular case, we are a center that is very busy and very motivated on endovascular. And, uh, and that's why I gave you the examples I gave you before. If, you, if something is lacking because of uh, the financial situation or situation in that reason or just in terms of number, uh, you have the tools to go around and, and, and compensate. For example, I, I, w I was really exposed to everything about uh, endovascular treatment since, since I was the first year. I mean, a lot. Uh, and less to open surgery. Then I decided to come here uh, to have my fellowship uh, for many months. I spent here and I spent all the day in the OR and I reach somehow the numbers that should be reached also in open surgery. But I could compare myself to a colleague of mine that is right here. He got plenty of experience on uh, open surgery and maybe he desire or deserve uh, to reach the number of endovascular procedure I've seen or, or uh, actually done in, during my residency program. So it, it, we cannot generalize this, this speech so much because every country have differences and every training got differences. Some trainees are more lucky during that five years, six years, four years, some less. So it's, very, it's a very difficult talk, in my opinion. Uh, thank you, Radivoy, for, for this uh, nice questions. So just to continue on your uh, talk, so when we are on the, on the topic of uh, open or even in the endovascular surgery, which is lacking here, obviously, in the Balkan Peninsula. So my question to Professor Petrov, as well as to Stefano, but Stefano already answered some of the, the, this question is, so how to acquire this uh, kind of uh, uh, endovascular or open surgery? So in this endovascular era, we know in the Western uh, European countries, so most of the procedures are performed in endovascular fashion. But still on Balkan Peninsula, I do have a sense that most of the procedures are still performed in the open surgical manner. So I would like to ask first you, Professor Petrov, so what is your opinion on how to acquire more open surgical skills? What would be your piece of advice for the uh, trainees or the young uh, fellows from the Western European countries? Uh, thank you very much for your question. As I said already, it is very important that the young surgeon should visit operating room even, I think, as a student. And then uh, he should acquire the normal uh, general surgery technique so that then he can upgrade the vascular condition because, as someone said in America, a very famous person, I will cite him, uh, uh, the vascular surgery and the cardiac surgery are the head of the spear. This is the most important thing. And this is the more difficult surgery. And in historical point of view, it's um, quite uh, soon uh, developed because of the technology and the difficulty. So, the young surgeon should be uh, visiting the operating room for open surgery, I think, every day. 
Uh, also, he must uh, develop the other surgical skills that will speak for endovascular. But uh, when you are not uh, develop, developing uh, open surgery, then it is not okay. Because, just for finish, uh, endovascular techniques can be uh, reached in one or two years by a young doctor. Uh, but for 10 years at least, you must become a surgeon, or even I would like uh, to say even more. Thank you. Thank you for your piece of advice. And you, Stefan, already mentioned uh, uh, simulation-based uh, training. Uh, the ESVS as a whole uh, well, is quite active in this field with their academy. And what do you think are the uh, major obstacles in simulation-based training? I mean. Uh, in each country. So what do you think uh, and how this could be uh, avoided in future? Uh, I think, thank you for the question, Peter. I think the, the main problem, I think the main problem is uh, financial, of course, because simulators are still uh, very expensive, both the open surgery simulators and the endovascular surgery simulators. So, uh, for some countries, it could be difficult to, to achieve such numbers. In my opinion, every teaching hospital uh, in Europe should have a suite for simulation with at least a couple of, of simulators for standard procedures, but of course they are very expensive. Uh, another aspect uh, is that maybe we should start publishing more studies and paper that reports the effectiveness of simulation in vascular surgery, because if we motivate uh, the governmental bodies that they could actually save money and have a better results with trainees, with simulation, they will stop wasting money with other very expens expensive things and start investing in such, such simulators and suites. Thank you, Stefano. Any more any questions from the audience uh, for our lectures? Okay, I just just uh, a brief, uh, qu uh, just a short question for both of the uh, uh, lectures. So, what is your opinion? How to compensate? Uh, you mentioned the, the the your paper on the COVID. Uh, during the COVID pand pandemic, that a lot of trainees were affected, of course. And what is your opinion, you, Professor Petrov, and you, Stefano, just shortly, how to compensate this? Uh, uh, what is your opinion? Should the, the, the residency be prolonged for these people? Or is there a space how we can compensate for this loss? After you. Thank you very much. Uh, I think that uh, work is the right uh, word. You should work more and more and more. Of course, this pandemic situation was very bad. I think the reduction you mentioned of 75% is even more has been in my country. And uh, uh, the, a lot of patients were lost. A lot of patients didn't receive what they should. And now there is a lot of uh, more and more patients coming uh, to us, and we should work more. That is my... Uh, answer to your question. In my opinion, the prolongation of, of uh, surgical training is, is the option, and maybe the only option, because of course if you have lost some time during the, your training, you have to uh, recover somehow. But if you think to such uh, a, a situation, then you go to affect other people that are uh, ending their residency because they, they find another, another person that is uh, right there asking, doing what he was expected, she was expected to, so this is a very difficult, uh, difficult uh, uh, answer to give to this question. And for sure, the single centers together with the government should have told something, because for some trainees, uh, as the pandemic is over, two years have passed, more or less since the first wave, the most difficult part of it, uh, some trainees are right now outside there in some center working without having effectively uh, terminated, completed their training. So a very difficult question. I, I don't have an answer, an answer apart from prolonging the, the, the period of training and maybe making it more effective. For sure, my piece of advice for every trainee, I, I'm not speaking as a senior because I was a trainee a couple of years ago, is don't waste, you just have to push a lot for 
five, four, six years. So just push for that five, four, six years. Don't waste even one hour. If you are proposed to go to the OR, just go to the OR. If it's very late, if it's night, and they ask you for just going there, moving the light, just go there because it's just for five years. Then you're outside in the in the dark alone, and you maybe you you could regret not having spent so much time in, in the OR. Yeah, uh, thank you. Very good uh, presentations. Very good. Thank you. I have been teaching uh, trainees or been responsible for selecting trainees and education in Helsinki University Hospital since 2012. So it's 10 years and uh, there has been a lot of uh, fellows uh, graduating vascular surgeon, and I have found that one of the most important thing is selection of trainees uh, and selection of good surgeons because vascular surgery is difficult. They have a lot of responsibility, and we all know that our skills are different, our hands are different, as is our voice if we are singing. And that is the most important point, who you select. And then it's just a joy to see how they learn and you can give them responsibility even to operate errors. And uh, I, uh, my question for you is that should we have some kind of uh, technical skill test before we accept anybody to education, not in the end to just to see if anybody has, or if they have learned, but in the beginning. <coughs> Professor Petro, maybe you can answer. I think that uh, we should address people that want to become vascular surgeons, and they should um, choose by themselves, so if they are are ready or they are fit for this work. It is a hard work and they should know it from the beginning. Of course, uh, if I have 10 students or trainees, I would like to show them who is uh, becoming a surgeon and who is not for that difficult work. This is a very nice question. Thank you very much. And I think you're doing the same. Stefano? Uh, you, you were married suggesting uh, to have some uh, some kind of attitudinal test before the people actually get into a residency program, right? Yeah, at some point. Yeah, that, that, that would be ideal. Uh, we should find a, a way to, to judge the ability and the potential of people before having them uh, into the reality of vascular surgery that I think it could be difficult. I also think that uh, residents during the four, five, six years they spend into residency, self uh, select themselves uh, a lot. So sometimes they do the job uh, by, by themselves at, at the end of residency, or maybe not at the very end, but a few years before the, the end of residency, you realize as a teacher who is more uh, on some subject and some topic and who is more on other subject. And fortunately, a, a, a vascular surgery unit, uh, an equip is made by many different people, so you can choose to keep different personalities and different proficiency out of this self-selection. So I would like, to, uh, due to sake of time, I know it's quite interesting uh, talk that we are having, but for the sake of time, we're gonna move to the next uh, uh, session. I would like to thank you, Stefano, Professor Petrov, and Philippe for giving us a wonderful talk. Let's reward them at least with the applause. <laughs> and uh, stay here with us because the, also an interesting karate session is coming. Yep. Thank you.
Well, I wish you, uh, I want to welcome you to this carotid session. It has, it has been exciting today and an interesting program. Uh, we are right on time. We we'll hope to stay that way. Uh, so this is a session about carotid disease. We have many interesting uh, lectures and uh, enough uh, lectures. So I will immediately uh, call Dr. De Borst uh, to give his lecture about the changes in treatment approach for carotid near occlusion. A uh, very interesting topic. Oh, you joined us. So I, I guess Dr. De Borst is online. No, it's not. All right. Okay. Well, uh, actually, then we can skip that uh, for now. If Dr. De, De Borst comes online, perhaps he can jump in later, not to, not to waste any time. Okay. All right, since my lecture is the second, so uh, I, I will give my lecture now. <laughs> So, dear chairman, ladies and gentlemen, uh, it is a great, really, honor and pleasure not only to uh, moderate such a session, but uh, also to participate as a presenter. Uh, so, I will be talking about early surgery for symptomatic carotid stenosis, the experiences uh, of the institution I'm working in, that's the Clinic for Vascular and Endovascular Surgery of the Serbian Clinical Center, and some data for the Serb Vascular Re Registry, uh, which I managed to pull. So actually, we all know that the stroke is one of the leading causes of mortality in, in the world uh, and represents a huge both medical and economic burden, especially for the developing countries. And unfortunately, Serbia is still uh, one of those countries. Actually, about uh, 15 to 20 percent of ischemic stroke is due to ipsilateral carotid, internal carotid artery stenosis. More than 85 is embolic and 10 to 50% preceded by transitory ischemia. Uh, and actually, one of the reasons we are all talking about symptomatic carotid disease is because the stroke occurrence or reoccurrence can be prevented with the rem removal of the source of embolization. The history of carotid surgery is almost 70 years old. Actually, uh, the pioneers of carotid surgery on three continents uh, almost simultaneously uh, demonstrated that you can actually unstroke a patient with a surgical intervention. So they introduced the surgery in the treatment of patients with cerebrovascular diseases. Actually, it took another 35 years to precisely establish the indications, contraindications, and complications uh, and to answer the question, to whom should the operations be done? And actually, it took another 10 years uh, to answer the question, when should it be done? Uh, namely, uh, it took in-depth uh, and subgroup analysis uh, of, the, of the data from those randomized controlled trials uh, to find out that the risk of uh, recurrent stroke is actually the highest immediately after the initial neurolog neurologic event and that it declines through time. Uh, the authors, without a doubt, demonstrated that uh, the number of carotid endarterectomies needed to prevent one stroke is five if they are performed within two weeks of the initial neurologic event. On the other hand, if we put, postpone the operation for 12 weeks after the neurologic event, it takes 125 operations to prevent one stroke. Hence, the actual gui guidelines, uh, which have no uh, doubt about uh, uh, the timing of the operation. Uh, they, give, uh, they push forward the carotid endarterectomy compared to carotid stenting in symptomatic patients, and they suggest that the operation should be performed within two, as soon as possible, but within two weeks uh, from the initial event. Of course, 
all the contraindications for early carotid endarterectomy are well known and interpreted, uh, uh, integrated in those guidelines. Actually, following those guidelines, <clears throat> several years ago, uh, we reached and received the collaboration hand from the two of our biggest and most important neurology hospitals that are specialized in dealing with cerebrovascular disorders, Special Hospital for Cerebrovascular Diseases, Sveti Sava, and Department of Emergency Neurology of the Emergency Center of the University Clinical Center of Serbia. We began our cooperation more than five years ago, and we designed a simple around-the-clock algorithm for the patients coming into those hospitals. Uh, namely, uh, if patient has acute hemispheric symptomatology like TIA, crescendo TIA, minor stroke, with unaltered consciousness, uh, urgent brain CT shows no hemorrhage and uh, shows ischemia, uh, which is less than one third of the ACM irrigation air area, then the urgent carotid, and, uh, carotid artery duplex scan or CT angiography uh, in the same time with the administration of appropriate therapy is mandatory. Uh, if the ipsilateral carot internal carotid artery stenosis more than 50% is found and is deemed responsible for the neurological symptoms, emergency vascular surgical consultation is uh, in order 24-7 around the clock. If not, then the optimal medical therapy is continued. Using these protocols, in the past five and a half years, we have operated on 317 urgent carotid patients. As you can see from this table, uh, around 50% were minor strokes, uh, while TIAS and crescendo TIAS were the other half. Uh, and uh, the duration uh, between symptoms to operation was an average of five and a half days, which is not a bad result. Uh, most of the patients were operated in regional anesthesia. <clears throat> Therefore, the shunt was necessary uh, in only about 10% of the patient. Eversion carotid endarterectomy was our uh, preferred method of uh, operation, while the graft and patch were much uh, less commonly used. Uh, actually, when you take a look at the outcome, Everyone here who deals with symptomatic carotid patients and knows how unstable uh, those patients are uh, can notice that 3.8% uh, of the stroke rate uh, for those patients is not too high, uh, although significantly higher uh, when operating on non-urgent symptomatic or asymptomatic patients. We had no deaths during this period and hopefully will continue in that manner. Actually, I tried to pull some data from the CERBVASC registry and to see how is the situation in other institutions. And we can see from the distribution of oper vascular operations in the CERBVASC registry, we heard about that in the earlier sessions, that carotid endarterectomy and operations for carotid disease are actually the most common entries uh, in the CERBVASC registry, 1,500 so far. And I have to remind you that our registry is still young uh, and it operates only for three years. So 21 institutions, it's not a bad score. But when we take a look at the symptomatic carotid disease graph, then we can notice that uh, only about half of those uh, operated patients from the onset of symptoms to the operation uh, were actually treated within a two week uh, window, so hopefully uh, we'll also improve the CERB-VASC registry to get the listings uh, across the institutions and the cities and the regions in Serbia and to see uh, where we can and how we can improve this. Actually, in summary, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to state that each symptomatic patient requires expeditious individual assessment and treatment plan based on collaboration, I would say 24-7 collaboration between the neurologist and vascular surgeon. And every one of us who operates on these emergency patients, uh, I think that has to remember the words of Ross Naylor, uh, that the surgeon who performs carotid endarterectomy within two weeks from the initial neurologic event and procedural risk of 10% will prevent much more strokes than the one who postpones surgery for four weeks and performs it with a procedural risk of 0%. Thank you very much for your attention.
Thank you so much. Congratulations for the registry. I know it's hard to start the registry and go on with it, but it's, it's really good. Any questions from the audience? I would like to ask you a couple of questions. First, uh, I, when you listed your complications, uh, you, had, uh, you didn't have the hypertension syndrome there. Do you uh, collect the information on that particular? Actually, actually, we did have several patients uh, with a hyperperfusion syndrome, uh, but from the start of our uh, prospective base, uh, uh, we did not enter those patients because uh, we uh, our collaboration with those, uh, especially with the hospital Saint Sava, which is the biggest hospital for cerebrovascular diseases in the in the country. Uh, actually, we operate on the patients and then transfer them back tomorrow, 24 hours after surgery, to the neurology hospital to be further monitored and treated by neurologists. Uh, they are very experienced. They have a neurosurgical patients there as well, a neurosurgical consultant and so on. So they continue their treatment of those unstable, neurologically unstable patients in the St. Sava Hospital. Unfortunately for this <clears throat> review of our database, we didn't get the info from the St. Sava Hospital about hyperperfusion syndrome. We had some that we know of in, in our hospital, uh, but uh, not on the long-term basis. But those patients urgently operated, even for TIAs with a very small neurologic deficit. They're always kept for observation uh, under neurological supervi uh, supervision for at least a week after surgery. Thank you. Would you like to have a question? Yes, uh, it was a very nice, fantastic presentation with a lot of patients operated and very nice results. I was interested uh, in one uh, small thing. Uh, I saw here you have uh, something like 13% of grafts used in uh, carotid surgery. What kind of grafts? Do you mean patches that are synthetic or what? No, actually, I mean synthetic grafts, uh, graft replacement of the whole carotid artery. In fact, when we started, uh, we had a very low percentage of graft use uh, uh, in our everyday practice uh, with elective cases. Uh, because the disease is uh, much less advanced, uh, the periarterial infl inflammation uh, is much less. Uh, and we notice that symptomatic patients, acutely symptomatic patients, they truly have a different uh, pathology of the carotid artery, the plaque and the bifurcation. Uh, so we found that uh, even though uh, in non-emergent cases, we had a graft usage of uh, about 6% uh, when the eversion and arterectomy, when we are not pleased with, with the outcome of eversion and arterectomy, but we noticed that uh, in the uh, emergency setting, we had almost twice as much. One difference, again, <laughs> between our uh, clinic was that you had less hematomas uh, than we do. But I noticed that you give aspirin before the operation. We used to have Plavix with aspirin or, or DAPT. Maybe that is the reason for the difference. Uh, actually, uh, perhaps the reason we also uh, uh, have patients uh, who had uh, one dose uh, of clopidogrel besides the aspirin. Uh, we give 300 milligrams of aspirin to the patients who are not previously on anti-aggregation therapy uh, immediately after surgery uh, and the loading dose of statins. Uh, but uh, very often neurologists give the, the Plavix to the, to the patients when they see them first with a neurologic disorder, but it's only, uh, it didn't uh, contribute too much to our to hematoma formation because it was one or two uh, pills, they didn't receive the loading dose. We also operated on patients after thrombolytic therapy and mechanical thrombectomy. Uh, so our experience is that if the patient had uh, only one or two or three doses of Plavix, uh, it rarely uh, saturates uh, and uh, influences the platelet function so much. And besides, we have tests, uh, uh, agrogometry, where we check the, the platelet function immediately before the operation and after the operation and titrate the therapy. 
Excellent. I think we move forward, but before that, I just uh, want to comment about delay and how to achieve the two weeks. And we noticed that many times it's also patient-related delay. So they seek help only after a few days. And when I was in in United States, there were continuous advertisement in the television that if you have these symptoms, please go to doctor. Do you have something here in Serbia? Uh, well, uh, you saw the registry where all, uh, we started uh, uh, noting those differences from the onset of symptoms to the physical examination by the doctor and to the operation. Uh, so actually the patients, especially with transitory ischemias, they are coming to the doctors uh, late and they suffer a few tears before they go to the doctor or wait for the stroke uh, to be seen by, by the physician. Uh, but actually the patients uh, who had a stroke or a tear were admitted uh, by the neurologist and then suggested the operation, they seldom refuse. They, they usually go for the surgery, even though uh, we have to explain them that these are the operations with the perioperative risk between 5 and 10 percent. That's the way we explain uh, those things to our patients, and they seldom refuse. Excellent. Do you have patients that you want to operate and they don't want? Um, they very, want stenting. Very, uh, no, no, that's very rare, very rare. I envy you because we have a lot of such cases which we consider suitable for operation and unsuitable for stenting, but the patient says, I don't want operation. Don't. Well, actually, uh, here, uh, here we follow the guidelines. We, we don't have any doubts that, and we explain to the patient, if they ask, raise that question, we explain them that in this case uh, of acute symptomatic carotid disease, uh, operation is actually less risky than stenting. Yeah. Uh, I wonder if uh, Professor De Borst is online? Not yet. Not yet. Okay, right. maybe we go to the next speaker. Uh, I think it's early carotid endarthritis, pros and cons. Yes. Uh, my colleague, Professor Manolovic from the Novi Sad Clinical Center of Vojvodina, he will be uh, talking about early carotid endarthrectomy. I'm sorry, Vlada, if I, if I stole some of your slides. No, no, you gave a great introduction of right. things that I'm going to speak, and I'll try to keep as brief as possible on uh, pros and cons in early car uh, carotid endarthrectomy. Uh, we've seen that patients with symptomatic carotid disease who experience either TI or minor stroke are supposed to be operated as early as possible. And then, uh, of course, it makes sense, as we know, and it's very well documented in scientific data, that the highest risk of uh, recurrency is within two years, two weeks. Uh, and this risk is from 20 to up to 25% in some uh, reports. I'm not saying that is always like this. Uh, and then uh, uh, the curve looks like this. It is steepest at the beginning with a risk of 6% uh, within the first two days and gets uh, flat at the end that uh, gets close to the risk of asymptomatic carotid disease. So, Actually, if we perform our operation within 14 days of symptoms, uh, we will be able to prevent most or the majority of strokes, and that's what we call early or acute carotid endarterectomy. And then we can try to be even more efficient to do it very early within first two days, and we call it very early or hyperacute or emergency carotid endarterectomy. And then we have this delayed carotid endarterectomy. Of course, there are always a concern of uh, complications such as uh, hemorrhagic transformation of, of ischemia or mobilization of instable plaque. But uh, the January issue of uh, Journal of Vascular and Vascular Surgery uh, came up with the results of meta analysis showing that this procedure can be done fairly uh, safe 
with the risk of only 2.5% uh, for early and 4.9% uh, for very early carotid and arterectomy for 30-day risk of stroke and death. Uh, the reason why the hyperacute uh, carotid nerve might be with the highest, high risk because here we have two types of patients, patients with, who are very stable with single TS, we can operate them next day, of course, and then they have, we have uh, instable patients with crescendo TS or stroke in evolution. Uh, they have uh, higher risk of, uh, of intervention, but at the same time, they have a higher benefit from the operation, as it is shown in some studies. Uh, and then we even have a guideline that uh, advises to do it in, this, in such patients, but with a quite low level of evidence so far, only C. We have RCTs showing that we have to treat less patients to uh, prevent the same number of strokes if we do it very early. Then in the same issue, the same meta-analysis, actually just, this is just to picture how many patients actually were involved in this analysis, hundreds of thousand patients, uh, registry studies, and that all uh, uh, led us here that we have completely approved uh, uh, class one level A uh, uh, recommendation to do our operation within 14 days in symptomatic patients with high degree stenosis. So I could stop my uh, 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 reports here, but then I wouldn't tell anything about the cons and where are the cons. Or if I can rephrase it, if there are any patients who would uh, benefit from the delay of operation, uh, uh, in registries from uh, some uh, countries with a very organized health system, we can see there, although we have this shift towards earlier uh, operating, we also have around 30 to 35 percent of patients who are operated with a delay. And then in our guidelines says patients who are considered appropriate. So not all patients are supposed to be operated within 14 days. And then all of us who are operating, who are making our decision, know that decision is not that easy. It's easy when you have a very stable patient like this one at the left side or very unstable patient with a large stroke at the right side. But most of our patients are not there. They are somewhere in the middle, somewhere in between. And this line of distinction is not that uh, visible as it, this slide here. We, uh, our guideline tells us, but quite uh, arbitrary, that we should operate patients who are uh, with not in conscious impairment, with modified ranking score three or less, or with uh, less than one third of ACM territory. But it also advises some other thing to uh, team up with other colleagues from neurology, from uh, international radiology, uh, to see their perspective, probably to share the uh, the risk or to shield the, the, if something wrong goes on from the, from the bad choice, yes. So the last slide, actually, uh, when we are uh, having exact or actual patient in front of us, we are always somewhere between, with pros and cons, or somewhere between risk of recurrency and risk of procedure. So how can we estimate risk of recurrency? We have ABCD2 score, which is very uh, well spread, but not useful in, uh, it underestimates large vessel disease, and it uh, is not very useful for patients who are undergoing uh, vascularization. We have upgraded ABCD3I score, who is yet to be proven in the clinic practice. There's some papers showing that uh, uh, microemboli registration can be completely undependent predictor of uh, risk of stroke in patients with TIA, same as uh, plaque instability, so different features of plaque in instability. And if we have resource in time, we can do MRI, and then if we have DVI lesions in TIA patients, it might be also predictor. One thing that might be uh, uh, prospective changing actually is uh, how, uh, how the impact of initial medicamentous therapy in these patients. Actually, we have uh, studies uh, or RCTs, faster chance point tails from 2007 to 2021. And they uh, showed that uh, benefit from early distribution of dual antiplatelet therapy, 
early distribution of high dose statins, strict blood pressure and uh, glucose, blood glucose level. And with this, we can decrease the risk of stroke within two days from six or seven percent only to two percent. That might make us reconsider this very early carotid and arterectomy some patients. We can shift towards right side to postpone the operation until the patient gets stabilized. As well, sometimes we can find this, it's thrombus, intraarterial thrombus. Uh, I would operate it, this is actually for our, uh, for the, from the patient that was operated a couple of weeks ago at our clinic, like emergent patient. And sometimes uh, there is a consensus of expert that says don't operate it, give uh, uh, low molecular heparins, wait for five days, and if the patient is stable, in most of the time it will resolve. So we don't yet know how does medicament works. Okay, at the other side of this weighting between risks, we have procedural risk. Something is obvious actually, if we exclude uh, intracerebral hematoma, uh, uh, significant uh, tandem lesion, cerebral edema, or we have a patient with general risk, we wouldn't operate him, it would be over too risky. And then we have some other hints or, uh, that are rather arbitrary than obligatory. And it's uh, uh, MR, uh, modified ranking score less than three, uh, NIHA has a score less than seven, and sometimes we even do it with uh, 11, 13, 14, okay? Aspect score less than seven, one third of ACM or less. In our department, you usually use this one, diameter of lesion that's less than two centimeters, and not in deep gray matter, and lesion volume less than uh, 4,000 square or cubic meters. So thank you. That's all. Vlado, uh, thank you very much for this wonderful lecture. And uh, you just demonstrated that you are a head of a great, uh, a great hospital and great institution with a huge experience in this uh, in this pathology. Uh, actually, I wanted to more comment than ask a question uh, uh, regarding uh, your hyperacute, acute, and delayed uh, patients. Actually, when uh, you do a lot of these cases, which I'm sure you do, uh, then you realize that uh, we started also as, uh, uh, with the ambition to be hyperacute and to do as soon as possible to prevent neurologic uh, events, uh, but uh, we soon discovered that operating uh, on a patient with uh, one TIA or uh, uh, small stroke, minor stroke at 2 a.m. is not the best idea uh, for anyone, especially the patient. Uh, we also uh, noticed when we had uh, a lot of those patients that there are actually many patients in between. In between. It's all, uh, always uh, good to follow recommendations, but there are some uh, patients that not, do not fall into the guidelines and then you have to be very creative and to, to uh, see the things uh, a little bit outside the box. But I think the most important thing is the great collaboration that you have between the members of your team, uh, especially the neurologists and the interventional radiologists. We have that luck uh, here, so uh, we, are, we are trying. Uh, congratulations again for the great for the great presentation. Uh, does anyone else have questions for Dr. Manolovic? I just want to see. Uh, we don't have actually answer, or probably we wouldn't have it for a long time. Uh, one of the answers uh, could be that we are all talking about database collecting data. If we collect very good data and we push it through some kind of uh, either machine learning or neural network or some artificial intelligence uh, uh, algorithm, we might be able to get closer to this. Actually, we have a lot of different features that are having impact of, of our decision. It sometimes be done by the experience of three guys who are making a decision, but sometimes we can just ask for some higher mathematic uh, formulas to help us in that. So I think that first, uh, first step is to collect very high quality data, and then afterwards I think that will come up to the solution. Okay, thank you. Uh, does anyone from the audience have uh, any questions for Dr. Manolovic? No? I would like no. to ask one okay. quick question. You mentioned that the delay is good if there is intraarterial thrombus. Uh, how long you wait with uh, low molecular weight heparin? With intraarterial uh, thrombus. 
and we don't wait actually. That's the, that's the thing I showed, I found it in literature. There's uh, three uh, experts showing their cases, telling that it's possible to make this five days delay in case they have, uh, uh, for example, ulcer, ulcered plague with intraarterial thrombus. And it, sometimes it resolves, it, sometimes it has to be operated, sometimes we have uh, repeated neurological deficiency or uh, event that we have to operate immediately, like in, like in a stable patient. But that's just showing how difficult it is to make a decision. If you decide to do one thing, you might risk another. So pros and cons, it's, there is no an answer. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Thank you very much. So do we have Dr. De Borst online? No, unfortunately not. I was hoping to hear that lecture, but perhaps he, he will be here by the end of the session. All right, then. Uh, moving on, uh, carotid and coronary pathology, actual strategy. Uh, also on online uh, for Dr. Ionel uh, Drock from Romania. Uh, hello, greetings, Dr. Hello. Drock. Thank you for joining Thank us. You. You can I go hope ahead. you see me and you hear me. Yes? Perfectly. Yes. Uh, Mrs. President, dear colleagues, uh, thank you for uh, the organizers to have the possibility to present our experience in front of you. So I will uh, thank especially for uh, Professor Lazar Davidocic and Igor Konkar for their kind invitation. And sorry that I am not physically uh, in front of you, so only online. So my experience or our experience in a central military hospital in Bucharest about carotid and coronary pathology. Prevention of cerebrovascular events is the main goal of performing carotid revascularization before cabbage. Numerous studies reported the harmful impact of carotid artery stenosis on the risk of perioperative stroke after cabbage. Incidence of coexisting coronary and carotid artery disease is between 2 and 14%. And on the other hand, 8% of the patients undergoing cabbage have significant extracranial carotid artery stenosis. So perioperative stroke following cabbage is a problem of increasing concern. It has three causes, low flow phenomena on cardiopulmonary bypass, extracranial carotid stenosis, and atherosclerosis of the ascending aorta or the aortic arch. So it is responsible for 30, 50% of stroke associated with cabbage. And as a result, incidence of stroke death and myocardial infarction is 10-12% after stage or synchronous procedures, comparing with only 1-5% to when we do cabbage alone. So speaking about this carotid revascularization patient undergoing cabbage, at least no evidence-based data to support an optimal strategy. The combination of cabbage and endarterectomy should be avoided if possible. If we have two scenarios, stable angina plus carotid stenosis more than 70 perios, then we uh, perform stage interventions, carotid, then cardiac. And if we have in unstable angina and carotid stenosis more than 70%, we uh, do simultaneous procedures. So this kind of uh, uh, simultaneous pathology was uh, studied and we have um, clinical um, guidelines uh, first published in 2018, who has a chapter for this uh, concurrent coronary and carotid disease. And uh, from all these uh, recommendations, uh, we can uh, look a little bit. A stage or synchronous carotid intervention may be considered in coronary artery patients with bilateral asymptomatic, uh, asymptomatic 1799 carotid stenosis or high grade stenosis with contralateral occlusion. Uh, evidence to be level C. Also, the cardiologists and the European Association of Cardiothoracic Surgery have uh, sent um, their guidelines in 2018 with uh, the same recommendation. So, carotid revascularization with endarterectomy should be considered as first choice in patients with high-grade carotid stenosis. And if we look a little bit in perioperative strategies to reduce this, the incidence of strokes. Uh, in patients with uh, no recent, less than six months history of TR stroke, carotid ultrasound is considered to patients with more than 70 years of age, multivessel coronary disease, uh, peripheral arterial disease, or carotid breathe, class 2B, level B. 
So the European Society for Vascular Surgery Society guidelines uh, from this year, of April, uh, have uh, no different uh, indication in this kind of uh, pathology, simultaneous pathology, but this uh, schema I have uh, taken for, for you because it's very um, illustrative and uh, show us the stage or synchronous endarterectomy plus cabbage in uh, symptomatic patients with ipsilateral carotid stenosis, high-grade stenosis, class 2A level B, and in asymptomatic patients, the indication of synchronous or stage cabbage is when bilateral 1799 or uh, high grade on one side with contralateral occlusion, class 2B, level C. So as a conclusion, what options we have? We have stage approach, endarterectomy or stenting followed by cabbage. The reverse stage approach, cabbage followed by endarterectomy or stenting. Or Simultaneous under the same anesthesia, endarterectomy plus cabbage. Or simultaneous stenting cabbage on or off pump. Or cabbage alone, uh, ignoring the carotid status. So this is a demography of patients under, undergoing this kind of surgeries. So when you have uh, insufficiency, cardiac insufficiency of NIHA grade 3 or 4, or left main disease or urgent cabbage, uh, we have uh, simultaneous uh, endarterectomy plus cabbage. And if you look at the results uh, done by Naylor, if we have stage or synchronous, even we have uh, statistically the same results in these uh, two kind of interventions. We have low, uh, lower uh, incidence of all kind of events in reverse stage uh, or in synchronous off pump. The off-pump because we don't have the deleterious effects of extracorporeal circulation. So in uh, our series of one-year uh, operations uh, on 375 patients for isolated cabbage, we have 13.3 uh, combined carotid and coronary disease, 10% stage interventions, uh, first carotid and after that cabbage with a mean interval of 30.6 days and only 3.3% we have done simultaneous intervention. So triple vessel disease in 82%, uh, left main disease 16.7, and carotid was only lateral 87%, bilateral 8.3%, and contralateral occlusion in only 4% of cases. Here is the technique, the general anesthesia, carotid shunting, seeing the, the types of shunt, and vein patch, the final result of the endarterectomy. Number of pontages was 2.8 per patients. All patients received a left internal mammary on the LIID and the cardioplegia with St. Thomas II administrated anterogradally or retrogradally with a mean clamping time of 75 min minutes and extracorporeal circulation 95 minutes. This is the final result with the internal mammary artery on the LIID and a vein graft on the circumflex artery. So uh, if uh, we compare uh, as results a stage and combined, they have uh, statistically uh, the same uh, with no difference. So in conclusion, the presence of carotid disease in patients undergoing cabbage is an important marker of risk. These patients represent a particular high risk group for cardiovascular postoperative complications. Even stage or synchronous procedures have the same outcome statistically. We recommend to perform stage procedures whenever is possible. Thus, followed by cabbage is a new method which should be evaluated in time. So the optimal strategy should be decided by a multidisciplinary, uh, uh, multidisciplinary team that includes surgeons, cardiologists, neurologists, and interventions. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Very good presentation on this uh, controversial and very interesting topic. What do you think, do you screen uh, carotid arteries in base patients that are undergoing cabbage? Thank you for very, uh, your very interesting um, question, Merit. Uh, so uh, in all the times we screen it. But uh, now only, as the guideline told us, so only for uh, patients uh, with uh, an age of more than uh, 70 and uh, if they have uh, some uh, bruits on the carotids, 
or if they have a TAA. Uh, otherwise, we can uh, ignore the, the carotid uh, status. So, however, we work in, in conjunction with the cardiologist and usually when they have and suspect some valvular attempt, they look uh, always to the carotid. Thank you. Uh, thank you for this great presentation. It is a controversial topic uh, and so are the guidelines uh, regarding this topic. Uh, if I understood you well, you are trying to avoid simultaneous op operations uh, whenever you can. Is that right? Am I right? Yes, you are right. Because the results are, for instance, of morbid mortality for all cause, it's 10, 12 percent, as I, I showed you in this uh, simultaneous. And uh, when we do isolated uh, or staged, is uh, between uh, it's less seven or even five percent. So, uh, and if we do the carotids, for instance, after the coronaries, they are uh, at three percent. So uh, it's better to to do uh, to stage the, the the two types of interventions. I absolutely agree. Thank you very much. But uh, I would like to also ask uh, some of our distinguished members of the audience, such as Professor Ilyevsky, who is the chief of vascular surgery in Dedinje Hospital, another great cardiovascular center in Belgrade. Uh, what is their policy towards uh, these operations, especially simultaneous operations? We always, at the clinical center, we always try to avoid simultaneous, unless we absolutely have to when we have uh, one side occluded, the other sub-occluded, and that's when we go for simultaneous or both symptomatic. Well, we've invented the alternative procedures. So we perform CAS in the morning and uh, cabbage in the evening. Simple as that. And how do you deal with uh, antiplatelet therapy? Well, always the do same. you give the loading yeah. dose or? No, 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 no. We start just low molecular and then in the evening he gets everything and it goes just fine just fine okay that's another way to go what do you think i want i want to add this uh, this is a new uh, type of uh, treatment so to combine the stenting the stenting for the carotid and also the stenting for the coronary so in order to reduce risk but this kind of this problem of antiplatelet therapy this is a major problem so you can do in the morning and in the afternoon uh, the the one of the procedures. So if we do carotid in the morning and uh, triple uh, <clears throat> pontage in the afternoon or vice versa. So you do in the morning one or two stenting and after that the endarterectomy in the afternoon. But there are some uh, specific um, um, inhibitor of protein uh, J2, 3A and uh, you can give uh, and uh, to or who by heparin, by intravenous heparin and to keep the patient in the intensive care and goes to the second intervention. Thank you for this. But they are not studied. This is the new, the new concept in, in, in these days. Yes, well, we are groundbreaking here. Are there any more questions from the audience? Then I would like to thank you for the, your wonderful presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you also. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. All right, uh, I would like now to call Dr. Zolt uh, from Hungary. Uh, he will speak about why did we change to perform CA from general to local region. Zolt is not uh, present, he oh. couldn't come here, just apologize. Right. Thank you, thank you, Igor. All right, uh, uh, then the Dr. Mulokakis, I know he's here, I saw him earlier today, uh, carotid artery stent, acute thrombosis, incidence, outcome, and treatment. So good afternoon to everybody. Uh, my topic is that I'm going to present you the <clears throat> management of acute carotid and thrombosis. And I will start my presentation with a brief introduction. Uh, if we search in the literature, if we look inside the literature data, we'll see that there are no large trials or large uh, case series studies. There are only case reports, small case series, and we can conclude that this is an underreported event, a rare complication with an incidence between 0 and 0.8 percent according to the literature, and that early stent thrombosis can be subdivided into acute, less than 24 hours, and subacute, 1 to 30 days, according to a consortium from cardiologists. 
Now I'm going to present you my experience from our institutional data from two hospitals. Uh, I have been till 2019 in Atikon University Hospital, then I was removed in Patra University Hospital. Overall, 966 patients are there went cast during this study period, and a total of six, six cases of early acute carotid artery stent thrombosis were cured. So this is our data. You can see that six patients uh, manifested an acute carotid thrombosis. You can see regarding the time of thrombosis, the four patients were super acute. The two patients were, were in the third and the fourth postoperative day, post-interventional day. There were four, five masks and one femin. All patients were under uh, dual adiplatelet treatment, both before and after treatment. And you can see that regarding the cause of stent thrombosis, there was three cases with two overlapping stents. There were two cases with protruding plaque in the stent causing filling defects, and also there was a cases with a dissection from the filter due to significant coiling about 360 degrees. Now, regarding the treatment, you can see that two patients underwent the carotid arterectomy, early carotid arterectomy. In two cases, intrathrombus urokinase thrombolysis and thromboaspiration was applied, and in the two cases with a delayed thrombosis, after neurological consultation, we decided to treat them with medical therapy. So this is one case with an 80% symptomatic stenosis, standing of the left ICA under filter protection with the embosilt. In all patients, in all cases, we used uh, protection devices, the distal EPD of the ABOT, Two stents, exact 9-7 tapered, were applied due to inaccurate caudal deployment of the first stent. This happens sometimes. And you can see that two hours after the procedure, the patient manifested aphasia, right hemiparesis, and it has a filling defect at the level of the lica. Uh, a good message was that the intracranial vessel was uh, without any kind of thrombosis. You can see the medial and the anterior uh, artery. Uh, Intrathrombus urokinase administration was applied in combination with thromboaspiration, achieving complete recanalization, and the aphasia resolved. Residual parts of the right arm, however, remained. This is another case, as I showed you. This is one case in the initial stage of our carotid studying experience. This, this case was a case in which uh, the patient has undergone a myocardial infarct one month before and had COPD. Uh, we were forced a little bit to apply this technique, and you can see that there is a severe coiling of the ICA, and uh, unfortunately, one hour after the cast standing, the patient exhibited a left hemiparesis. This was attributed, as you can see here, to the local dissection provoked during the filter deployment, and emergent inversion directomy was performed, and... Uh, Hopefully, there was a neurological recovery. The patient was discharged with only a mild residual arm paresis. This is a third case of our experience, a 66 years old man. You see that he had a mild plaque in the ICA. Uh, a cast uneventful was performed. You can see in the third photo that there was an elastic recoil of the plaque. Uh, at this stage, we performed a post-dilation ballooning, and you can see here that after the balloon, unfortunately, there were filling defects in the upper and the proximal part of the stent. Uh, 30 minutes after the cast, the patient manifested the left hemiparesis. We performed an immediate CT, which showed the partial thrombosis of the stent. And then we proceeded with a carotid arterectomy and uh, with a relatively good outcome. The patient uh, was neurologically stable and he recovered 100%. Now, if we look in the literature, we'll see that there are no case series or large trials. There are only two comprehensive reviews, one which was published by our team in 2016 and another by Portugal in 2019. Now, if we look inside into this publication, we'll see that uh, regarding the causes about the quarter, the 23% is due to discontinuation of antiplatelet therapy, resistance to antiplatelet agents, or inherit or acquired thrombotic disorders. So this is due to, let's say, thrombotic disorders. Uh, a large proportion of uh, carotid standing thrombosis uh, was due to technical interprocedural parameters. I show you the dissection, uh, atheroma protrusion of the plaque, 
kinking of the distal part of the alternal carotid artery. The embolic protection device occlusion has occurred in some cases in the literature that can lead and result in early carotid stent thrombosis. Now, the placing of the two stents is also a new parameter that should be considered. That means that we reduce the luminal space of the vessel, and this pre may predispose to acute thrombosis. Now, if we look regarding the outcome of this disease, we'll see that there is a great heterogeneity among the reported papers with regard to the applied strategy. There is a gap and discrepancy existing between the successful recanalization of the occluded artery in the functional recovery, because the most important thing in this condition is the prompt revascularization, which remains the key to the successful outcome. As soon as earlier we achieve this revascularization, this is the better for the, for, for, for the, uh, for, the, for the patient, the, neuro the neurological status of the patients. You can see that in this analysis there were also two deaths. And regarding a drug therapy, the thrombolysis seems to be an effective treatment in patients in which uh, also an intracranial carotid branch thrombosis has occurred. There are literature data from the PROACT-2 study, the ICAROS, the ICAROS-3, and the MELT study, which also outpoints and underline the, uh, the role of thrombolysis in the early stage of uh, carotid stent thrombosis. Now, the mechanical thrombectomy or thromboaspiration, also there are some options that have been used with very good uh, results and with clinical improvement, neurological improvement of the patient. Uh, also is indicated in intracranial carotid branch thrombosis, while the antiplatelet therapy with low molecular heparins or the 2B3A drug medication is a doubtful uh, uh, treatment that has not gained so much space in the literature. Now, what about the surgical treatment? The emergency carotid arterectomy with removal of the thrombus remains the gold standard. However, it's indicated when the thrombus is localized inside the stent, in stent thrombosis with no distal extension. And regarding the superficial femoral artery to middle cerebral artery uh, or external to internal carotid bypass, this technique has been abandoned because in the last uh, trial in 2011, which was published in JAMA, it showed that there is uh, an hemorrhagic, uh, about 30% of, of, uh, of patient uh, manifested an hemorrhagic, uh, let's say, uh, events. So in conclusions, uh, the prompt revascularization of the carotid artery remains the key to the successful outcome and can also justify discrepancies between delayed successful recanalization of the thrombostent and functional recovery. Uh, the arteriographic evidence of an intracranial carotid branch thrombosis should be treated by thrombolysis initially. Mechanical thrombectomy in combination with drug or thrombolytic therapy has been used with encouraging results mainly when uh, intracranial branch th is thrombosed. And if carotid stent thrombosis with no distal extensions is documented post-procedurally, then the gold standard is the emergency early stent removal with carotid and arterectomy. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Excellent, excellent presentation. And uh, it's good that the incidence is very low because this is quite traumatic symptoms in the end. Uh, re regarding the reasons for acute uh, thrombosis, you mentioned a few, but I would like to ask uh, two issues. First, your stenosis were very tight stenosis. Do you think that has something to do with this complication? And the second question, is, they all had two antithrombotic medications after the uh, stenting. Did you uh, load, did uh, clopidogrel loading? So, thank you very much for your question. Uh, we, we, we found out that there were all types of stenosis, more than 80%, because in the majority of cases we have an elastic recoil, which leads us to do a post-interventional ballooning. So in two of the six cases, the post-interventional balloon resulted in embolic, uh, embolic events uh, to the middle cerebral artery. So in two cases, uh, there were two tight stenoses. In another three cases, as I shown, there were multi-plugs, plugs with the protrusion of the plug inside the stent. 
Although in these cases we have to say that even if we we use uh, open or closed cells uh, uh, stents, a carotid stenosis and thrombosis can occur also in the distal or in the proximal part of the stent. So uh, regarding your question, I would like to say that yes, there were tight stenosis. Uh, high stenosis, more than 70%, were all more than 80 to 90%. And regarding the post-thrombotic uh, medical therapy, uh, unfortunately, we didn't, fortunately for us, but uh, generally we didn't have any kind of events which were based the thrombosis of the stent on the medical therapy. As I showed you, where, uh, all the six cases were anatomical factors which contributed to the stent thrombosis, to the acute stent thrombosis. Now, uh, if you permit me, uh, there are some cases in the literature, but occur in the subacute or the chronic phase. So the stent thrombosis that occur after the seventh day of post-interventionally, these are the cases that maybe they're treated not with a dual adipletal therapy or with the appropriate therapy if they have resistance to aspirin. Yeah. Uh, uh, congratulations on a great, great lecture and uh, showing your results. Uh, those lectures that we uh, show our complications are always uh, a place to learn uh, instead of those where we're showing great results. I actually have one technical question. We also found out that uh, it's very possible and not too difficult to do eversion and arthrectomy when the stent thrombosis in, in, in the place. Uh, do you cut off the internal, the origin of the internal carotid or transect the common carotid just below the bifurcation when you, when you convert those? those I think cases? that, uh, yes. I, I would like to say that uh, the results of this study has also influenced our policy and uh, we are very cautious about how we apply this technique in uh, the majority of cases. Now, regarding your question, I would like to say that uh, we, we prepare the carotid artery so dist distally and proximately in a higher level from the thrombus. Normally, there is a discoloration at the level of the stent, at the tip of the stent, and you can see the thrombus inside, which is blurish a little bit, and so you can see also the healthy, let's say, wall of the aortic, of the, uh, excuse me, of the carotid. So uh, the first we have to do is to prepare the carotid at the proximal and distal level with a no-touch technique without preparing the carotid bifurcation in order not to dislocate some kind of thrombus during the preparation. Uh, then, as you said, uh, in the case we performed the carotid, the inversion and arterectomy, uh, after having clamped, then we cut the ICA. We cut the ICA in my department near the carotid bifurcation and then we proceed with the classic uh, procedure. Uh, one uh, technical tip that I would like to underline that was happened on one case is that if we find the local thrombus in the second case, if we find local thrombus in the stent, we can use locally, very, very cautiously, a Fogarty catheter in order to withdraw the thrombus but we would not advance at the level of the carotid intracranial vessels. You understand, just two centimeters, just to pull down and withdraw the thrombus. So we must be very, very cautious. Thank you very much. Do you have I a question, have a Professor question. Petro? Uh, congratulations for this perfect presentation. I think, uh, and I'm afraid that it will be more and more interesting uh, such cases because tenting leads uh, more often to such complication, unfortunately. But I have a question about uh, this uh, thrombolysis. How did you choose to make thrombolysis? Aren't you afraid after making thrombolysis, if it is not effective, that it uh, confines you to surgery? Uh, <clears throat> the criterion to choose the thrombolysis in the intracranial branch uh, thrombosis. So, uh, we, we have to do something with the brain because brain is time and we have to give a solution. So I think that the only solution that you have is the thromboaspiration or the thrombolysis of the branch vessel. Uh, regarding now if the thrombolysis could be avoided, uh, I could tell you that if the, if the stand is 
local thrombosis without any evidence of branch vessel intracranial branch thrombosis, then in these cases, this is the case in which we can go directly to the operating room, take out the stent, and then proceed with an early endarterectomy. But if you have an intracranial branch thrombosis, then you have to deal that you have to do something more from just taking out the stent. Thank you. Thank you, too. Any questions from the audience? All right. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, too. Thank you. So, uh, moving on, I have the great pleasure to uh, ask my dear colleague and professor, Professor Lievsky from the Dedinje Cardiovascular Institute, to give his famous, now already famous lecture of post conditioning carotid surgery. First in human, please, Professor, take the floor. Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, and now something completely different. <laughs> I come from an institution that has performed so far 20,000 carotid and atrectomies, thanking to this gentleman, Professor George Radak, the member of the Serbian Academy of Sciences, who realized that's a sort of philosophy, not a sort of surgery, who realized the importance of carotid surgery. And even today, I would say that in contemporary vascular surgery, there are no more controversies than in carotid surgery. In other fields, I would immodestly say things are more or less clear, but in carotid surgery, you never know. So when you come to a number of performing 1,000 carotids per year, you have reached the peak of your learning curve, and then you reduce total neurological mortality in less than 1%. And in the first spot, you say, well, that's great. But however, although there was continuous decrease on neurological morbidity and total morbidity, Still, it comes if you perform 1,000 per year, you have 10 deaths and you have 30 cerebrovascular accidents. So you start thinking about that. Where did the idea for the whole story came from? The most dreadful complication, of course, is neurological deficit after doing either carotid or terectomy of stenting. And the prevention should be short clamping time, doing the operation under regional anesthesia, intraoperative monitoring, different kinds, and you can see them numbered down there, and intraluminal shunt placement. But none of those procedures gives you 100% certainty that it's going to be fine. And where did the idea came from? If a patient wakes up with a neurological deficit, despite very low complication rate that we had, we have adopted the rule to explore each patient immediately on the, in the operation theater on the, on the operating table. And to our consternation, in vast majority of cases, we found nothing. Just very correct reconstruction. And we said, OK, that's probably embolization. Less embolization, more embolization. And after a while, in two or three days, CT scan was positive for new ischemia, and then you need serendipity, and you must have some faith. I'm not going to pay any credit to myself. I was just at, sitting at my laptop and going, doing something else. And suddenly, this paper popped up. So this is a work from Chinese authors who did ischemic post-conditioning in experimental conditions, saying they were not releasing the flow in, after reconstruction of carotid arteries. They did six times sequential clamping, 30 seconds. They would release the carotid artery, and then they would clamp it for 30 seconds. And they are going to do it for six times. That was the procedure. Suddenly, it came up to me, and I said, well, why not perform that in our cohort of patients? In which patients? So from December 2015 15, till December 2020, our post-conditioning group included 148 patients. In January next year, it's going to be four years. So far, it's 197. So till a total of four years, it's going to be over 200 patients in the post-conditioning group with the same results. 
On the other hand, non-post-conditioning control group included 152 patients. All patients were, cho were chosen from the same database with the same inclusion criteria. High perioperative risks for CVI, TIA, or hyperperfusion syndrome. So, severe unilateral stenosis over 90%, severe bilateral stenosis over 80%, Severe stenosis with occlusion or near occlusion of the contralateral internal carotid artery, saying the most complicated carotid artery disease patient. Patients. As far as demographics is concerned, the only main difference was that family history of uh, cerebrovascular disease was, mass, was more prominent in, the, in our uh, patients group. Duplex characteristics. So, highly statistically significant p-value for heterogeneous and ulcer ulcerated plaques in the, our post-conditioning group. Operative data and post-operative complications. Clamping time, of course, because you are doing a blasphemy. You are prolonging your clamping time. Was nearly statistically significant in our patients' group. That's the only difference. And finally, primary and other clinical outcomes. Highly statistically significant absence of postoperative stroke in the heterogeneous plaque group or in the ulcerated plaque group. Potential advantage of our technique to be published in a few days in the Journal of Cardiovascular Pharmacology and Therapeutics 2022. This is the first worldwide study of the kind. Nobody has ever in the world done something like this. Neither mortality nor neurological morbidity was found. Zero. No deaths, no neurological events. We tried that with our friends in, in Banja Luka. They did about 50 patients with equally same results. No deaths, no neurological events. It showed significant superiority in patients with ulcerative plaques. If this all was true, clamping time becomes absolutely irrelevant. As you can see in our series, clamping time was almost statistically significantly longer in our group than in the control group. And you can, what does it mean? Well, you can practice most complicated ca cases without any rush. If this is true, intraoperative monitoring and regional anesthesia and all kinds of perioperative monitoring becomes unnecessary. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Extremely interesting, and I'm sure that audience has a lot of questions. My question is, how, how you perform it? I mean, uh, it's very, very simple. So you perform normal version carotid endotherectomy. You release the clamp. After 30 seconds, you clamp again. You, you do it again six times, as Chinese have done, always in the same manner. And you clamp the, you release the clamps, and then you clamp the internal. Exactly, yes. Uh, yeah. This we have to try. <laughs> I've learned. I, I, I'm proud. I'm proud to say that I'm, I, I come as a student from Professor Kimo Kiosola, so <laughs> Helsinki Good. University yeah. Central, 1985. Uh, thank you, Professor, for your for your fine presentation and congratulations on your great results. Uh, are there any questions from the audience? So I would like to have one question. Uh, because we are all taught by our teachers that carotid clamping is uh, one of the most important things uh, uh, in carotid surgery and in prevention of perioperative stroke, but uh, things uh, seem to be changing in carotid uh, surgery. Uh, some other things are, do, do you think that clamping time is not so important, or you, do you think that your technique of post-ischemic uh, post-conditioning is actually uh, compensating for the, for the duration of carotid clamp? Mm, perfect question. Thank you for that. In my opinion, and I think that precise surgical technique in carotid surgery is most important. 
If you don't use shunt, and we don't use shunt, I'm not sure even if we have one in our ORs in the Dini Institute, uh, you need time. If you have time, you're going to do it perfectly, technically perfectly. Then you don't have a problem. The whole idea came after we saw that there was nothing, you do 20,000 procedures, so you are very good. Our clamping time was from nine to 12 minutes. When we did 15 minutes clamping, there was, what's wrong with you today? You didn't eat this morning or what's, the, what's happened? So you should be done that in, in 12 minutes, what happened? It seems that really, and I really believe it, clamping time is less important com compared to technical proficiency in the work. And this is something that I, I have no answer for that. This is completely, the, the, the window was open and something came through the, through the window. This is not my idea. I just went through this paper and it came to me because we kept opening patients. Okay, it's small number of patients, 20 per year, but when you perform 1,000, you have that kind of experience, you see that something is wrong. You don't know what's wrong. But then this came, and I started this uh, quite illegally. You know, it was, oh my God, what am I going to do? I was so nervous about that. And now we have four years, we have two, 200 patients, we have a publication. We tried, uh, we tried with, with European Journal of Vascular Endovascular Surgery, they asked us, are you crazy? And found, 20 reasons per uh, editor to, to, to tell us what's wrong. And then I said, oh my God, what am I doing? But this is now four years, it's 200 patients, it's zero, believe me. It's zero. I, I don't have the answer, but it's zero. It's, it's for, some, for some other level of investigation. I don't know, but it's working. Seems Thank you. silly, but it's working. Thank you very much. It's also very important for, for an institution and the country and the medical system that its best representatives and more exp most experienced are all very open-minded to new techniques. Exactly. So we are very lucky. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor. So I would like now to call uh, Dr. Zora Rancic from Zurich, Switzerland. Uh, to tell us something about the role of vortex technique in carotid revascularization. Yeah, dear chairman, dear colleagues, good afternoon. I'm always happy that I'm here. And um, I don't have anything to disclose to this talk. What I'm going to tell you, I will tell you something about the vortex and the suture telescopic anastomotic technique. I will try to describe the technique, give some case give results and uh, conclude. The first paper of Wartek was published in 2007 and uh, it was included the patient from 2005 to 2008 and uh, exactly Wartek means viable and open reverse colorization technique and that was came because it was a challenging case. It was uh, to treat the patient with difficult access and scar tissue. And then Mario Lascia in this uh, note decided to make something like this. What uh, exactly was done? That was the puncture of the artery. Then uh, through the um, hole, through the needle is going the wire. Over the wire is going the sheet. Through the sheet is inserted and deployed the stand graph, Viaban, Vortec, Viaban. And then thereafter is that inflated. So that means with three, five steps, we made a distal anastomosis of um, target artery. In this uh, uh, schematic presentation is the left um, renal artery. And then the distal end of the vortex of the viaban was um, sutured to end to side to the native artery and to end it to the inflow graft, went to side to the inflow, uh, to the, um, to the inflow graft. That means just to make the proximal anastomosis. Post-operatively, all the patients got their ultrasound, and the post-operatively, all the patients have one, three, six months, and yearly thereafter, CT scan. Then in 2008, we wanted to reduce this ischemic time, so what we made, at first we made some uh, proximal anastomosis of the graft, and you can see here inflow graft, 
and then we make a small hole in the inflow graft and then the, again do the same. To this small hole, this behind these fingers, it's inserting the wire and through the puncture of the artery is inserting the wire. Then uh, or through the sheet and through the inflow graft in inserting the viaband and half of the viaband is inside the target artery, half of the viaband the, is an inflow graft. Then we are deploying uh, the viaband, just pulling the threads, and thereafter we balloon the viaband. In that case, we made a, a distal anastomosis and this sutural telescoping anastomotic technique. This is, we have to fix the uh, inflow graft viaband to the native artery to prevent eventual slip out. And this is something what is in the model. So you see this is the aortic arch, this is the carotid artery. This is what I told you, the hole where it's going the sheet wire, then through the sheet is going the viaban. Viaban is now partially within the carotid artery, partially in the inflow graft, PTFE graft. It is deploying. Then we have to fix it with the forceps not to prevent not slipping out and then inflating the balloon. We have it uh, fixed and uh, thereafter fixing again. We are uh, fixing the graft, the viaban to the artery, removing. And this is now the time when we have ischemic time before we close the artery. There is some uh, principles how you have to use this. That means, for example, for the artery, 4.8 millimeters to 5.5 millimeter. This is recommendation for a gore. So six millimeter viaband uh, deployed in the fifth, uh, five millimeter interposition grafts. What is interesting, what we are using that, for example, in this case with uh, open surgery, where um, for supraortic debranching in patient who has uh, Dissection. You see the true lumen, you see the false lumen to suture that it's not easy at all. It is difficult then to the, with the wire within the true lumen inserting the viaban who pass through the inter, um, intermedium graft and then deploying the viaban within the artery. Again, with the forceps, you have to fix it not to slip out. And in the end, you see two sutures to prevent uh, going um, uh, out. This is used, in the, for example, in case of uh, ascending aorta aneurysm, we're trapping, and then make the, uh, this is what is the point, make first proximal anastomosis, and then through this proximal anastomosis, when it's done, we are going to make a distal anastomosis with this vertigo suture telescoping technique. And in this time, in this situation, we reduce the ischemic time of only to one minute. And this is for the carotid arteries, very important, the clamping time, opposite to what uh, Professor Ilyevsky said, that we don't have to take care of the uh, clamping time. Uh, in total, 2008-2018, 55 patients, um, aortic arch aneurysm 36, subclavian 3, dissection 10 patients, and in total 127 patients with Vortec. Right common carotid artery is 40 patient, left common carotid artery is 51 patient. And what is interesting, uh, immediate technical results were very good. That means we didn't have slip out in these cases. We had some problems in the renovisceral arteries, but here in the supraortic, no. We didn't have early graft occlusion. Late graft occlusion in two patients. One patient was a patient with Takayasu, and we realized that on the CT scan, and the second one was uh, is a degenerate aneurysm, but we did not realize the, um, it, the, it was also asymptomatic. Perioperative mortality, four. Due to bleeding, dissection, multi-organ dysfunction, cerebral bleeding. Um, interesting late complication, graft infection, descending dissection, descending arterial dissection, and neurology complication, transient and permanent, in total five neurology complications. We did a one study before when we combine open surgery and uh, this technique can realize that the, the complications are up to 15%. So that means this, we have a reduction of the complication. And in the long term period, uh, January 2021, it's shown that the survival is above 85% of this patient. So to conclude, Technique, sutureless telescopic anastomotic technique to reduce the invasiveness of aortic surgery because there is reduced ischemia time no clamping or circumferential dissection, and it's uh, bleeding, it's under control. Alone's performing anastomosis when the suture is difficult, like in dissection in the intramural hematoma, 
and midterm results confirm that it is um, durable. So happy to answer on your question. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. I agree this is a very good technique. We have tried it and it's very convenient and as you say, rapid to perform. Uh, you mentioned that there were four patients with surgery mortality uh, and the reasons why they died. They were not all related to the technique itself. No, 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 no one. It's interesting. This is why, we, why I... Uh, again, uh, want to show the results with this long-term technique. We didn't have any related mortality related to the technique. It's, it, it is written. We had uh, once when um, retrograde dissection during the deploying the stand graft, another patient uh, due to infection, but we didn't have any uh, mortality due to, due to this technique. And what is interesting, for example, in the begin, uh, this is um, uh, in the, this initial vortex technique, we were not aware how to fix the via bandwidth in the artery and we are not taking with the forceps viaban to fix that. And that means sometimes, not sometimes, but one, two times where we are opening the viaban, we are also removing the viaban for the artery. That was disaster. So that means this is why I mentioned two, three times we have to fix with the forceps the viaban artery and then start to deploy it, it easy. And when we deploy it easy, then it's um, doing fine. And uh, we also have remarks from the cardiac surgeon, they're always saying, yeah, but someone does not know how to make the anastomosis, they are doing Vortec, but it's not about this, it's about the scar, it is about the non-accessible um, uh, vessels, and it's interesting with this time, uh, also cardiac surgeons are calling us in the cases where they are desperate how to make anastomosis, and they have a problem with anastomosis on the tear of the anastomosis to put a vibe, and especially in the cases of uh, dissection. So, technique is useful. Yeah, I agree. Any uh, questions from the audience? Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. <coughs> and Associate Professor Nicole, uh, one question. Can it be done with uh, another kind of uh, stent graft? Yeah, we are doing that, thank you. It is uh, Viaban or Hemaban, that, mean, that means we are not using a uh, different one. We did one was with fluency, but uh, we did not feel confident. So that means, uh, because the Viaban has some, uh, it's easy to deploy. Viaban is very flexible. Viaban can be in a different uh, length. This is 5, 10, 15 centimeters, here the different diameters. Five, uh, six, seven, eight. So it's uh, really easy to use, and um, that's why we are choosing. Then it also is heparin bonded inside. So for this indication and for this initial technique, since the first reports, we are using either Viaban or Hemaban. So that means uh, this graft. Uh, do you think it will be possible with a balloon expandable stand graft? Theoretically, yes. But you know what we are doing? We are putting a Viaban and we are always inflating the viaban with a PTA balloon. So that means uh, maybe it will work, but you have to have everything under control. You have to be safe. That means we are just puncturing the artery. We are going with the wire. Then we are going with the viaban, and then we deploy the viaban, and then going with the balloon, and we are inflating that inflate. partially in the artery, partially in the intermediate uh, graph. So that means Theoretically, yes, but I will suggest if you try to do this, this is something that we learned how to do, and we are doing that, and I think the best way is to do it in that way, but you can try. Okay, thank you. Thank you. We have one, thank you. Uh, we have one talk, very interesting talk, before we go to uh, coffee break. Thank you, Zoran. Thank, thank you, Zoran. Thanks for the great lecture. And the next speaker is Associate Professor Nikola from the National Heart Hospital in Sofia, Bulgaria. He will share his own experience in hybrid carotid interventions. Dear moderators, dear colleagues, good afternoon. I want to talk something about um, 
hybrid carotid interventions and our experience in, in that field. I have not, nothing to disclose about this presentation. So the TCAR, the transcarotid artery revascularization, it is an old procedure, came up uh, 1998 uh, from Parodi in Argentina, the full reversal system. Then in 2004, Chad King Criado created a commercially available product and root transcarotid uh, neuroprotective system by Seal Croak Medical in California. And uh, now in uh, USA, this is the second uh, uh, most used procedure after open surgery for carotid disease. And uh, this is um, the, the, logic about, uh, the logic about this procedure is you have two sheets, op two opposite sheets, one into the common carotid artery and one into the jugular vein. So you can uh, uh, f make the flow reversal when you clamp the common carotid artery. And uh, this is uh, the situation in Buenos Aires in the, uh, that year. White car, we have uh, several, uh, several, um, uh, we can, uh, we have three major advances, uh, advantages of this technique. The first one is uh, the dynamic flow reversal. As you can see, when we use the dynamic flow reversal uh, uh, versus distal embolic protection, we have uh, a very uh, little percentage of stroke, uh, statistically significant. The second major advantage is that you don't mess up with the aortic arch. And the third advantage is uh, with hybrid technique, you can treat both waves. Uh, both the uh, first the carotid bifurcation and the origin of the common carotid or uh, the origin of the brachiocephalic trunk. Uh, there are some considerations that may increase difficulty. There are three absolute, uh, absolute uh, contraindications, heavily calcified carotid lesions at the access site, lesions uh, within five centimeters of the cavical, common carotid uh, artery diameter less than six millimeters, and uh, three not so absolute, tracheostoma, neck irradiation, hostile neck, due to obesity, mobility, or kyphosis. I just want to show you this uh, good uh, and big meta-analysis uh, about um, open surgery and carotid artery stating, uh, stenting. As you can see, seven randomized control trials about asymptomatic. Uh, carotid stenosis, so we have no, almost no difference in uh, terms of outcomes uh, between surgery and uh, transfemoral cast. Then why should we use the TCAR procedure? And uh, the first, the first evidences came up 2019 by Mavas. As you can see, very small number of TCAR procedures, more than 600, but. Uh, at that time, they came up with, uh, uh, with this evidence that the, we have uh, twice the risk after transfemoral cast than, uh, uh, than the patients who, uh, in whom you were using the TCAR procedures. The next year, we have m more patients. The next meta-analysis, as you can see, 4,000 patients now, stroke rate 1.3, and uh, when they compare TCAR with uh, transfemoral cast, uh, we have again double the uh, risk of uh, neurological events, but no difference with the open surgery. Uh, what about um, the age? They, uh, this is another good study by the Kuraridi in 2020, and as you can see, no, no difference with the open surgery, but in patients more than eight years uh, uh, old, uh, octogenarians, we have 72% uh, re uh, reduction in stro stroke risk when using TCAR. What about the restenosis after prior carotid intervention? This is a uh, good article in stroke. Again, clear advantage for the hybrid surgery uh, against the transfemoral carotid standing, but also against the uh, redo open surgery. What about uh, the radiation-induced uh, carotid lesions? Again, as you can see, uh, most of the evidences came from uh, USA because uh, they use this technique very much. And uh, again, uh, you can see the clear advantage of the TCAR procedure over open surgery and transfemoral carotid artery stenting. 
Uh, another paper by, uh, by Mawas in uh, JAX, as you can see the, here we, uh, with patients with uh, contralateral carotid artery occlusion. Again, um, good results for the TCAR procedure against both carotid uh, endarterectomy and transfemoral carotid artery stenting. So if CAR is so good, what are you doing? Uh, what uh, shall we do in acute setting? A very good paper, the colleague uh, several presentations ago show it again, the timing from this year, the timing of uh, carotid interventions in symptomatic uh, carotid artery stenosis. So, uh, the authors uh, said that uh, open surgery is probably safer than carotid artery stenting, uh, stenting when performed uh, both within two and seven days of symptom onset. But almost all of the procedures uh, for uh, carotid artery stenting is uh, transfemoral. Registry, uh, registries uh, suggest that the TCAR is comparable to open surgery for symptomatic patients. But truth is we do not have even a single randomized controlled trial, only registries. Fortunately, from this year, uh, in the uh, Vasco annual meeting in Boston, uh, we have the first uh, publication about TCAR in acute setting, and as you can see, uh, they are not there yet. The open surgery is still best for, the, for, the, uh, for uh, treating patients in acute setting. And I will show you some of my cases. This is a case after CIA one year ago. As you can see, a very tight stenosis at the internal carotid. Unfortunately, the patient, when they made the operation, they lose the external carotid. So carotid stenting here is a little bit tricky. I don't do that. But with the trans, with the TCAR procedure, you can easily clamp, put the stent, post dilatation, and this is the final result. Another, another good case, this is uh, anatomical variation. As you can see, a uh, diverticle of comeral and uh, common, uh, common origin of both carotid arteries, very high bifurcations, very, uh, very tight stenosis. In the left, this is the symptomatic uh, one. So this is the, oops. Uh, this is the, the, the patient, as you can see, the two stents, we treated uh, one after another, first the left, then the right stent, and uh, this is in the left, after stenting, this is in the right, after the stenting, no problem with the TCAR procedure, short clamping time. This is um, another case when I told you that you can use it in both uh, ways. This is a patient, female patient. Uh, somebody decided to put a uh, self-expanding stent to treat uh, tight stenosis of the origin of the common carotid artery. Unfortunately, with no success. So we did a hybrid, a small incision, a puncture of the external carotid artery. And this is the situation when we took the picture. We put a short, we put a short uh, balloon expandable stand, dynamic renal, in this case, seven, seven uh, by 19. And uh, this is uh, the, final, the final situation, the resolutions of the symptoms. Uh, this is our experience with uh, carotid uh, interventions as for one year. This is 2020. As you can see, most of the patients we treat with open surgery, but we have uh, also doing um, uh, carotid stenting, maybe fifth to one the, the ratio. Uh, and uh, look how uh, the small numbers of the TCAR, only 10 procedures, 11 procedures, excuse me, uh, with TCAR procedure. Uh, when to use the TCAR? TCAR is, a, is not the panacea for this, uh, but uh, it is a valuable supplement for the methods of carotid inter uh, revascularization. It has some limitations, but also have numerous benefits. When to use, uh, the usually difficult aortic arch, symptomatic carotid plaques with high embolization risk, rest stenosis, hostile neck, and high risk for transfemoral cas. Also elongation, kinking of distal internal carotid, no good landing zone for the distal protection, so, this is a contraindication for transfemoral cast, high surgical risk patients, 
internal carotid artery, knee occlusion, etc., etc. Nowadays, we are lucky to have the, these three different procedures, proven in time, durable, and safe to treat carotid bifurcation stenosis. Uh, our main goal now is to uh, find the right procedure for the right patient. So, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Associate Professor. I think that this technique will rapidly gain uh, more and more interest in our colleagues. So it, it uh, proves to be very easy and very uh, quickly recovering patient the next day or the, after the two days you can uh, discharge the patient from the uh, hospital. And this is very good uh, technique also. In Any? selected cases. Okay. Any questions? Yeah, thank you for the great presentation. I agree that there is this is very innovative technique, and I also understand why there are less complications compared to transfemoral uh, stenting. But one uh, one um, issue is that it's quite expensive, isn't it? Absolutely, very expensive. And maybe this is um, the reason for this boom in USA because I think it's commercially driven there. But uh, the idea is good. The idea is good. And you can do it without this commercially available product. To find the right procedure for each patient, right? Absolutely. <laughs> Any questions from the audience? Thank you very much for your Thank fine you. presentation. Uh, So I would like to thank my uh, co-moderators. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I would especially like to thank the lecturers and the audience. Uh, thank you very much. And I think this was a fine session. And I'd like to close this session. Thank you. Now I think it's working. OK. Good afternoon and good evening maybe to everybody. It was a really challenging and exciting morning and afternoon and I think we will finish this in, uh, in the same way. So thank you to be with us in this afternoon. We have to cover another area. This is peripheral arterial disease and we have some eminent speakers. So we'll start with the first. And um, uh, of course, who better than the Dr. Professor Veniermo? And she will talk about when we need to respect Angio's own concept, please. Thank you so much. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. Thank you, Igor, for arranging a really good uh, happening. So I will talk to you about Angio's own concept and uh, how I can. Uh, no, no discourse related to this talk. So the food can be divided into six angiosomes originating from the three main crural arteries. I think we all know this. And according to angiosome concept, it's beneficial to revascularize the crural arteries leads to the uh, wound area. And in Helsinki, we have done three retrospective studies on this issue. Actually. When we started, I was very skeptical. I thought that actually there was nothing in this concept. Uh, but I, I had to a little bit change my mind. In these retrospective studies, there were uh, a little bit over 1,000 patients. And the main conclusion for this were that we actually compared the angiosome targeted versus non-targeted in bypass surgery and in uh, endovascular treatment. And uh, in the first study, we had a wound healing at 12 months, 60%. And the uh, variables that were related to wound healing were direct revascularization, CRP, and bypass surgery. And wound healing signif was significantly better after angiosome targeted revascularization, being the best after angiosome targeted bypass and the worst after non targeted endovascular revascularization. Uh, here you can see leg salvage, and there was actually no significant difference uh, in leg salvage between patients who underwent bypass targeted or non-targeted or targeted PTA. 
However, patients who are non-targeted endovascular revascularization had uh, the poorest leg salvage. Then we have this ICT-FI uh, machine in Helsinki, and we have measured patients who have CLTI uh, and uh, tissue lesion. And in uh, ICT-FIU inject undesigning green fluorescence, uh, in designing green intravenously, and then you record the food with infrared camera for a couple of minutes, and you can see how the fluorescence uh, comes to the food. And here we can see before and after a uh, distal bypass for patients with a wound. And then we measure the maximum uh, intensity after uh, the injection of. Uh, ICG. And we measured 104 legs with CLTI and tissue leads, and they had all 554. And before and after revascularization, and we had 72 endovascular treatments and 32 bypass patients. And when we took a look to the regions that where the wound healed and the regions where the wound didn't heal, we saw that actually the increase in maximum intensity in ICT was significantly less in the regions where the wound didn't heal. And uh, the, uh, during the 16 months period, 79% of the wounds healed. And 19 uh, unit increase in ICT predictive overload wound healing, 30 unit increase predictive wound healing in six months, and 35 unit increase predictive wound healing in four months. Uh, then we divided all the imaging to the angiosomes and, and uh, measured perfusion chains in directly and non-directly revascularized angiosomes. We had all together 288 angiosomes analyzed. And here we can see uh, the increase in perfusion measured in ICGF by in after bypass and PTA. And in the angiosomes that were revascularized directly, perfusion increased significantly after both bypass surgery and endovascular treatment, and the increase was higher after bypass. In the angiosomes that were revascularized through collaterals, the increase was also significant. Again, the increase was higher after bypass than after endovascular treatment. And in the angiosomes that were not directly vascularized and they were poor collaterals, the increase in perfusion was significant after bypass, but not significant after endovascular treatment. And if we think the uh, prediction of wound healing, it was 19 unit that predicted the wound healing in the overall series. We had 67% of the regions they did not reach this uh, level in non-targeted endovascular revascularization. So the conclusions are the mean increase in perfusion is higher after bypass compared to endovascular treatment. Non-targeted bypass lead more often to sufficient increase in perfusion than non-targeted endovascular treatment. And when does angiosome concept matter? when you are doing endovascular revascularization. And here you can see the variables that are associated with poor leg like salvage after revascularization. Diabetes, end stage renal disease, large wound, dementia, infection, poor patency, insufficient revascularization, and delay. And these two last I mentioned are related to non angiosome targeted endovascular revascularization. So you should choose your target arterial pathway according to the wound angiosome, especially if you are doing endovascular revascularization and there are no strong collaterals to the wound area. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this excellent presentation. Now, maybe a question. Um, when we have an ulcer, it's quite straightforward which angiosome to target. But what do you think in a patient without ulcer, is 
this concept of, and we have more options, do in your practice have uh, any strategy, strategy how to deal with the angiosome that will fit the best the results? Uh, I don't know if I understood correct the question. So you are talking about patients who have no tissue lesion, yes. but yes. who have uh, uh, rest pain. Yes. And should we select uh, some specific artery in that case? Well, uh, I think that patients who have rest pain, they, of course, they have a significant atherosclerosis. Uh, I don't have answer if there is any matter which uh, tar you target in order to increase the perfusion to the foot. I, I, have, I have no answer to that because I have not studied this area. But maybe we should take a look also to rest pain patients. Thank you. Uh, so, Marit, congratulations for the presentation. This was an excellent presentation. Uh, I think that the main point of your presentation is that the bypass has better results con compared to the endovascular procedure either for the direct or the indirect uh, uh, correlation with the angiosome concept. Now, uh, if, if I could perform and make a scenario, if there is a high-risk patient which is uh, unfit for open repair and the only available option is the endovascular uh, repair, endovascular procedure, if the angiosome concept is not applied to this patient, would you apply the endovascular procedure? Yeah, that's a and great how question. How would you treat this patient? Yeah, uh, first of all, we have a lot of patients that do not have option for open surgery for various reasons. Maybe the uh, biggest reason is that they are fragile, they are old, or they don't have vein. Uh, and they have wound, and we have to think what to do. Of course, if I don't have possibility to do angiosome targeted revascularization, I do not target it. But uh, in our very first study where we uh, studied the feasibility of uh, angiosome concept and we checked uh, 300 patients who underwent only endovascular revascularization in our unit in one year, infrapopolital, 80% of the patients had an opportunity to achieve angiosome targeted revascularization. So it's immaturity of the patients you can do it. Of course, the second question is that if there is a really good, uh, very good uh, option for endovascular treatment in non angiosome targeted vessel, and the targeted one is awful and there is a huge occlusion, and should you really choose the the one that goes to the... Yeah, I think that it depends on the end collaterals, and you can always do both. You mentioned that uh, before surgery, you always uh, control and you check the collateral ability of the vessels. Uh, have you seen, however, in the long term, if the endovascular procedure is patent, the rate of collateral ability as a subsequent of the endovascular procedure? So if there are new collaterals developed even after two, three months after the initial EVA procedure, initial endovascular procedure, sorry. Yeah, that's an interesting question. Uh, I know that when you do toe pressure, for example, <coughs> after a crural artery PTA, it, it, it usually is not so much increased. And then you think, well, is the wound healing or is it not healing? Because toe pressure was before 28 and now it's 31. And then uh, I have not studied this and I have not, don't know if anybody has, please raise your hand if somebody has, that it increases more, I mean, slowly than after bypass surgery. I have seen one study where they measured uh, TCPO2 after endovascular revascularization, and they actually showed quite nicely that it quite slowly increased. Maybe this due to the collaterals, I don't know. Uh, I have not seen after bypass surgery that 
the collaterals really increase because we do like 140 PTAs to bypass crafts annually and we check of course the collaterals. But maybe this is something that we could investigate because we have a lot of uh, angiograms on these bypass surgeries. Okay, are there any questions from the audience? Is someone that uh, want to comment on the presentation? Vladimir, do you have any comments? Uh, uh, I understood not all your patients were diabetics. No. No. Uh, can you tell us if there are any other conditions that uh, are as well important when you decide to respect angiosum or not to respect? For example, in diabetic patients, maybe it's more important to respect angiosum or it's just a PTA, go for angiosum, open surgery, go to the best artery that, that you can find. Yeah, I think you summarized very nicely the, the, uh, the concept that in bypass surgery, you really should choose the best outflow artery. But if we have two of them, then we, of course, choose according to angiosum. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. And now inviting uh, Federico Bastos Uncalves, I've used in aortic iliac revascularization. Well, thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, well, you just heard a very scientific talk. Now you hear a very unscientific talk, which is more, almost basically your only expert opinion, really. But it's something that I find particularly useful, and I hope, uh, if you have never used this, that I can convince you that it may be something to consider. Well, my talk is really on IVUS, uh, on aortoiliac revascularization, but it's applicable to all, all revascularizations in any sector, really. So these are my conflict of interest, nothing related to the specific use of IVUS. So, IVUS for obstructive disease. Has anyone here used this for obstructive disease? Anyone in the audience used IVUS for obstructive disease other than me? No? Great. So, then maybe I can convince some of you. It has some potential advantages. One of them is that it allows for very precise sizing, so you can measure exactly the diameters and also lengths to some extent, but especially diameters, it's really precise. Then, if you have it, of course, then you have an excellent tool for quality control after you do the procedure to make sure everything's okay. And for me, the most useful uh, aspect of this is that you can couple it with a reentry device like the one shown here in the image. And that uh, makes for a safer, fa much faster, more precise reentry when you have to go subintimal in very long CTO lesions. These are some of the things that you find on uh, IVUS that you don't find on an NGO. And it's a bit surprising how many of these things go unnoticed when you do, when you do use the IVUS compared to the conventional angiography. So you can have stent malposition, and the cardiologists, they study this a lot, and they think it has a very important prognostic influence. Uh, also, plaque prolapse. It may lead to restenosis uh, faster um, or stent occlusion. Also, deformations of the stent. And this is something you, if you, especially if you just do one plane and geography, you may miss completely. And the other thing is the stent edge dissection, which I've also seen in a few cases, and that you may argue that if it's not flow limiting, it doesn't matter, but I think it does because it will probably promote more hyperplasia and occlusion of the vessels. So when you use HIVUS, be prepared to look at things that you weren't expecting to see and uh, you wish you hadn't seen. Uh, surprising for me, it, there's not a lot of evidence on the use of IVUS at all for peripheral arterial disease. There are some older studies. Some of them are just single center, very small numbers, so not, not really convincing evidence. But there is one uh, meta-analysis published in 2017. And it, it, you know, 
the studies are not great quality, they're most retrospective single center, but there are a few, at least a few studies comparing IVUS and non-IVUS angioplasties, and they basically show lower rates of reinterventions and amputations for the IVUS group. Um, true lumen reentry uh, with a very, very high technical success, and we all have been there, I'm sure, when you try to re-enter the lumen and you it doesn't work, whatever you do. So this makes it almost 100% technical success. And also quite relevant is the uh, limitation of procedure time. And this is less radiation, less contrast, a lot less materials that you are using and wasting. So in a way, it can balance out the expensive uh, cost of these uh, devices. So this is one example, just a young guy with a complete occlusion of the entire iliac um, uh, axis. Um, no real prior history, but a heavy smoker. And then he had a per, per, uh, lost numbness in the foot. So the plan was to recanalize using the IVUS reentry catheter. Of course, we wouldn't use it if we can make it through the first time around, but uh, we expected it would be difficult. And then we would do a kissing stand because there was a flush occlusion. We were concerned the plaque prolapse on the other side. And then um, do a, a self-expanding stand at the very edge to preserve a collateral. So this is the movie. Uh, maybe, will it start? Yeah, okay. So this is the first angio. So as you can see, it's really a flush occlusion. And uh, well, you don't really see the small collateral on the other side, but it will come. Then you use the IVUS device, and this is the IVUS run. So this is uh, already aortic, coming down. See the iliac vein is over there. Whoops, sorry. Oh, that's too bad. And now, oops, no. Nope. Can you run the movie for me, please? Yeah. Okay, sorry about that. You have to see it again. So um, the, the, what I was telling you is that you can see the landmarks, the anatomical landmarks, and make sure you know where you are. This is subintimal here. So here you are subintimal. Then you go. This is the dissection made by the catheter, actually, going in. Then you position the catheter, the, 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 the device, right at the aortic bifurcation. And then you preload pre this needle, and the needle actually perforates the lamella that you created so that it re-enters at the right position, right at the aortic bifurcation, and in the, wrong, in the right direction, not somewhere uh, random in the lumen. So now you can see the uh, dissection flap caused by the um, dilatation with the three millimeter balloon so you can work easily. And then it's the time to take out the whole thing and use the wire that was in the, in the needle as your working wire. Here you can see that large collateral that we would like to preserve. So we started actually, in this case, we started in the middle and we put a viaban in the middle because we were concerned, since the case was quite acute, that would be some fresh thrombus over there and, um, and also complicate the, uh, the procedure with embolization. So we did that first so that the mismatch wouldn't be the other way around. So we have the smaller stent below. Then we used two balloon expendable stents to do the bifurcation. and finalize that with uh, a stent very close to the uh, inguinal ligament, but preserving that large collateral. And that for that, we used an uncovered self-expanding stent that we then post-dilated. So, when we did the run, since you have IVUS, then you can always check as many times as you want and take your time. And we saw there was deformation at the proximal stent. And you can see it here in the second angio. We missed that the first time around. We thought it was fine. 
But then the Ivos told us the stent was deformed. And, and, and if you look carefully, then you could see it. So then we post dilated again with the kissing balloon fashion. And after that, this is the final run. So this is inside the sheath. Then this is the first stent. It's going from downwards to upwards. This is the viaband here. Looks a bit different. And then we go to the aorta, and this is already aortic. This is lumen, aortic lumen. This is the opposite side stent, stent on the opposite side. And uh, well, we already have four-year follow-up for this particular patient, and it's, it's working really well. Um, a few other examples, just quickly. This is, um, sorry, this is a dissection below the stent that we missed completely in the angio. And I don't know, it, it, it may look fine on the angio, but would you like to leave such a dissection untreated just below your, your nice stent? I wouldn't like that. So we extended with another stent to tackle that dissection. Here, same case, after we did that, we did the run upwards, and we found that just above the stent, there was another stenosis that we kind of missed with the angio, and there was also a dissection, maybe caused by a wire. It's, it's here, we just passed it. Uh, the, so here, so it doesn't look like something you want to leave behind. And then at the end, this case, we had a pretty patent, nice lumen above and below the stent, and we were then happy. So in conclusion, IVUS is a nice complement to have around uh, just in case you need it. I'm not saying you should use it all the time. It's, it's pointless to use it all the time. Most of the time you don't need it. But when you do need it, it's very handy. In selected cases, it can be very efficient, reducing time, contrasts use, materials, and avoiding excessive vessel damage. So uh, in the end, we have to date no demonstration of benefit in clinical practice, but you know, as always, your experience also counts, and uh, in, my, in my experience at least, those 5% of times that you do need it, it makes it everything so much more comfortable and predictable that I think you should have it on your shelf. Thank you. Just in case you're interested, this is an, a course that we run in Lisbon. It will be running from 14 to 16 June the next year. Thank you. Thank you very much. Great talk, and uh, I'm congratulating for your very good results. Uh, now, my question is, is um, this is something you use in advance that you prepare, you know a patient that you will probably use IVUs, or is this like a bailout when you have trouble, then give me the IVUs? Yeah, for occlusive disease, it's uh, essentially a bailout. So. I expect that I might need it when I see these long CTO lesions, femoral, popliteal, iliac, doesn't matter. But if it's very long, calcified, ugly looking, it looks like you're not gonna cross in the lumen, you're gonna go, you have to go subintimal, and it looks like it may be difficult to re-enter because the vessel has uh, you know, calcifications, circumferential calcification, whatever. Then, it, then I have it on the side. And I don't use it unless I need it or I have some doubts whether the result was good. But uh, as, uh, for those CTO lesions, maybe 5% of the time, 10% most. But when I do need to use it, it just saves me a whole lot of time. And it's very a peace of mind to have it there because I know it will solve my problem. So uh, there is a question from Marit, yes? No, this, this, yeah, so this is a pioneer device that has the reentry needle. It's like an outback device, so it's a reentry needle. It only fits 
uh, 014 wires. So you have to use a PTFE coated 014. You cannot use a hydrophilic wire because of the needle. It will be caught in the uh, coating of the wire. So you do need a kind of a special wire for that, but it's, not, it's no big deal. And you have to use uh, a, small, um, a small wire, 014. Yeah. I, I'm meaning the, the IVUS. Is it the IVUS 035 or 18? It's 18. 18, yeah. good. But you can, the O35 is more useful, at least my, my view, uh, for the larger, like, awartic, uh, for the sections and things like that. Okay, just one short question. Thank you for a great presentation. You. Are you familiar with the OCT or just using IVUS? Yeah. Do you use OCT for femoral popliteal or below the knee lesions? Yeah, I, I don't use OCT at all. But I am familiar with it because of this course we run. We run it with a cardiologist who is very experienced in imaging and intraoperative assessment, physiological assessment, imaging and physiological, which is something that I find we don't do enough in vascular surgery. We are still in the, in the early stages of uh, angiography and putting in a balloon and it looks good on the image, but the cardiologists are miles ahead with all the, all the technology, both imaging, with OCT, has incredible imaging, and uh, also physiological with pressure wires and uh, temperature gradients. They use it to determine the significance of stenosis and the effectiveness of, of treatment. And we don't use this at all. For OCT in specific, it's very difficult to use for vascular surgery because it has a, a, a um, uh, depth limitation. It can only be used, I think, in vessels up to three millimeters yeah. or two five, millimeters. Five, six for SFA. But not, for not OCT? Not right. yeah, yeah, maybe. Yeah. Uh, but it's, it's limited in depth. Do you, do you have experience with it? No, maybe? no I have not no? experience. Just asking but, about advantages yeah. and disadvantages so, of IVUS and OCT. Yeah, the resolution is ten, ten times greater than the one of, um, of IVUS, so it has a much better resolution. It can tell you plaque composition. It's like a histological analysis of the plaque in vivo in, 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 during the procedure. And they use it, they really use it to, to choose stents, to assess the quality, the apposition of the stents. Uh, it has this limitation of depth, and it also has the limitation that you need to use a bolus of contrast. So the image has to be acquired without blood which is not so easy to do in larger vessels where the blood flow is really major. So it has those two possible limitations. Thanks. Yeah. So a just comment is that uh, you would recommend the technique just for complex arteriac or femoroboletial lesions and when there is also the subintimal plane which, let's say, complicates a little bit the, uh, the procedure. Or would you suggest for also for an interluminal passage of the wire and also from, uh, for simple cases? Well, let's put it this way. If it was for free, I would use it in every case because I think there's so much information that you get from this, uh, using this device, both avoiding excessive intervention and uh, not leaving things untreated, both ways. There's so much information. But of course, it costs a lot of money. It's expensive. But so if, you, if you have to choose the patient, however, which will be the choice? That the would patient? be the this long CTO where I go subintimal. And then I use the, the reentry needle because it's really predictable. It, it, it completely transforms a procedure that you know might take you an hour, an hour and a half, into something that takes you, you know, five minutes to cross the lesion. And then it's just dilation and putting stents in. Mm -hmm. And you're done. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thanks. We're going to move on in the next presentation. So the next speaker is Alexander Zaric from Serbia, and he will talk us about the treatment of popliteal artery aneurysms with results from the Serbian hospitals. Good evening. My name is Aleksandr Zaric from uh, Medical Military Academy and I have the honor of uh, speaking about treatment of popliteal artery aneurysm results from Serbian vascular centers. In 2020, an article was published uh, concerning uh, contemporary 
sorry. Concerning contemporary treatment of popliteal artery aneurysms in 14 countries, this is a VASCUNAC uh, report. We participated and gathered data, and uh, the same data we used to publish our own common surgical practice in treatment of patients with popliteal artery aneurysms among Serbian vascular centers. Uh, these are the countries participating in the Vascutec report. Vascutec is actually a collaboration of uh, national registries, and uh, we gather data for six-year period from 2012 to 2018. I would like to thank uh, Clinical Center Serbia, Clinical Center Vojvodina, Clinical Center Niš, uh, Institute for Cardiovascular Disease Dedinje, County Hospital Užice and uh, Medical Military Academy for their contribution. We performed uh, in six year period 342 procedures. Incidence was 6.8 uh, operations per million per year. Uh, the largest uh, incidence was in Sweden and the smallest in New Zealand. Uh, we operated 95% male and 5% female. Mean age of patients was around 46, uh, 64 sorry, uh, years, ranging from 29 to 87 years. All patients had significant, significant medical history. Out of uh, 342 patients, Emergency procedures were done in 115 and uh, elective in 223. Out of uh, emergency 115, uh, five was uh, due to rupture and 110 to thrombosis. Mean diameter of aneurysm was 35 millimeters, ranging from 13 to 90 millimeters. Uh, the ruptured aneurysms were a bit larger, around 43 millimeters ranging from 28 to 60, and in women we had a bit smaller aneurysms ranging, uh, measuring 30 millimeters. Uh, we used medial approach and posterior approach, medial in 237 patients, posterior appro approach in uh, 98 patients. Only one hospital used both and medial and posterior approach, while Others uh, dependent on medial approach uh, ex exclusively. Uh, we used synthetic graft in 172 patients, vein in uh, 154, composite graft in six patients. For all emergency cases, medial approach and synthetic grafts were used. Thrombolysis was performed preoperatively in one case and perioperatively in 11 cases. Endovascular procedures were performed only in six patients it uh, in one hospital. Proximal anastomotic site was on iliac artery in one, femoral artery in 140, popliteal artery in 192 patients. Distal anastomotic site was on popliteal artery above the knee in 48, below the knee 260, and crural arteries in 25 per, uh, patients. We had complications, uh, early complications like wound complications in 1%, hemorrhage in tumpa in 7, fasciotomy in 4.1, amputations in 2.8, uh, coronary event uh, in 1.2%, and dialysis in 0.3% of patients. On one year follow up, graft patency was 91%, and amputation was performed in 5.5% of cases. The limitation to this um, article were uh, that not all vascular centers participated, although this represents the majority of Serbian data. Uh, some data were missing, not all hospitals provided uh, the whole package of data, and uh, primary amputations due to popliteal artery aneurysm thrombosis weren't included. I believe that uh, Serb Vascular is a great initiative, that it will provide us more detailed and complete national data, and I'm uh, waiting to use it. Thank you. Thank you very much, very nice presentation, and thank you for showing our real life result, your real life result, because it's quite closer to our everyday practice than systematic and meta reviews. Uh, my question is, uh, you showed that in emergency settings you were using uh, grafts, 
uh, is yes. almost exclusively drafts. Why this? Well, uh, I believe, uh, I can only speak in uh, my hospital yeah. name, but I believe that uh, the exposure is easier uh, from the medial and uh, the some settings, it usually happens at the night. So you don't have uh, nor the time nor the uh, probably uh, time to uh, prepare the vein for uh, grafting. But almost exclusively there was a graft usage. Do you find any changes during those years that you have been studied uh, in the technique maybe? There are some centers move from one technique to another or? Uh, no, actually uh, the time frame is from 2012 to 2018. And uh, we should look at CERB-VESC registry for any uh, improvement in, in techniques. Only one hospital used both techniques, medial and posterior approach. and. Uh, I believe that uh, this is the, the, the thing we could I improve, posterior approach also in other hospitals. Okay. Any question from the audience? Uh, yes, I'm quite surprised uh, with this data that you used so many uh, prosthetic grafts uh, to reconstruct or to revascularize uh, popliteal aneurysm uh, because we mostly do uh, reconstruction with the vein, no matter if it's day or well, night. Actually, it's not me. It's oh, no, no, us. all of us, all <laughs> yeah. of us, but it's actually, us. We you took the, our data as yeah. well, so I guess that there are other hospitals that do even more prosthetic us. And then uh, you mentioned approach, uh, posterior and medial approach. Do you have some suggestions? Which one do you prefer or your, uh, or your center prefer or, or does work? Because I know we do both, but in uh, a cu acute setting, we do only uh, medial, medial approach. approach. But for uh, elective, we do posterior. Same, same as us. We, we use medial approach, very rarely posterior approach. We are trained and teached to use medial approach. In which cases, posterior approach, probably? We do it in two cases, as I remember. You know, for uh, I isolated. Uh, aneurysm that, that could be easily assess, um, yes. accessed. Yes. Only at the second uh, portion of popliteal, of popliteal artery. artery yes. yes. And when do you, when you don't have uh, problems with the runoff, you can do easy this medial, uh, posterior approach. But when you have some doubts about the uh, arteries of the runoff, you actually need to do it yeah. from the medial. From approach. the medial, exactly, exactly. Maybe now a question. It's certainly an interesting topic. Otherwise, thank you very much once again. Thank you. Okay, we move on. And Dr. Tanaskovic will talk about the treatment of PAD in Serbia, review from the Servas Registry, please. Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, dear colleagues. Thank you for this invitation, and it's my great honor and pleasure to present you our data and analysis from the Serbosk Registry. So, Serbosk Registry was created in 2019 as a part of the Vasculant collaboration, but we have started with its implementation in 2020. So far, 21 hospitals in Serbia are included in our registry. During our analysis, we have noted a high number of amputations, so we aim to perform statistical analysis and overall outcome and mortality rates of patients with lower extremity amputations and patients as, uh, with PAD as well. So for the past three years, uh, in total 1,002 patients, lower extremity amputations were performed. There were more males than females. Average age was 69. When we look at comorbidities and risk factors, we can see that the highest number of patients had hypertension, as expected. However, there is also a high number of patients with diabetes, 65.1%, uh, and there is also a high number of patients with ischemic heart disease and kidney disease. As for the type of previous peripheral revascularization, in 10% of the patients, previous bypass procedures were performed, in 8% of the patients and the vascular procedures were performed, and in 2% of the patients, a thrombectomy was performed, while 80% of the patients did not have previous peripheral revascularization. 
Fontaine 4 grade ischemia was the main cause of uh, amputation seen in 47% of the patients. However, a significant number of patients uh, of amputations were also performed due to diabetic foot, soft tissue infection and acute ischemia. When we look at the amputation level, we can see as expected that the lowest number of patients had femoral disarticulation 0.7%. And 20.1% of the patients had the radial finger amputation, 4% of the patients had transphalangeal amputation, 14.1% transmetatarsal amputation, 10.3% of the patients below knee amputation, and in the largest number of patients above knee femoral amputation was performed in 47.4%. Complications rate, you can see infection rate was 3.7%, uh, necrosis 4.1%, hematoma, hematoma 1%, reamputation rate 5.8%, and intrahospital mortality rate was 6.8%. Uh, when we looked at the mortality related to the amputation level, we can see as expected that the highest number of, uh, that the highest uh, mortality rate was in patients with femoral desarticulation, 20%. However, there is also surprisingly high intrahospital mortality rate for patients with above knee amputation that was 11.1%. Uh, risk factors and predictors for increased mortality rate in our registry were age over 75 years, renal insufficiency, especially hemodialysis, patients' inactivity, ischemic heart disease, heart failure, and previous coronary revascularization, post-operative complications, and, and uh, lack of previous peripheral revascularization. During the same study period for the past three years, PAD procedures for chronic ischemia were performed in a total of 966 patients and for acute ischemia in 240, 254 patients. So altogether, PAD procedures were performed in total of 1,220 patients. Uh, as in patients with amputations, there were more males than females. Average age was 66, making these patients a little bit younger than patients with amputations. Risk factors and comorbidities, the same. Uh, the most of the patients had hypertension. However, there is a significantly lower number of patients with diabetes, 36.7%. However, there is also a significant number of patients with ischemic heart disease and kidney disease. Uh, PAD procedures were performed for chronic ischemia in 79.2% of the patients and for acute ischemia in 20.8% of the patients. Interesting fact is that along with PAD, 15.8% of the patients had some kind of foot infection at the time of revascularization and 34.9% of the patients had some kind of soft tissue defect. As for the type of revascularization, in 83.9% of the patients, surgical bypass procedures, procedures were performed in 10.6% of the patients endovascular procedures, and hybrid procedures were performed in less than 1%. Together with PAD, in 9.7% of the patients, uh, additional foot amputation, minor amputations were performed, and in 0.6% of the patients, below knee or above knee amputation was also performed. Complications rate were fairly low, thrombosis 2%, hemorrhage hematoma 0.9%, infection rate 1.9%, myocardial infarction 1.7%, and little outcome was only 1%. So temporary, our diagram looks like this, with similar number of amputations at PAD procedures performed annually in our country. So our main goal will be to increase the number of PAD procedures in the following years. Uh, it will be in the time of diagnosis of patients with PAD, with uh, patients with uh, PAD and chronic ischemia in order to prevent critical limb ischemia, but also our goal will be on urgent revascularization in patients with acute limb ischemia and especially in patients with ischemia and infection, as we have seen the timely revascularization in these patients with additional minor amputations could significantly influence limb and life saving. So hopefully after the next five years, our diagram will look like this with increased number of PAD procedures and decreased number of amputations. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you very much, very nice presentation. Hope this last diagram will be really something that we all will face in the next year. 
And uh, you show that 80% of your patients are amputated primarily. This is a very high number, 80%. So they uh, didn't have any uh, revascularization. Yes, 80% of the patients did not have previous peripheral revascularization, but I must say this is, these are all patients with minor and, and major amputations. So, you know, in some small cities in our country, if, if they, they, they see a black toe or see gangrene, you know, the first they do, they do am amputation of one or two fingers, and then, then uh, uh, unfortunately, maybe sometimes late that they proceed these patients to vascular surgeons. So this is what we are hoping for, this, to, to bring this awareness of peripheral d disease in these patients throughout the whole country, not only in big, big centers in order to have, to have a larger number of diagnosed patients with PAD. But the, uh, the situation in our country is not only in our country. There was some recent paper in the USA they where they said that uh, of all patients with amputations, only 34% he had uh, CT angiography performed before the amputation. So, you know, we have to bring this awareness of, of, of PAD and patients, especially diabetics, uh, diabetics they, that, should, that they should firstly come to vascular surgeons and then, you know, that we could perform all other procedures. So, of course, you're right, and this is our aim, you know, to increase the diagnosis and timely revascularization in these patients. Can, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, very interesting. And we have done similar uh, analysis in Finland many times. Uh, and of course, as you said, the, re the one reason for the results of high proportion of patients without revascularization was that there was also minor amputations. Yeah. Uh, but what we found was that increasingly we have those patients who are bedridden and dementic and they actually not the candidates for revascularization because they are not mobile. So did you look this issue that do you have the how, how big proportion are these patients? Right. But you know uh, this kind of information I don't have right now because this our vascular registry is only for the interventions, so only for the surgical and and the vascular and of course of these these amputations. But uh, there is a, a large burden of these these patients, you know, that uh, you cannot revascularize, and I'm sure of that. But I don't I don't know the exact part of these patients in in this group. Uh, Excellent presentation. Uh, I would like to ask you, what are the criteria to increase the level of amputation from the digits uh, to above or below the knee? <laughs> I mean, could you please give us a clinical message, practical message, how you choose the patient with the infection of the anterior or posterior part of the foot, which you it's deemed not a good candidate for healing or, or for losing his life from the sepsis and you decide to proceed with an amputation. Yes, that's Can you, can you tell us the criteria, how you choose the patient? Well, you know, it's mostly individual. It's mostly individual decision because uh, in, the case of, uh, in the case of dry gangrene and dry necrosis and uh, the, patient's, the patient needs revascularization, we firstly go with revascularization and then go with the amputation. If the patient has wet gangrene and has this, you know, fulminant inflammation, we first must go with amputation and then with the revascularization. As for your, as for your question, uh, it depends. It depends if the patient, if the patient is revascularized uh, re or, or not, you know. If we, if we do the minor amputation and we previously performed PTA of the SFA or maybe bypass and everything and the wound is not looking so good, we will give it some time because, because we can expect healing because we know that th th this patient has increased blood flow uh, right now. But uh, I if we have uh, local, uh, you know, we can say bad findings, if we, we, we can see ischemia and uh, necrosis in this site, we, we always go with, with the, uh, some, some further level with the uh, um, uh, amputation. Uh, I have seen in my clinical practice that uh, palpable uh, popliteal pulse 
even if the patient cannot be revascularized, sometimes uh, it, it can be good sign that you can finish with minor amputations that could last maybe for several months, but it, it, it could last. If you have occluded SFA, and yeah, I think that, uh, that, uh, that the above knee amputation should be performed because uh, we have tried several times, but uh, it usually always always ends with, uh, with uh, femoral amputation. And, and also the, there, is, uh, there is transcutaneous oxygen oxygen pressure on the foot uh, if it is uh, if it is under if it is uh, above uh, 35 millimeters or 50 millimeters in diabetics then we can say that this wound has potential potential for to heal so sometimes we also uh, and, do this and measurement if the superficial femoral artery is totally occluded you choose the above knee always level or you it depends it, it, it depends of the of the clinical status yeah? and the patient you know the patient itself and com comorbidities and patient's age and everything. But, you know, in 90% of the patients, what we tried below knee amputations is in such, such patients, we, we need to convert it to femoral amputation. So we're not going straight forward to, to femoral, of course not. And this is the point of all our work and paper to go with minor amputations as much as we can to revascularize and to, to save limbs and lives. Vladimir, do you have any comments? Yeah. The answer, or probably the answer for this question, uh, our clinic uh, last year published uh, actually work about below knee amputation, and uh, actually we tried to uh, uh, do to perform below knee amputation as much as possible, even in patients that seem not to be suitable for it. And our uh, uh, end point was how fast they were prosthesized, uh, because that was the most important thing. Actually, how fast you can. Uh, put this uh, patient up on, on, uh, to, to walk, and the quality of life, of course. So actually, uh, uh, the, the thing that actually surprises us that it's not necessary for the patient to have a uh, popliteal pulse to, be, uh, for, uh, for, to heal the below knee amput. Uh, there are some other uh, uh, criteria that makes uh, this thing, if, if it will heal below knee or not, uh, of course, uh, kidney disease is one of the most important, then chronic heart failure, and then, of course, if the, uh, if the blood flow at the infrapopliteal level uh, on the duplex ultrasound is, not as, is below some point that we arbitrarily made, it was uh, actually uh, something that, that was supposed to not heal. So we, in these patients, we perform up, uh, above the amputation. But the point is that at it was surprising for us, actually sometimes we can prefer below knee amputation with quite success, even if it doesn't seem like we should do it uh, above knee. Any other question? My last question on the, on the mm -hmm. registry, we can congratulate that you have run this, and uh, certainly you have some surprises. You say, oh, we thought this was different. Which were the biggest surprises from the registry when you analyzed the first data? Yes, as part as part of the, of the PD and uh, amputations analysis, the most surprising thing was was increased mortality rate for the patients with above knee amputations. That was intra-hospital mortality rate was 11.1. So it means that every tenth patient, every eleventh patient, uh, patient will die from the femoral amputation, and because of that, we have conducted all of this. Uh, uh, all of this story with uh, timely revascularization and minor am amputations. If you, if this progressed, and if you know, if you go with below knee or above knee amputation, of course it's important to if that uh, to be below knee or instead of above knee. But our main focus is on the minor amputations and you know, to preserve the whole limb, you know, the, to be to be functional whole limb. So this, because of that, of this increased mortality, that was 11.1%, and we all know that these patients in the next five years will have 50% mortality rate in the next five years, so it's a it's, it's huge problem with the mortality rates, and we need to fix this. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, mom, and Dr. Lazowski will talk the curiosity of nature. It's... Uh... Challenging. <laughs> yeah. Good evening to everyone. <clears throat> Thanks for the invitation. And, uh, 
curiosity of natives is a topic which uh, addresses the native reconstruction of the arteries. This is in some way a forgotten technique that should not be forgotten. And I would like just to remind the auditorium and the colleagues about this. I have no disclosures. Um, none can destroy an iron, but its own rust can. And likewise, none can destroy an artery, but its own plaque can. Uh, this uh, kind of uh, reconstructions, if uh, we have a uh, 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 sick uh, um, uh, pipe, uh, we have to replace it. But if we, have, uh, if we have a sick artery, we can reconstruct it. And that's uh, the thing that I would like to address. Uh, even though it is a very old technique, uh, and maybe nowadays isn't... Uh, attractive anymore because of the endovascular era and uh, the novel techniques. Its uh, results, uh, according to the studies that uh, were made back then, are comparable in terms of uh, patency rate, in terms of complications, morbidity and mortality, uh, when it is compared with any other open or endovascular technique. Some, for some segments, the results, uh, results are superior, and for some segments, the results are comparable. Uh, I will uh, address this through these several examples. Uh, first segment is autoiliac segment. This is a patient with uh, buttock claudications, with severe but buttock claudications on both legs, uh, with uh, near to occlusion of the a distal aorta and 90% uh, uh, stenosis of the left common iliac artery. And this is what we have done. Uh, uh, in, in our country, there is no possibility to do syrup or ERAP. Uh, uh, endovascular procedure, uh, procedures are not well developed. We took the plug out and we reconstruct the aorta and the left iliac artery with uh, uh, pericardial pericardial patch, and this is post-operative CT reconstruction, which shows the uh, uh, good result. The next segment is iliofemoral endotherectomy. This is the patient with uh, buttoclaudications on the right side, with CTO of the right uh, uh, external iliac artery. Uh, uh, we referred this patient twice to the radiology department and uh, they didn't succeed to open the, the right iliac artery, right external iliac artery, and they referred, referred him back to us for uh, open repair. We took out the plaque, uh, do the uh, arteriotomy, took out the plaque, and then made a reconstruction with a pericardial patch uh, from the bifurcation of uh, iliac arteries to the bifurcation of the femoral arteries. And this is the post-operative result. This is the video of the post-operative CT scan, which shows us the end result of the, of the surgery. Next is profundoplasty. Next example is profundoplasty. I hope that uh, in every hospital, every vascular department deals with, with this in uh, everyday pra practice. Uh, and it's uh, not something to address. And the last uh, uh, example is the case uh, with, for, with a patient uh, with a CLTI, with a rest pain and a pedal ulcer on the left leg. On the right leg, uh, the vein was used to make a femoral popliteal or femoral, fem yes, femoral popliteal bypass. Uh, he has uh, iliac disease as well. Uh, he has an occlusion of the left SFA, and he has a history of thrombophlebitis of the left great saphenous uh, vein. Um, we referred uh, him also to the radiology department for endovascular treatment, but they refused to treat him 
He has uh, as well a stent of the left common iliac artery. And uh, be, uh, because of the bad inflow and the bad outflow, and because of the ulcer of the leg, we decided to do uh, also a bio biological uh, procedure, which uh, fortunately he had benefit of. Uh, we made uh, a dissection of the whole SFA until the popliteal artery and then transect it and do the uh, endarterectomy. It, it looks like, uh, in this picture, it looks like it is uh, a version endarterectomy, but uh, I would rather say it was pull out endarterectomy. The plug, well, the plug break down at, uh, approximately in the middle of the artery, and then we had to do another. Uh, arteriotomy at the middle of the artery. And this is what we uh, got out. It's uh, longer than 25 centimeters. Then, then made a patch plasty of the common femoral artery, common femoral artery and then in its natural bed, we re it with the popliteal artery. This is the end result. Uh, can you please play the video? This is the end result. And two months after the procedure, uh, this patient has, ha, has uh, no ulcer anymore in the foot. And um, he had uh, no claudications as well. He got two months after the operation uh, a stent of the external iliac artery as well. And uh, we have a good result. But uh, I, I, I'm not sure if you, if you noticed uh, of this last video, this CT, it was uh, bleeding in the femoral region. We uh, uh, got back in the OR and we found uh, uh, hemorrhage from the vasa zorum, which were uh, quite uh, developed. And uh, looking uh, through the literature, we saw that uh, this is neovascularization in the all, in all uh, atherosclerotic uh, uh, arteries with vasa zorum, which makes a problem. Thank you for your attention. Uh, I would like to, to address one more thing, that uh, uh, back then when these studies of uh, these techniques were made, maybe, uh, maybe uh, our colleagues were not uh, aware of uh, endovascular techniques, but these days, uh, this uh, I think uh, these techniques gives a new route for further endovascular uh, treatment if needed. Thank you. Thank you for sharing with us your experience, and uh, this is why we are meeting here because we are living different realities. And of course, uh, the Congress in Munich is one reality, in I don't know where is another reality, so we are sharing uh, different uh, possibilities of treatment. And of course, guidelines is something where we would like to go, we should go, we have to look at, but of course are not applicable to every single situation. So in that case, and also for us, uh, we should have in the armamentario even other tools, and you certainly show us one of the possible tools to solve a complex problem of uh, this. So, any comment from the audience, please? Yes, please. Thank you for the presentation. I want to ask, uh, in this uh, last patient, uh, did you consider by, uh, femoral popliteal bypass with graft, or uh, maybe opening a popliteal artery and femoral artery and maybe fulmar endarterectomy, because it seems to me that it's a quite big tr uh, operative trauma. Yes, it is In a big patient, operative yeah. trauma. We, we don't uh, use fulmar, we don't have fulmar uh, mm -hmm. uh, endarterectomy device. And uh, uh, we considered a femoral popliteal bypass. I would do, in this patient, I would do bypass if I have uh, uh, a good quality vein. Vein, yes, yes, yes. yes. 
but uh, because of the poor uh, inflow and the poor outflow, I uh, decided to, to use the biologic graft, which could stay open even though the outflow is, is bad. Uh, um, if I put a PTFE graft, I, I think that it would be a disaster for him. That's why okay. I chose Thank this you. method. Interesting presentation. I show in the first two cases that you have performed a long uh, patch, long patching. Mm -hmm. Could you tell us, please, uh, which is the case in which you would choose to make a bypass, in which the case you choose to make a long patching? So you're uh, doing in all cases? No, no, no. Are they no. I, I use bypasses. I use bypass in everyday practice, uh, but uh, uh, this uh, the first case with uh, arteriac disease, the woman with the arteriac disease, uh, she has a limited arteriac disease and uh, uh, she has a small arteries. So uh, I think that uh, I, I don't want to use uh, 12, uh, by, uh, 12 by 6 uh, uh, bifurcated, bifurcated graft to, to uh, treat the patients because I think uh, it has a, a, a very poor prognosis. Uh, that's why I chose to make this uh, endarterectomy and patch plasty. The, uh, the patch is not that long. Uh, uh, our patches are 8 by, f eight by 14, so uh, maybe the longest, the longest uh, 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 length was 14 centimeters, I I'm not sure in this case. And about the second case, uh, because uh, it was a longer lesion. I had to I, I had to put another another part of, of, of the patch to cover all all the arteries. Uh, I I probably never done uh, iliac to femoral to femoral bypass. Have you I, have you find any delayed leak hemorrhage from the never, long patching? Never, never, well, never, never. And uh, what's the number of long patching that you have performed? It's more than 20, let's say? More than 20, more than 20, yes. And what's the, the antiplatelet or thrombotic uh, treatment that you administrate in the patient do, after the... Dual antiplatelet therapy in the first three months and after that only aspirin. Okay. Are there any questions from the audience? Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. We will now proceed with the next presentation from Vladimir Cvetic, Serbia. He will talk to us about the role of endovascular lithotripsy in endovascular treatment of femoropopliteal lesions. Dear Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. It's, thank you for kind invitation. As an interventional radiologist, it's a great honor to be here and to give a speech about the role of intravascular lithotripsy in endovascular treatment of femoropopliteal lesions. Okay. As we know, the calcium is the main problem, especially in the femoropopliteal arterial segment. Calcifications restricts ballon angioplasty, often with residual stenosis, and also the rate of complications increase in calcified lesions, especially dissections and perforations. Also, severe calcifications act as a barrier to vessel drug delivery. Also, you can see on the right side of the picture, a stent implanted in the medial segment of superficial femoral artery that is pushed by not fully expanded with the calcifications. And in this group of the patients, long-term patency is problematic. Nowadays, we have a lot of endovascular tools for calcifications, such as atherectomy devices, uh, all kinds of atherectomy devices, directional, rotational, orbital of laser atherectomy devices. Also, we have a special balloons like a scoring and cutting balloons and a lot of debulking devices. And nowadays, we have a new kid on the block. It's a shock wave or intervascular lithotripsy, which we can use for, for uh, cardiovascular calcifications. What about the shock wave? Shock wave is well, well established in the kidney stone treatment more than 30 years and the sonic pressure waves impact heart tissue, disrupt calcium and what is the, which is the most important thing, leave soft tissue undisturbed. Nowadays we have a mini version of kidney treatment stones, it's a cardiovascular lithotripsy 
Uh, it's a mini version of kidney stone treatment. It's optimized energy for the treatment of cardiovascular calcium. It's a pretty, it's a very simple, very simple de de uh, device. It consists of three parts. It's IVL generator and IVL connector cable. Uh, as you can see, these, these two things are reusable. And the uh, most important thing is the IVL catheter. It's a typical over the wire system that we, we can use with any O14 guide wire and which with, with the standard PTA technique with the 180 little tripsy pulses for the coronary arteries and 300 pulses for the peripheral arteries. At the top of this IVL catheter, it's a, it, it, it is integrated PTA balloon with, a, with little tripsy emitters that they are making uh, sound uh, waves. How, it's, uh, how, how we perform a shock wave, sonic pressure. First of all, we pass the lesion with the O14 wire, then deliver catheter and inflate to low pressure. Which low pressure? With, uh, we inflate the balloon till uh, four atmospheres, and then a small park, a diameter vaporize the saline counter solution and creates a bubble which rapidly expands and collapses within the balloon. This expanding and collapsing bubble creates a short burst of sonic pressure waves. The sonic pressure waves travel through the vessel tissue by reflecting off and cracking calcium with, a, with an effective pressure around of 50 atmospheres. The emitters along the length of the device create a localized field effect within the vessel, within the vessel to fracture both, which is, which is the most important, both intimal and medial calcium. The integrated balloon plays a unique role its opposition to the vessel wall facilitates efficient energy transfer during IVL and after which it is used to delay the lesion to maximize lumen gain. What about the use in clinical practice? This is one of our first patients. It was, it was a 65 years old male with ischemic rest pain for two months with an ankle brachial index 05 on the left leg with the usually risk factors, hypertension, obesity. It was a heavy smoker, and CTA demonstrates the severe stenosis of the medial segment of the left superficial femoral artery. As you can see in coronal and axial views, severe calcified lesions of the medial segment of the left superficial femoral artery. First of all, we decided to treat this patient with the ipsilateral transfemoral approach. We punctured artery, passed the artery, put, uh, put the seven French sheet. These, these balloons for superficial femoral arteries, IVL catheters, are compatible with the seven French sheet. We passed the lesion with the, with the O14 wire, then deliver the catheter, uh, made the inflation of four, four atmospheres, and then you can see the waves and the full expansion after 10 or 15 pulses, the full expansion of the balloon in the level of the, of the calcified plaque. After that, we perform a DCB with a, with a, with a drug-coated balloon, a six millimeter diameter and 80 millimeter length, a little bit longer balloon than the IVL catheter with a perfect post-procedural uh, result. What about the tips and tricks? Uh, if you use IVL catheters, you must oversize device 10% uh, in order to regular or vessel device. Also, you need to overlap uh, segments by one centimeter. Why? You, need, you, you don't need just the overlap, overlap of the balloons. You just need an uh, overlap of the whole emitters for full therapeutic coverage, like in this patient with the P2 uh, massive calcified stenosis that we treated with the six with a six millimeter diameter and 60 millimeter in length IVL catheter. And after that, we also put a drug coated balloon with a perfect post-procedural effect. Uh, in recent years, we have uh, a lot of published studies about uh, safety and uh, efficacy, efficacy of uh, intravascular uh, lithotripsy of femoral popliteal arterial disease. The most of these studies were single arm studies, but nowadays we have two Two big studies. First, first was uh, disrupt PAD2 trial, and nowadays we have a randomized control trial. It's a disrupt PAD3 trial. It's a uh, trial that is comparing two, two group of patients. First group that were patients were treated with IVL plus uh, DCB, and the second group of the patient that was treated that, that were treated with the PTA balloon angioplasty, and after that with the DCB. 
What is important, the majority of these patients with severe, severe calcification, more than 80% patients were with severe calcifications, and the average length of these lesions was more than 10 centimeters. More than 300 SFA and popliteal lesions were included in this randomized control study. What about the early, early results of this study? IVL showed that it was a, a better prep tool than the plain balloon angioplasty. IVL used lower pressure, fewer stents, less post dilatation, and the most important thing, had a fewer dissections compared to, to complain balloon angioplasty. After the early result, also we saw the very good results uh, concerning IVL prior to DCB that showed a promising patency out of two years in severely calcified population. In this couple of minor curve, you can see that after 12, 12 months, IVL patency, patients were, that were treated with IVL catheters, pa uh, primary patency after 12 months was more than 80%, and after 24 months was more than 74%, comparing, it was much better comparing to the uh, plain balloon angioplasty. Sorry. At the end, let me to conclude that the intravascular lithotripsy is a simple, efficient, and safe system based on the established principles of lithotripsy. IVL provides circumferential plaque modification that holds the potential advantage of uniform energy distribution and thus uniform plaque modification. IVL does not rely on mechanical tissue injury by phys physical interactions such as atherectomy devices, cutting or scoring balloons, but rather by the diffuse acoustic pulse through a balloon inflated at low pressure. IVL may be considered a valuable tool in the treatment of calcified vessels and may enhance patency rates, improving outcomes in while minimizing complications. Clinical evidence from randomized trials is lacking and obviously more studies and data are required. Thank you for your attention. So Vladimir, <clears throat> congratulations for the nice presentation. I have uh, two questions. What's the median length of the lesions that you apply this technique? And uh, do you have any concerns for the embolic uh, events that might uh, guide to, let's say, to distal embolization? Thank you for, for, for questions. First, I will answer for the last question. According to literature, it's less than 1% distal, distal, distal embolic events. According to literature, according to, to these uh, studies, it's much less than uh, a terectomy device in which uh, all kinds of atherectomy devices we must use uh, with a distal protection when we use. You, you showed us a localized lesion. It's yeah. A highly yeah. calcified localized lesion about one centimeter. What uh, about more lengthy lesions? Five, ten centimeters? Yeah, we, 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 we can use it, but uh, we still have no data or no strict guidelines when to use shockwave, when to use atherectomy device. If you ask me, that's my experience, my opinion. For no stent zones, short, very calcified lesion, concentrate plaques, it should be treated with a, with a shock wave. Long lesions with the eccentric calcified plaques should be treated first if you want to treat it with vaterectomy devices. By using the IVOS yeah. also. <laughs> okay. If we have enough money. Yes, for <laughs> Are there any questions from the audience? Some comments? Any comments from the co-chairman here? You can use it also in cruel arteries? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. 2.5, yes. and now, uh -huh. nowadays we have a, a new device that is dedicated for iliac arteries. It's eight millimeter device shockwave for preparation for EVAR, TVAR, or for TAVI procedures when you cannot pass through the iliacs. Now we get, I think six months ago, we have a eight millimeter shockwave device. Okay, thank you very much. We are running a little bit out of time. Thank you. Our last presentation will be from Professor Tomic, tumor in inferior cava vein. Please. Good evening to everyone. Thank you for your staying to the last presentation and that huge group must stay because they're, I'm chief of the doctors. Thank you for your, all of you. Uh, when I was uh, a schoolboy, they said to me, 
speak Serbian and to all the world will understand you. And uh, I must uh, ask you forgiveness because I have a few uh, slides on Serbian, especially you, Merit, because I worked for you before uh, three years in London. <clears throat> mm, uh, I'll translate you that is a surgical treatment of tumor thrombus in uh, inferior vena cava with uh, uh, renal carcinoma. 25 years of uh, experience in my hospital. We have about 25 years of experience of that uh, illness. Renal cell carcinoma is the most uh, uh, frequent malignancy of kidney. And in Serbia, we have about uh, 600 uh, cases per year. Uh, treatment of that uh, uh, disease is nephrectomy and thrombectomy of tumor tissue from uh, vena cava inferior. Uh, accessories, uh, accessory uh, interventions are retroperitoneal lymphadenectomy and metastasectomy. In our hospital, first operation in 1995 uh, was first that, that uh, case lived 17 years, and in this first 10 years of our uh, practice, we have uh, very uh, poor results with sorrow. You know that is very, very, very hard and tough uh, cases. But uh, in for 25 years, we have uh, 111 patients. Uh, our results is the men, uh, predominantly men with uh, 60 years uh, old, and uh, it is a right-sided tumor. Um, that is a, a little. Um, uh, schematic uh, approach uh, uh, as the first level is uh, tumor thrombus is only in uh, uh, in uh, uh, renal vein. The second level is uh, a little uh, two centimeters in uh, venal cava protrusion. Uh, level three is uh, uh, subdiaphragmatic, and level four is uh, uh, entrance in atrium of heart. Uh, we have um, most cases in level three. Uh, most interesting uh, level f uh, is the last uh, level four, because uh, uh, that is very complex and uh, needs uh, lots of uh, different different specialists and needs as a cardio surgeon, vascular surgeon, general surgeon, and. Uh, and um, um, urologist. We have one, uh, one case in an intermittent uh, heart uh, um, stop, but we uh, immediately stop with that technique. Uh, uh, our, uh, our dilemma is uh, operation with uh, extracorporeal bl uh, blood machine or uh, on a beating heart operation. Uh, on that uh, uh, short film, uh, you can see uh, vena cava full of tumor thrombus. That is the case before 10 days. And you can see vena cava is full. And right-sided tumor. Right-sided tumor. Okay, next film. It must be the, at the end of film. It is the same film, but with contrast. It's easy, easy to see. You can see full of vena cava, fullness of vena cava inferior. Može sledeći film, pošto ovo nešto ne reaguje kod mene. Please.
the Stalin and Tasty film. That is the same film, please. Okay, Colonel, you can see uh, when a cow of, uh, with, with two thrombus and in that moment enter, entrance in uh, right atrium. And sagittal film, uh, right uh, tumor, tumor with right, uh, right kidney, with vena cava uh, full of thrombus, and in that moment entrance in in right uh, atrium. Uh, this is a, a portocovography. We can see next we can see uh, thrombosis of vena cava with collateral uh, uh, blood away. An entrance uh, uh, of blood uh, from vena cava su superior. And it is ultrasound of heart you can see that tumor thrombus protrude from uh, right atrium to right uh, ventricle. Um, our surgical uh, uh, um, surgical procedures are for uh, for uh, left kidney is a complete chevron procedure, and for right kidney is a right subcostal uh, right subcostal procedure. This is a procedure on type 4 with extracorporeal bloodway. This is one you one of young about 30 years woman. This round tumor thrombus from heart and in the lower left corner is from vena cava. On left pictures is from left heart, and the uh, right picture is a tumor thrombus from next movie. Multidisciplinary approaches is, uh, is necessary. Two young cardio surgeons help me. This is a procedure on open heart. Two more thrombus want to be steady and they can't Grab him. Jugular catheter. And in one moment you can see tumor thrombus. Uh, that is tumor thrombus from heart. And I pick finger vascular instrument. The most helpful is Procedure with finger, and that is finished procedure from uh, from heart. Only that the, in in future there only um, suturing of the, that uh, that um, um, heart wall. I must the next film. Okay, uh, most for us, uh, most interesting is um, mm, uh, mm, protecting of uh, pulmonary artery embolization. Uh, or, uh, for me, is is a more important slide because uh, I have protection for uh, embolization, uh, putting uh, tourniquet on vena cava beneath the right atrium. This is a typical uh, case for the uh, right kidney on the left picture before and the right picture after. That is a standard procedure, right, an anterior incision uh, over uh, vena cava inferior, 
uh, and on the right and bottom picture is a clean with the suturing of that uh, Venacava. On the left uh, upper uh, picture, you can see uh, left uh, left thumb of uh, of, of left, left kidney. Pro problem is uh, after uh, left nephrectomy, uh, part of left uh, vein uh, stay in uh, in uh, radix of mesenterium. We in our cases uh, pre uh, preparing that uh, that vein and completely exceeding. Uh, with with this um, with this uh, illness that is a metastatic illness, we have uh, lots of uh, regional lymph nodules, embolization in arterial pulmonary in metastatic uh, uh, pieces in liver, and you can see uh, pulmon uh, pulmonary artery embolization operation, uh, mediastinal uh, gland, retrocaval gland. Unfortunately, in some cases, there is no non-resectable and we, uh, that tumor uh, will not resectable and on the right uh, picture, you can see a section of, uh, right, of uh, vena cava incomplete. Uh, three years surviving is about 81% for all, but for stadium two, three, and four is 43. Surviving, you can see, for a uh, NIVO of tumor thrombus, you can see that four, uh, four uh, a level is poorest result. Unfortunately, about 25% uh, of patients uh, never uh, come back on uh, control exams. We have one, uh, we have one recidive of tumor thrombus. Operate him, and this patient is live about 15 years after that. We have one, uh, uh, one uh, um, report in American in American. Uh, American uh, case report in, in uh, vascular uh, in vascular uh, no you understand me and uh, uh, we have a brand new uh, report in our uh, military in our military uh, literature in last year we have first prize in uh, Dubai for uh, for that movie. And in conclusions, uh, surgery is primary ter ter therapy. We must have multidisciplinary approach. Vascular surgeon, urologist, cardiac surgeon, anesthesiology. Uh, we uh, must have a, a long way follow up uh, and uh, for uh, in the uh, renal cell carcinoma uh, is potentially curable. Uh, if we have a complete ex extirpation of tumor. Thank you. Congratulations for all the uh, achievements and the results. Um, just maybe one final question. I would ask only what are the prerequisites of a center to do this type of challenging, demanding surgery? We are only center in Serbia. Clinical center have uh, some start with that, in, and uh, Professor Dragas have few uh, few cases. But in military hospital, we have all these specialties, uh, one near other, and we we can uh, do that efficiently. 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 <laughs> thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, we came to an end to this session. I think it was an exciting session and all the sessions today. And I congratulate all the speakers.
panelists and you to be with us uh, till this moment. And I probably have to invite Dr. Concher to finish this day. He's not here. He's busy with the dinner. Yeah, okay. Then you're all invited to dinner. Oh, I don't know <laughs> if he's busy. So thank you once again to be with us. Thank you.